Live from Burbank, Burbank, the media capital of the world. To participate in the general public comment period, please call now at 818-238-3335. For any scheduled public hearings, please call when prompted to speak if you want the comment to be part of the record. Members of the public may speak for up to three minutes depending on the number of speakers. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a joint meeting of the Burbank City Council with Successor Agency, Housing Authority, Parking Authority, and Youth Endowment Services Fund Board on Tuesday, April 9th, 2024. As we begin every meeting, I ask that you join me in a moment of reflection. This moment is intended for us to begin our meeting tonight with a positive and collective support for our beloved Burbank community. The City Council welcomes everyone joining us this evening, both in person and virtually. We encourage you to take a moment right now to reflect on our community and the work that we will be doing together tonight. Although each of us has our own unique reasons for being here, we are united in our shared passion for this wonderful city that we all call home. And as we pause, let us consider our individual contributions and what it means to those around us. Let us find solace in knowing that by working together with a shared spirit of community and partnership, we will always act responsibly for the betterment of Burbank. Thank you all very much. And now if you would please stand, place your hand, right hand over your heart, and do the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready and begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam City Clerk, how are you this evening? I'm fine. How are you, Mr. Mayor? Fantastic. Please conduct the roll. Councilmember Council Anthony? Present. Councilmember Mullins? Present. Councilmember Tagahashi? Present. Vice Mayor Perez? Present. And Mayor Schultz? Present. Thank you. We would like to advise the community that there will be eight, I said that correctly, eight periods of public comment this evening. Members of the public may comment in person or by telephone during the general public comment period and during the public hearing. The first general public comment period is for any matter concerning city business and or any agenda item tonight, except for the public hearing, which has its own separate comment period. If you would like to provide a public comment by phone, please call right now at 818-238-3335. The second public comment period is for the public hearing. To comment by phone on the public hearing, please call when prompted to do so when we get to that point in the agenda. Additional in-person only public comment periods will be available after each report to council this evening. With eight periods of public comment, uh, colleagues, and without objection, I would like to offer the option, not requirement, but the option of one-minute comments and three-minute comments for all in-person public comment periods this evening. Uh, as we have done several times now in the past, those who elect voluntarily to have a one-minute comment will be taken first, followed by three-minute comments for each of the remaining uh, folks participating in the public comment period. Uh, we appreciate everyone's cooperation this evening, and we want to ensure that everybody has a chance to speak and to be heard, while also balancing the incredible amount of work that we have to tend to the, tonight. Uh, colleagues, do I have your consensus to proceed as follows? Thank you very much. We now have three announcements to share. The following are announcements for April 9th, 2024. Join us for a community meeting to discuss the residential soft story seismic retrofit program. 
This is an opportunity to learn more about the proposed program, who it affects, and how the city plans on making residents safer. The meeting will be held in the City Council Chambers located at 275 East Olive Avenue on April 25th at 5.30 p.m. Find out more at burbankca.gov forward slash community dash development. Celebrate Earth Day on April 20th with the Department of Parks and Recreation. Join us at Stow Park for a day of arts and crafts activities and animal encounters. The opening ceremony by Tree City USA will commence at 10 a.m followed by an exciting tree planting event. In addition, make your mark on Burbank by volunteering for the Plant for a Greener Burbank event on April 27th at Brace Canyon Park. Residents of all ages are welcome to volunteer. Register today at burbankparks.com. See you there. The City of Burbank is developing a City Parks Master Plan that will provide a clear vision for development and enhancement of City Parks, Recreation Facilities, and Recreation Programs. Please provide your feedback at our next community meeting on Wednesday, April 10th at 6 p.m. at the Mary Alford Recreation Center. To learn more and to register for this meeting, visit the Special Events section on burbankparks.com. This concludes the announcements for this evening. All right, thank you everyone. Next we have our presentations on the agenda. We have three presentations this evening. Uh, the first presentation is a proclamation declaring April 14th through the 20th of 2024 as National Animal Control Officer Appreciation Week in the city of Burbank. Before I go forward, I would like to welcome the following city employees up here to join me. We have Senior Animal Control Officer Stacy Wood-Levin. We have uh, Animal Control Officers John McCullough, Winnie Brusard, Donald Capes, and Eric Lozano. Thank you all so much. So I want to thank all of you for being here. Um, as is customary as mayor, I'm going to read the proclamation for the community uh, to consume, and then I'd like to turn it over. I believe you'll be sharing a few words on behalf of the group. Fantastic. Whereas animal control officers enforce state and local, sorry, state and city ordinances concerning the care and treatment of animals, protecting and rescuing both domestic and wild animals, and protecting and maintaining public health standards. And whereas animal control officers impound various animals within the city of Burbank, picking up sick, injured, stray, vicious, wild, and unwanted animals. And whereas animal control officers investigate claims of neglect and cruelty, writing and submitting criminal reports and issuing citations when warranted. And whereas animal control officers are dedicated to educating the public on living peacefully with wild animals that are indigenous to the city of Burbank and our surrounding areas, keeping residents' safety first in mind. And whereas animal control officers support positive changes in the ever-evolving animal welfare system, which they apply to their capture and care methods and standards daily. And whereas animal control officers are ardent about teaching the importance of spaying and neutering domestic pets to decrease the overpopulation of unwanted animals. And whereas animal control officers perform educational presentations, bringing awareness to the community of the multiple services that the animal shelter offers, including and yes, this is our little PR time, licensing, vaccination clinics, adoption opportunities, wildlife rehabilitator services, foster programs, and so much more. And whereas animal control office officers often take on the role of a social worker, risking their lives as emergency responders, uh, mitigating community member conflicts, and so much more, all while performing essential work that ensures public safety for both humans and animals that call the city of Burbank home. Now, therefore, I, Nick Schultz, the Mayor of the City of Burbank do hereby proclaim April 14th to the 20th as National Animal Control Officer Appreciation Week and I call upon all of our citizens to recognize the outstanding service and contributions of all of these and many more that aren't here animal control officers and the services they provide to our city and to our region. Thank you all. So appreciate it. Give them a round of applause everybody. <laughs> Now, I'm going to hand you the mic, because I've done enough talking, and I'll perhaps hand you the proclamation. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say a quick thank you um, on behalf of the animal control officers for the community's support um, and their high level and involvement with the animal shelter and all the help that you have given us. 
Um, it's not always an easy job, but it definitely makes it worth it being able to save these animals' lives. So we really, really thank you. Thank you. Can I take a quick photo? All right, why don't we have one or two of you come over here on my side, and we'll take a quick photo. I don't bite. One more time, everyone, give it up for him. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Our next presentation is a proclamation declaring April 7th, 13th, April 7th through 13th of 2024 as National Library Week in the city of Burbank. At this time, I welcome board chair Carmenita Helliger to join me up here at the podium to, of course, accept the proclamation and share a few words. Thank you for being here. So first, I will go ahead and read the proclamation, and then Carmenita, the floor is all yours. Uh, and of course, afterwards, um, actually, before we go on, would you like to introduce your fellow board members who are here? Yes. So we have Darren, Lily, and Brian. Um, we have a few more that couldn't make it, but a uh, great team, great team to work with. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Whereas libraries offer the opportunity to everyone to connect with others, learn new skills, and pursue their passions no matter where they are on life's journey. And whereas libraries have long served as trusted institutions, striving to ensure equitable access to information and services for every member of our community, regardless of race, ethnicity, creed, ability, sexual orientation, gender identity, or socioeconomic status. And whereas libraries adapt to the ever-changing needs of their communities, developing and expanding collections, programs, and services that are as diverse as the populations they serve. And whereas libraries are accessible and inclusive places that promote a sense of local connection, advancing understanding, civic engagement, and shared community goals. And whereas libraries play a pivotal role in economic development by providing resources and support for job seekers, entrepreneurs, and small businesses, thereby contributing to local pro prosperity and growth. And whereas libraries make choices that are good for the environment and make sense economically, creating thriving communities for a better tomorrow. And whereas libraries are an essential public good and fundamental institutions in democratic societies, working to improve society, protecting the right to education and literacy, and promoting the free exchange of information and ideas for all. And whereas Burbank is home to three living library locations, the Central Library, the Buena Vista Library, and the Northwest Library, which along with the online branch serve 800,000 people annually. And whereas libraries and library workers are joining library supporters and advocates this week and across the nation to celebrate National Library Week, now therefore I, Nick Schultz, the mayor of the city of Burbank, do hereby proclaim April 7th through the 13th as National Library Week in the city of Burbank. And I encourage all of our residents to visit our libraries and to celebrate the adventures and opportunities they unlock for us every single day. Carmenita, on behalf of the city council, here's the proclamation. And if your board members would like to come up and join us, I'm going to turn the mic over to you. So besides a collection of more than a million books, auto, audio books, and movies in print and online, we also have a Spark Lab, which is a digital media lab uh, with access to a sound booth, so you can come do your podcast, um, 3D printers, Adobe Creative Suite and other software and equipment to build the media industry. We have hotspots that you can borrow so you can have home internet access. A thousand books before kindergarten is a program that we offer there to encourage kids to build reading skills early on. Uh, we have services for job seekers from help with online job searching to the more intensive job connect plus program open for applications right now up until April 14th and we've already had two cohorts of graduates uh, recently and we have a social worker who helps connect hundreds of individuals a year with housing food legal assistance and more 
we would like another social worker so we can help more people. Um, we have free eBooks, uh, streaming videos, and um, audio books, a program where kids can practice reading to a therapy dog or a bunny, it's their choice. Um, expert staff that can help you research any topic. Remember when we had the card catalog? Yeah, okay, so that was my era. A collection of historic Burbank photos called Burbank in Focus and the Burbank Leader Archives. A Dungeons and Dragons club for teens. We need an adult one, but that's just my opinion. A volunteer-based program to help adults with low literacy and improve their skills. And then free access to and, um, uh, Ancestry.com and a lot more there at our library. Thank you. And, and before we take our picture, I just want to add, I want to thank all of our Board of Library Trustees for your service. I want to thank our department head uh, for your service to running a fantastic, I would say regionally renowned library system. And lastly, I just want to mention that libraries aren't mere institutions. We have to celebrate this week the people that work there and make them such phenomenal places to learn and to grow into our community. And in my opinion, the best way that we can honor our libraries is to honor and safeguard those who serve our community and to celebrate and to safeguard their education, their training, their experience, and what makes them such a great value to the Burbank community. So thank you all so much for being here. Let's take that photo. And for our final presentation, we have a proclamation that we've actually taken the liberty of framing this evening. And this is one, it's gonna be a little bit longer of a presentation, but this is a truly historic moment for the city of Burbank. It is with great honor and distinction that I, as the mayor of Burbank, invite up here in a moment someone who has truly been an icon, not just to the Burbank community, not just to California, but to young people and working people across the nation and across the world. Uh, we are recognizing for the very first time in our city's history, April 10th, 2024, as Dolores Huerta Day here in the city of Burbank. Ms. Huerta, would you like to come up here and join me? <laughs> Now, I am going to read the whole uh, proclamation, and I will say it's a little heavy, so I'll probably have my colleagues come down here to help me hold it. But I think this is all just fantastic for the community to hear. Whereas Dolores Clara Fernandez Huerta was born in Dawson, New Mexico on April 10th, 1930, and spent most of her early life in the Central Valley of California, where she found her passion for fighting for the rights of workers and their families and helped pioneer a transformative farm labor movement that continues to this day. And whereas Ms. Huerta worked as a school teacher in a Stockton agricultural community, where she often saw her students come to class hungry, sparking her passion to fight for the rights of farm workers and their families, and moved her to serve as a community service organization leader and form the Agricultural Workers Association, where she increased voter registration and advocated for neighborhood improvements. And whereas in 1962, Ms. Huerta and Cesar Chavez established the National Farm Workers Association, which organized farm workers for better working conditions and was a predecessor of the United Farm Workers, which was founded in partnership with Larry it, is it Leon? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Philip Vera Cruz and other labor leaders and activists. And whereas, that is heavy, Ms. Huerta's lobbying and negotiating skills played a central role in many of the movement's successes, including an international boycott of grapes that led to the first farm worker union contracts and the California Agricultural Labor Relations Act of 1975. And she's not done, whereas she has received many honors and accolades, including becoming the first Latina inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame in 1993 and Fun fact, she was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2012. 
And whereas on December 12, 2023, the Burbank City Council adopted a resolution designating Dolores Huerta Day as a holiday for city employees, celebrating her lifelong work and commitment to civil service. And whereas the Dolores Huerta Foundation uh, through the foundation, Ms. Huerta continues her tireless work advocating for marginalized communities and teaching the next generation of organizers to empower others and drive social change. Now, therefore, I, Mayor Nick Schultz of the City of Burbank, do hereby proclaim April 10th, 2024, as Dolores Huerta Day in the City of Burbank, and I encourage all of my fellow residents to learn from Ms. Huerta's example and to work to make a positive impact in our community and in every community that you call home. Ms. Huerta, congratulations. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mayor, and thank you, members of the City Council, uh, for this beautiful proclamation. And I, ju I just want to say thank you. And I do want to say that when I received this, I received this on, on behalf of guests of the working people, especially farm workers. As we know, our farm workers are, are essential workers. Unfortunately, they still do not receive the types of wa wages and benefits that other essential workers do. But we have to remind them. And, and we have to re remember them and always remember that they are the ones that put the food on, food on our table every day. So I kind of, uh, when, when I take this proclamation from you, I do it on behalf of all those working people out there. And thank you very much for recognizing the working people here in your own community. Uh, you know, uh, the library workers, I think they deserve another applause for the work that they do. I know I grew up in the library, thank you very much. The working people that take care of animals. Oh my goodness, this really shows that uh, this city council has a heart, right? Yes. It not only takes care of its residents, it takes care of its animals also. So I, I am very happy to be part of, of this program uh, with the other beneficiaries of, of your proclamation. And I do want to uh, introduce one of my board members of my foundation, uh, who is my good friend Jim Garrison, uh, who is a member of my, the board of directors of, of the Dolores Witter Foundation. And then I have one of our staff people here, uh, Lucio Rodriguez, who is our comps person in the Dolores Huerta Foundation. And then my daughter, who is here, uh, Lori De Leon, who is my daughter here, who has accompanied me to receive this proclamation. But I, I just want to say this city is really a model uh, for so many cities because you are showing that you have a, a very big heart. And uh, we know that very many people are proud of being uh, associated, of, to be citizens of Burbank. And now I can also claim that association uh, to, uh, to be part of, part of your governance and part of your organization. So I, I want to thank you very much. Thank you very much. Another, thank you very much. So, Mr. Garrison, I'm going to have you hold this. And then if I could also have Vice Mayor Perez join me. Everyone come down for a photo, but Ms. Vice Mayor Perez, if you could uh, help with the other gift. And I just want to acknowledge that Vice Mayor Perez was one of the leading voices, uh, along with uh, really a council majority here, to make this holiday a reality. Um, Vice Mayor Perez, anything you'd like to add? Sure, definitely. Um, oh my goodness. <laughs> Um, Dolores, in, in your 90, almost 94 years of life, we're one day away, um, you have been a champion and a leader for farm workers, for labor unions, for the LGBTQ community, for women everywhere, and so many others. And I have to say, I, I have not had a lot of, let's say, role models or people who make me lose my breath growing up, and you are one of them. I have looked up to you very much because it has been 94 years that you have not stopped working, fighting, growing, and organizing for your community. Mr. Mayor, if I can have you hold this for one second. I did want to read a quote from you, which I think really encompasses all that you do, and, and I hope we can all carry this into everything we do. You said, every moment is an organizing opportunity. Every person, a potential activist. Every minute, a chance to change the world. 
and I couldn't agree more. Thank you for everything you have done, everything you continue to do, and for being a role model for our people, our students here in Burbank and everywhere in the world. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you for those words. And uh, when I think of those words about uh, having every moment an organizing moment, as we go into uh, our elections that are happening this year, I just uh, want to say to everybody here that we know how important it is that each of us uh, take that really seriously, that we use every moment that we can to talk to someone, to organize someone, to remind people that how important it is for them to get involved in civic life in civic life and how important it is to, for them to vote. And so that they can elect good people uh, to, uh, to represent, to set policies, like the people here at the city council. Si se puede. Everyone give it up one more time for Dolores Huerta. And as we wrap this presentation, and Ms. Huerta, as you, um, as you find your seat, I just want to add one more comment to the community. Ma'am, you have been an icon to so many people across the nation. The belief that working people, by banding together, can make a better tomorrow. And so my invitation is to all the young people that are watching that think that the world can't change. She changed it. So let's make sure that, they, that all of you watching do the exact same thing. Thank you for being you, Ms. Huerta. Uh, just one more addition. Uh, you said icon. My, son, my youngest son says, Mom, you're not an icon. You're an I can. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I can, I'm gonna to have to borrow that phrase. That's fantastic. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Next we have our city manager report. City manager Justin Hess, do you have anything to report this evening? Uh, Mr. Mayor, yes, uh, thank you. I know that's a hard act to follow, but uh, I'll do my best here. Um, I'd like to introduce um, from our Burbank Police Department, Detective Espindola. Uh, for a brief presentation on the police department's uh, participation in this year's Baker to Vegas run. And I'd like him to talk about their awesome accomplishment uh, at this year's event. Great. Welcome, Detective. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, <clears throat> Vice Mayor, members of the council. My name is Jesus Espindola. I'm a detective with the Burbank Police Department. I'm also the team captain for our Baker to Vegas team. Um, I was asked to come here and share a success story with you um, regarding our, our performance in the race this year, which just took place about two weeks ago. Uh, cue the PowerPoint, ma'am. So for those that aren't familiar with, who are not familiar with the Baker to Vegas race, it's a law enforcement relay race that takes place every year around this time. Um, it's a 120 mile relay race where runners will pass a baton from one to the other. It begins in the city of Baker uh, through Pahrump and it's Las Vegas. Um, this race is divided into 20 separate legs, um, each of these having different um, challenges, distance being one of them. The shortest one is four miles, with the longest one being 10.7 miles. Additionally, just because you are running in the desert, there are environmental conditions that affect runners. Uh, a few years ago, we ran 115 degree weather, which led to a lot of heat-related injuries. We've run in the snow before, where the temperatures dropped below 30 degrees. And this year, we were dealing with 50-mile-per-hour uh, wind gusts that were happening. This started off about 40 years ago. It's grown. There was 258 participating agencies this year from all across the country internationally, with our agency being one of them. Our department has been participating in this race for about 30 years now. Um, it's, a, it's entirely voluntary. All of our participants are our department members, and we do this through annual fundraising, um, donations from family members, from local businesses, members of the community. That's what kind of gets us all to participate in this race every year. Um, previously, our fastest overall time was 16 hours and 39 minutes total. In our entire history, only twice have we run it under 17 hours. 
um, in our particular category where we compete with other agencies of similar size, 150 officers or less, um, the, most, the best we've ever placed is fifth place, which is about five years ago. So we set a new goal for ourselves this year. All the officers collectively train a little bit harder. They put a little extra this year. We wanted to break our department record and we wanted to shoot for a top three finish. And to say that we exceeded expectations is, is putting it nicely. So spoiler alert, but we came in first place this year. <laughs> So we were looking to, to beat our best time of 16 hours and 39 minutes. We actually beat it by an hour and 25 minutes and finished at 15 hours and 14 minutes. So um, it wasn't really a question of how well we would do, but it was by how much we would do. So um, just to kind of break that down a little bit, it's about a 737 average pace per mile per runner for the duration of this, the 15 hours. Um, five of our 20 runners ran under seven minutes. Um, and the vast majority of our team ran in the top 25% of their group. We even had one guy run a 5.45 pace. So it, wasn't, it was obviously a collective effort between 20 different individuals that trained very, very hard for it. We have a positive result to show from it. We came 27th overall out of 258 teams. So this is, um, this is huge for our agency, morale-wise, um, for the development of our physical and mental health well-being. We all train together. We work together. Um, hopefully, by this time next year, I can be here before you again sharing another success story. Um, we did win our, our group by just 11 seconds. So for a 120-mile race where, you know, it's 15 hours long to only win by 11 seconds, it speaks a lot to our efforts, and I'm proud of, of our team and proud to be standing here before you sharing this story with you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, detective, detective, before you go, who was in second place? That would be uh, reigning champion Culver City. Ooh, I'd hate to be Culver City right now. We're going to double 22-second lead next year, right? We'll, we'll shoot for the stars, sir. All right, love Thank it. You, sir. Great job. You're going to have to call Corinne, the mayor over there, and tell her. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> Little friendly wager. All right, anything else, Mr. City Manager? Okay. Uh, folks, we have an extra presentation on our council agenda this evening. I know how much you all love that, but this is good stuff. Uh, our next presentation is a status update on the Burbank Glendale Pasadena Regional, Regional Housing Trust. I would like to welcome Mr. Adam Eliason, Interim Trust Manager, to please begin the presentation. Thank you, Mayor and Council. It's delightful to be with you here tonight, talk to you about the um, uh, the Housing Trust and give you a status update. We felt that um, after almost a year, uh, we needed to come back to you and report how things have progressed in that period of time. So just a reminder, um, in 2022, legislation was passed um, to create the Housing Trust. Uh, it was, that legislation was authored and championed by Senator Portantino. Um, at the same time that the legislation was passed for creation of the Housing Trust, there was an additional request of state funding of $23 million. Thank goodness we got the check quickly. We deposited it. We, we uh, aren't facing a similar situation this year for asking for money, so we get to move forward with that initial funding. A joint powers agreement was executed in May of uh, 2023, and we held promptly our first board meeting um, in that same month. Uh, one of the first things we accomplished at that board meeting was to establish um, the board members and an election of, uh, of the board uh, chair and vice chair. We're happy that Council Member Perez serves as our vice chair. We thank her for her efforts and volunteering to be part of the Housing Trust. Um, one thing uh, I wanted to note is that uh, the Housing Trust uh, for the members of the public is um, set up as a regional uh, collaborative effort with the three cities, Burbank, Glendale, and Pasadena. Its mission is to finance uh, affordable housing in the region, um, also to provide uh, regional technical support um, to help bring uh, economies of scale in uh, initiatives that would uh, help the region on their affordable housing initiatives. Um, as I mentioned, the 23 million that was approved by the state, one of the things that we established as part of the trust uh, that uh, how the funding would be distributed, um, at least the initial funding, 10% um, is allowed to be for trust administration over the future of the trust. Um, 20.7 million will be remaining for 
uh, capital funding of affordable housing projects, and that will be evenly distributed among the cities, uh, equaling $6.9 million each. Um, we've set up a system and policy for accepting funding applications that can now be submitted to the trust from our member cities. Uh, applications require approval of the council uh, from each city uh, prior to their submission to the trust. Um, Civic Home, who I, I, uh, I represent, is an affordable housing consulting firm. We were hired to be the interim trust manager uh, and address all of these formation and policy and organizational setup. Um, we are in the process right now with an RFP to um, interview and screen um, other firms that can serve as the permanent trust manager, and we're expecting that that will take place after the May trust board meeting uh, where we'll uh, have a transition period to help that new permanent um, long-range um, consultant to help the trust move forward. Um, some of the approvals that we've received in this past year is uh, we established a 2023-2024 budget, um, and we will be going through at our May board meeting a new budget for the 24-25 year. Um, we also went through an RFP process and selected legal counsel, accounting, finance, treasurer for the trust, and at our uh, May board meeting, we're uh, going to be bringing forward recommendations for an auditor. Uh, we also um, selected insurance for the trust. We've set up a website and a logo. Um, we've done additional funding applications, both federally and through uh, an additional state funding request that we're waiting on. Um, some of the policy accomplishments is an accounting and finance manual, investment policy where that money can be invested and earn interest until such time that a city needs that funding for capital funding. We've uh, established a procurement policy, conflict of interest policy, document retention policy, and a, f a project funding policy. Um, some of the things that uh, we're looking forward to uh, in the coming year and, and beyond includes um, accepting these um, funding applications from cities for specific um, funding projects. I understand later on your agenda tonight, one such uh, project is being proposed that you'll be talking about later with approval and recommendation to bring that to the trust. We're looking forward to uh, looking over that. Uh, we're also um, looking in the future to continue to stay informed on various funding sources, including um, the Los Angeles County Affordable Housing Solutions Agency, commonly known as La Casa. Uh, we believe, and we've been talking to various experts that have been involved in the creation and formation of La Casa, that trusts are an eligible source of um, funding, and we're hopeful that if La Casa does go through and get funding, that the trust will be the recipient of um, funding to help the region bring more housing, uh, uh, more funding for affordable housing. We're going to continue to monitor um, other funding options and apply when appropriate, whether it's state or federal dollars. And we'll promote and advocate the Tri-City region um, for additional um, affordable housing funding. Uh, lastly, uh, sometime within the next 12 months, we'll be um, finalizing a strategic um, plan that will uh, have short-term and long-term goals included. Um, that concludes my presentation, and uh, I just want to acknowledge Maribel Leland, who's been representing your city so well on the staff level. Uh, we also have staff representation from each of the cities, and uh, that really becomes kind of our steering committee before we go to the board. So all of these actions involve uh, a representative from the city, and Maribel's been our point of contact, been delightful to work with her. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, first, I'll go to uh, Vice Mayor Perez as our appointee. Do you have any additional comments or anything you'd like to add? No, it was summed up pretty well. I think the only thing I would say is I, I know we all serve as members of different bodies and on different subcommittees. It has been absolutely fascinating and a learning experience to be a member of a body that is in formation. Mm. You know, rarely does one get to see the initial steps of a body like this. And so I'm, I'm glad to say I feel we're in good hands. And this is a great partnership for our three cities as we put our heads together to solve our housing situation. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from my colleagues? Okay. Thank you very much, Thank sir, you. for the presentation. Okay.
<clears throat> Next, we have our reporting out on closed session. Mr. City Attorney, would you please give the report? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Madam Vice Mayor, members of the City Council, and for the benefit of the public, City Council met this evening at 5 p.m. to discuss one matter of existing litigation pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.9 D1 in the case of Mark Ellenson versus City of Burbank, uh, case BC 648515. This case involves personal injury and property damage. Uh, City Council took no reportable action this evening. Thank you, Mr. City Attorney. Now is the time for general public comment. For members of the public who are here in person when, and would like to speak, please present a completed yellow general public comment card to our city clerk staff. Any person speaking during general public comment may address the council on any matter concerning city business, except for tonight's public hearing, which has its own comment period. If you speak to the public hearing item during this period, your comments will not be included in the public hearing record. Uh, comments are limited to either one minute voluntarily or three minutes in total per person, depending on which length you opted for this evening. In order to promote fairness, please stay within your maximum allotted time of either one minute or three minutes. A timer is available on the podium to help you keep track of how much time you have remaining. We also ask that you state your name for the record or in Oftentimes, I say your name out loud that you've given me. If I mispronounce it, feel free to correct it before your time begins. And for those wishing to call in during the general public comment period, if you haven't already done so, please call right now at 818-238-3335. Callers will be placed in a queue until all in-person public comments have been completed. At this time, we will begin the general public comment period with one-minute comments followed by the three-minute com three comments. And I will clearly delineate when we're going to the three-minute comments. So for the one-minute comments, I first have Patrick Swain, followed by Mark Greenfield. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council. Thank you for uh, all you do in this beautiful city. I'm uh, speaking on Agenda 14, which is uh, the appointment to fill one vacancy on the Planning Commission. And I ask that you highly recommend, I highly recommend Terry Norton. I ask that you all please uh, support this gentleman. He lives in the city and he's an amazing man. And I think he'd do a great job for y'all. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you for your comment. Next, we have Mark Greenfield, followed by Ruben Mendoza. Good evening, council members. My name is Mark Greenfield. I'm a business agent with IBEW Local 11. I don't reside in the city of Burbank, but Terry Norton has been a friend of mine and an activist in union politics, and I know he'll do a great job as a planning commissioner for the city of Burbank. He really loves the city of Burbank. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next, we have Ruben Mendoza, followed by Joel Greenfield. Good evening. My um, name is Ruben Mendoza. It's a great night tonight. Um, I'm an organizer for the IBEW, um, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. So having Ms. Dolores Huerta here tonight was amazing. So, um, But I'm here in favor of um, Terry Norton. I'm a 30-year resident of Burbank. I love Burbank. And I think Terry would do a great job at Planning Commission. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Next, we have Joel Greenfield, followed by Alan Radajic. Hi, my name is Joel Greenfield. I'm a union electrician with IBW Local 11. I am the chairman of our unit that represents the entire San Fernando Valley. For the past six years, Terry has been my recording secretary, and he does an excellent job. Uh, I think he would do an amazing job in the planning commission. Tonight, you guys recognize a legendary labor leader Let's follow up with that by appointing another one to the Planning Commission. So in the words of Dolores Huerta, si se puede. Thank you for your comment. My uh, final one minute comment card belongs to Alan Radajic. Uh, good evening, Council. My name is Alan Radajic. I'm here tonight um, for item number 14, the uh, Planning Commission vacancy spot. I think that my background in construction and business development, general development, and our a deep commitment to our city is why I'd make a great um, 
member on the Planning Commission. Uh, I've lived here for over seven years. My wife grew up, went to boroughs. I have deep community ties. Uh, my vision for Burbank is one where development and preservation go together, um, where every project is not only measured um, by its economic impact, but also its, eco its impact for the people of the city. Um, by joining the board, I plan to foster community and make sure that all voices are heard. Uh, I bring a data-driven approach and I have a genuine passion for everyone who lives here. Um, I'm sure that together on the Planning Commission, we can really progress as a city and continue to That's grow. your time. Thank, Thank you. you very much, and uh, sorry for the mispronunciation of your name. Thanks for correcting me. So we now move into our three-minute public comment cards. First, I have Ron Bax, followed by that guy with the cardboard sign. But first up, Ron Bax. Good evening, Ron Bax. My father had and my father-in-law and I have pensions. Pensions are fixed amounts and do not keep up with inflation. Therefore, they lose buying power over time. All had or have Social Security, which has COLA, but it does not keep up with inflation, thus also losing buying power over time. The stock market was not, an easy, was not as easy to use 50 years ago as it is today, so we began buying real estate, which is more stable and tracks inflation better but takes significantly more capital and commitment. You are being asked to consider some steps that make real estate investing worse than having a pension. The state reduced the benefits of real estate investing with the adoption of AB 1482. Furthermore, the legislature could not have anticipated COVID-19 causing severe inflation. I have told you, I've told several of you that I could live with AB 1482, but the last year's labor and price adjustments caused me to retract that assertion. Last year, my hazard insurance went up 26.7%. This year, it is up 115%. That is nearly tripling in two years. I have, shared with my, I have shared that my trash collection went up 81%, lawn care 10%, power and water is planned to be 8%. Gas is up over 200% in the last few years. All these expenses are significant compared to property taxes. Even fi city fire inspection went up 10%. Mathematically, you cannot take all these increases, normalize and average them, and get a composite with a value less than CPIU because they all exceed CPIU. It, takes, it will take many years to compensate for these increases using the 5% catch-up of AB 1482. I just completed a partial repainting of the building. Ten years ago, it was complete. Even then, the increase in cost calculates to 9.4% per year in, uh, compounded. Increase in roofing-based based on estimates is similar. The same calculation performed on CPIU over the same period is only 3.12%. The cost of major maintenance far exceeds CPIU. I applaud any action that targets unscrupulous housing providers, aids truly deserving tenants, but not blanket ones that hurt charitable housing providers. I have a property that through a carve out in AB 1482 allowed me to raise the rent 15% last year, yet the rent is still $900 per month under the market. Does that make me an evil land housing provider? I hope your answer is no. I consider myself to be an active housing provider. Most of your mom and pops are probably passive, meaning their rents are probably well below the market. They are probably under the misconception that they can raise rents unconstrained at any time if necessary, which is no longer true. You would be surprised how many, surprised how many people I have found that do not know how Proposition 19 will severely affect their ability to pass down generational wealth. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Next we have that guy with the cardboard sign, followed by Brian Basilar. Boy, good evening everybody. Wait till that last speaker finds out what this school bond is going to do to him. It's about sixty dollars per hundred thousand, and if you know the average house they say is eight hundred thousand. Ours is much more, of course, but that's you know uh, four hundred eighty a year times thirty years. It's like fifteen grand for every homeowner in Burbank. Hey, let's let me ask you a question, Mr. Mayor. You got some stuff on your agenda today. You're going to do some homelessness stuff and try and help out. And the 99 cent stores, of course, closing, which is a, it's a loss. And this proposed school bond from our 
five school board members who are so disingenuous. I'll get back to that. Do they have anything in common? Do you think they have anything in common? And put aside your bias, Mr. Mayor, because I've looked at your political uh, campaign disclosures and I saw you know, who gave you money and I saw that some of these school board members have given you money. So try and put that aside for a minute. This is a disaster for seniors, for children, for anybody in Burbank. And I'm standing here, this is my mountaintop right here, and I'm screaming out to everybody, whether you live in Burbank or shop in Burbank, this is gonna affect you. Things are gonna cost a lot more. So, you know, the school board, they're actually telling us they're a little bit, dis they're a lot disingenuous. They're saying this is not a new tax. Well, why do we need to vote on it then? is what I would ask them. Of course it's a new tax. And you know, I'm not suggesting they're liars. I'm saying they're liars. They're telling us this is not a new tax, and it absolutely is, and it's disastrous. And it's a tax, this bond, we have to pay interest on it. And if any of you have ever bought a car, you get a truth in lending disclosure. If you've ever bought a house, you get a truth in lending disclosure, and they tell you how much the interest is gonna be. This group at the school board is not talking about that. They don't want to. It would, the truth would, is so scary. It's a nightmare of what it's gonna do to our children. And if we wanna send our kids to college, if we wanna help our kids, man, and they don't know about compound interest. Those yearly payments, that money could be working for you and growing for your retirement or your future. So if you, you know, Think about what's going on here. Think about your young kids. You know, this is a disaster. They've taken all their money, about a $200 million budget, and they've given it out to salaries for themselves. And now they say, well, we're out of money. We can't fix the roof. Help us out for 30 years, and the total cost is going to be about a billion dollars with the interest. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next, we have Brian Basler, followed by Jane Kim. Greetings, City Council. My name is Brian Bazelar, and I'm a librarian with the Burbank Public Library. We, the Burbank librarians, first want to thank the City Council for their proclamation of National Library Week. It is incredibly important for libraries to have the backing of local leadership during these turbulent times, and, and we appreciate your support. We've come today to provide context for a few items sent to the City Council in recent weeks, a petition and a set of reports. The petition and reports are related to a reclassification plan which library administration announced to, li to library staff last fall. At that time, many library staff made suggestions to our administration in an effort to mitigate the negative effects of this plan. These effects included the planned demotion of five librarians as well as the removal of the professional standard, the Masters of Library and Information Science, as a minimum qualification for two positions, librarian and library section manager. Despite our voiced concerns, the plan proceeded to the Civil Service Board in March for the board's approval. We shared our misgivings with the CSB and they delayed the vote on the job specification changes, inviting us to make our case. We submitted group reports and personal letters to the CSB and this city council. You have received the results of a petition we circulated that collected over a thousand signatures from Burbank library staff, city employees from other departments, Burbank residents, Burbank library patrons, as well as the library staff and library supporters from across Southern California who stand with us in solidarity and expect our voices to be heard. Um, that would be the end of my comments, but I would like to give the podium over to my colleague, Jane Kim. Thank you for your comment. Just as a formality, I know you're all probably going to go in a line, um, but just allow me to go through our normal process. So thank you for your comment. Next, I have Jane Kim, followed by Patty Hollis, who I believe is out of order, but is next in line. So Ms. Kim, you're next. Thank you, Mayor, City Council. I'm here in the spirit of Dolores Huerta today, as we have organized as library staff, library workers, and librarians. My name is Jane. 
I have been a Burbank resident for over 10 years, first time homeowner in Burbank. I'm also an alumni of the Burbank RISE program. I am also a Burbank librarian. As my colleague Brian mentioned, library administration is proposing to remove the nationally recognized standard of training for librarians and replace it with no alternative form of training. This plan masquerades as a diversity, equity, inclusion move, but its immediate beneficiaries, as confirmed by our directors, are not from historically marginalized groups. This is an unacceptable abuse of DEI, its aims, and its spirit. True equitable change requires the voices of and input from historically marginalized groups. It also requires a smarter approach. As written, the current proposal misidentifies the problem and oversimplifies the solution. People who are not a part of a community are often the ones making decisions about and for that community. There's a quote I want to share. Nothing about us without us, please. We as Burbank library staff are asking for a seat at the table to be included in the conversations and decisions that directly affect us and the community, Burbank library and its patrons that we serve. Thank you, Mayor, for your proclamation. As you've heard earlier, libraries, we do so much for our community. And that list that you heard earlier is not even the full list of all that we do. Thank you, Mayor, for acknowledging the education and training that serves as the foundation for what we do as librarians. We are asking City Council for your support right now in our current situation. Please take the time to review our materials that were emailed to you. Many of the letters are personal letters from staff and from former staff. We hope you will use your influence, your platform, to help make sure our voices are heard and that we continue to uphold the value of what we can provide here at Burbank Public Library and the city. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next we have Patty Hollis, followed by Mark Scroggs. Different topic. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, council members, my name is Patty Hollis and I'm currently serving on the Art in Public Places Commission Committee. I missed three consecutive meetings which has initiated the need for you to evaluate whether or not I should continue serving. I would like to ask you forgive my absences as I was traveling for an extended period of time. My husband and I flew to New Zealand on November 10th for our daughter's wedding and on, on November 25th in Wellington. In December, we were treated to a month-long road trip through the South Island, and I'm still processing all that we saw and did. But along the way, I managed to collect a number of photographs of public art in several different cities. These are included in an email that I sent you. Some of the things that I learned, Aotearoa is the Maori name for New Zealand, and it means land of the long white cloud. Cafes are all the rage, and the price is the price. No tax or tip need be figured out. It is what it is. The dry, they drive on the opposite side of the road, and roundabouts are everywhere. <laughs> um, during World War I, New Zealanders sustained a 58% casualty rate, which is why you see so many war memorials throughout the entire country. Currently, the Te Papa Museum in Wellington has a permanent exhibit on the Battle of Gallipoli created by Weta Workshop, and it was quite moving. I got COVID while we were there, and I learned about the pharmacies and their urgent care system, and I was impressed. Dunedin was the furthest south that we went. It's a university town, Scottish influence in architecture and names. Murals were everywhere and take a lot of the pictures that I sent you. Um, and a free art museum. Oamaru, steampunk museum that wasn't free but it was really fun to look at and a nearby playground that also had steampunk theme. Small community with a penguin sanctuary, so I got to see real penguins in the wild. Um, Christchurch uh, is sustained a devastating earthquake in 2011, 
We got to see and hear about how that impacted some of our daughter's new family. A 2019 Times article noted that Los Angeles needs to look closely at the damages sustained by Christchurch. We walked through an entire community that had been red tagged and all the houses were gone due to liquefaction. No evidence remains of the homes except for whatever landscaping was left behind. It's a park now and we found people foraging for fruit from any number of fruit trees that had been left behind. Anyway, I hope you enjoy the photographs I sent and that you can see that even though I wasn't here for three meetings, my heart That's your still time. pulled Thank you very much. Art. Thank you. <laughs> Next we have uh, Mark Scroggs followed by Liz Bax. Good evening, ever. Good evening, everyone. I'm Mark Scroggs. Um, I want to update, like I've done in the past, about what's been going on in the film and production and television production world. We're busier now than we have been, as I, I think I mentioned before, because we knew productions would be up because they want to bank stuff in case there's potential strikes later this summer. We hope there's not, but anything that's not shot, being shot here, they're going to shoot out of the country, and I don't think they're as affected by all the potential strikes. Aussie and the unions, the unions are working out deals right now individually with the Motion Picture Association, but there's a big overall deal that has to be done also, plus the Teamsters. So who knows what's going to happen when, hopefully there won't be any strikes, hopefully we'll be all back to normal, whatever normal is by the end of the summer. Um, I do want to put this idea out there though. The pandemic, the strikes. The contraction in our entertainment business. I mean, it's affected this community badly. You can tell like with all the tax things and everything else economically. It's affecting so many people. Last week I was at a television academy mixer. Yesterday I was at a college showcase, acting showcase. Every conversation had to do with, I haven't been working. I don't know when I'm gonna work again. I just went back to work for a short period. We're not making as much as we used to. AI is going to take over my job. Um, what state can I move to? Is Should I retire early? That's what's going on right now with a lot of people. I know we can't solve all that here, but I do want to, you know, last summer during the strikes and during the pandemic, different like mental health packages or information things or business grant um, information was provided. Sometimes it was too late in the summer, but if we could start organizing that stuff now, it would help the people who need it now, just put it, and also putting it out there and letting people know about it so they don't have to go discover it later. Um, and it's also going to help with other business. Like he, they were saying, the 99 cent store. There's a lot of people who are just going to be out of work and just saying, here's, what the, here's the things. Here's job, job Connect. Here's all these services for you. Just have it ready now so we don't have to worry about it in July or August because I can't listen to people anymore telling me how bad it is. You get that all day long, and I know... You know, there's a lot of other, there's a lot of pressing problems in the world, but their personal problems are affecting people, and people are going to start moving away, and it's going to affect the economy here even more. Thanks. Thank you for your comment. Next, we have Liz Bax, followed by Joe Pimienta. Hi, everybody. How are you? I just wanted to ditto what he just said, because I haven't worked in a year. I work in the film business. I'm a crew member. I'm not an actor. I'm not a writer. So I don't make any of that money that they make. And I'm not working for a year. I pretty soon won't be able to pay my property taxes. And there's no help for that. Right? Right. OK. So I just, um, Ron Bax, my brother-in-law, has spent a good amount of time and a long amount of time very patiently telling you about what it's like to be a landlord from a financial standpoint. I want to tell you my personal story, because I just realized yesterday I'm a landlord. I do own property. And I have tenants. I have tenants, and the property is not in Burbank. The property um, I bought six years ago with my husband because we inherited some money. Shortly after we had our first renters in there, they decided they didn't want to be there anymore and they left. They left without notice 
They didn't want their money back, their deposit back, because when my property manager went in and looked at the property, there was $20,000 worth of damage. $20,000. Where do I come up with $20,000? I had to come up with $20,000 and my property set, set, vacant, faint, set empty for four months on top of that. So that's a personal story of mine of how I'm supposed to be as a landlord to pay all this stuff and keep my property at a low rate. I at least have to be able to, to charge what I'm paying, putting into it to get a comparable rate so I at least break even because I didn't that time and it took a while to make it up. And with that and the strike, we're now even in more debt because I don't get to go in and ask for, to buy things for less money because I don't have the money for that right now. If I want it, I have to pay it. If I want to stay in my house, I have to pay the, the insurance. I have to pay the property taxes. I have to mow the lawn. I have to mow the parkway or the city's going to get mad at me. So, you know, I just, it, 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 I do understand the tenants, but if they want their properties kept up, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come at a price. It's going to come at a price. And if they want them to go to trash, then they can do that too. Because that's what's going to happen when we have rent control. Because the landlords are not going to be able to afford to keep up their buildings. I'm a landlord, another different landlord speaking to you. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, and I see jazz hands back there. Thanks for that. Always love to see that. Uh, next, we have Joe Pimienta, followed by David Donahue. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members, staff, and everyone present in the chamber. Um, it's funny, what we just heard actually kind of ties into what I was going to talk about. Um, so I just kind of want to point out that like tenants have expenses as well, just throwing that out there. However, I do want to point out, um, you know, associating with that, um, that we do have a lot of tenants that pay over 50% of their income just for rent. Not groceries, not bills, not meds. 50% or more of their income. Over 80% over 80 of tenants are rent burdened by paying more than a third of their income. So what is going on with that? So like what ends up happening with that, it's that the way that things are right now, if already 50% of their income is just goes just for the rent, how long before they cannot afford to live there? That's what's happening. People are driven out of their home because they cannot afford to live there. Now, talk about that. You know, talk, you know, you know, just think about that as an expense. Um, our opposition really seems to think that things are fine. They say that we don't need to make any adjustments, that we don't need to fix anything. Um, again, I'm going to say the same thing that I said. If things were fine, we wouldn't be coming up bringing this up, that people are being priced out of their home. Really throwing that in there. I, I say that because I really need that to stick. Is that when 50% or more of your income goes to just having the one roof over your, over your head, you don't have time to think about any, anything else. Everything else goes to wait. You can wait on your meds. You can wait on food, I guess. Or, this, that's how, or at least that's how they wanted to think about it. And here's the thing. A lot of it just really seems to be that the reality now is that people are permanent tenants. It used to be that tenants you know, were thought of just transient, temporary. Now the thing is that tenants are permanent. That's all they can do. They cannot afford to buy a home. They cannot afford to, you know, and sometimes they, can even, they can't even afford to stay here. Um, and yet, just kind of how as I, as I have it here, if they are permanent tenants and Burbank is where they call home, and without more tenant protections, without a rent cap, we are driving them out of their homes. Just letting that again sit there. Again, um, 
I don't want to be get uh, no. Anyways, I think I'll just leave it for that for now. Um, I'll last my few seconds just to say that uh, outside there are still people calling for a ceasefire, so I want to thank you for putting it in the agenda item. In the meantime, I know that it's not coming until late May, but if you can also be vocal about where you stand on that, because free Palestine, ceasefire now. People are dying. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Next we have David Donahue, followed by Judy Napolitano. Mayor Schultz, Vice Mayor Perez, Council Members, and very talented staff. My name is David Donahue. I'm a Burbank homeowner and business owner. It is quite fortuitous to be here speaking when uh, Dolores Furt was honored for her activism. The last uh, council meeting on March 26th, I was doing just that. I was acting as a, in the capacity as the president of uh, Vision Burbank, and we were talking about an issue that we felt important about. We mobilized a lot of people. Uh, thank you very much to the staff that really helped us facilitate that. Thank you to the Burbank Police Department. Thank you to uh, Jonathan Jones, the Public Information Officer, and everybody at the city that I coordinated with to be able to make that happen. Vision Bar Burbank also put out a press release, and we, I think, had five cameras there that heard us, that heard the members that were there on their own behalf, they heard me as the president. This evening, I'm talking to you not as the president of Vision Burbank, but as a private individual about my experience of that night. It was the fact, and I've also, this is to go with the ethics complaint that I have filed with the city against two transportation commissioners that I will not name, that conducted themselves in the capacity of a Burbank Transportation Commissioner. One particular was quoted on, I believe, 11 different sources as a Burbank Transportation Commissioner. The description in, uh, under his name in television interviews was as a Burbank Transportation Commissioner. I do not need to take any of my three minutes to be able to share with you what the Burbank Handbook on Commission's Boards says, but you defer to that, to that body, to the board or to the commission. And I made my sentiments known at the Transportation Commissioner meeting. And I want to personally thank Council Member Anthony for what he said that evening. And this brings me to the next issue, because people that were involved, again, who have identified themselves and are Burbank Transportation Commissioners, were featured on a website. The website has grabbed and used the city logo. This, this is the city logo. The B. This is on a website right now where a trans Burbank Transportation Commissioner is quoted in two letters to the editor, one to my Burbank and one to the Burbank leader. Activism is wonderful. Do it the right way. Do not have confrontations, which I don't have enough time to talk about the confrontation that ensued when this particular Transportation Commissioner was in my immediate space and did not want to move until the police moved him. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your comment. Next we have Judy Napolitano, and then my last in-person card is Matt Fabius. Hi, good evening, city council members. Um, I am a homeowner in Burbank, just a little bit of history. Um, we've lived in the home 68 and a half years, so we are longtime residents. I just recently purchased it. The reason I'm coming tonight is we just had an incident today with parking patrol. And I know that um, I need to have a petition, but I wanted to bring it out now so that you guys can be aware. And when I do do this petition, um, for a number of reasons. So today, um, I have been in the past few weeks since, since I have purchased the house and I have somebody painting rooms and stuff. and. Um, so I give permit, put permits on people's cars. I became, got my permit for my car, and I, every week, at the beginning of the week, I print out five permits for each of them, and they have them in their cars. This morning, um, they, when I printed them out, because they weren't there yesterday, um, I, they put them in their car at 11 o'clock this morning. One is posted, she taped it to her window, and the other one, it's on the dashboard. 
Parking Patrol, and I will tell you something because this has been going on, Parking Patrol had not been coming down this street for probably eight years. Recently, in the past few months, and it only makes me think that Burbank might need some cash, as we all do right now, recently they just started coming down the past few weeks. And today, he ticketed two cars that I know of that both had parking permits in their window. And if this is happening on my street, this is happening on everybody else's street. I don't think I'm being targeted. I don't think they're being targeted. So. I wanted to bring that up because that is a problem to me that nobody is looking to see. And I, and I have pictures of it that I will be sending to the city, but I wanted to put it on the agenda now so that people are aware of it because to me that is a big problem. The other thing is I will be petitioning because the only reason, and as I said, we've been in this house, my father just died a year ago and I just recently purchased it, but 68 and a half years. In 1980s, the reason Burbank put permits on these streets, I think the California, we, I live over by where NBC used to be, the media district, California Street. The reason the permits started was because Johnny Carson was, was there and let's make a deal. And the audiences were during the day between one and eight, that's why it has the weird hours, and they were all, uh, nobody had parking by the time they came home in the afternoon. So that's what started. You guys have closed our street permanently on Alameda, NBC no longer exists. Johnny Cars, uh, Jay Leno left in 15 years ago and it's been in New York and let's make a deal hasn't been down there. So there really isn't any reason for that. So when my Thank permit you, time petition time. Time. comes, please look at that. Thank you and we will. Um, my final in-person public comment card is Matt Fabius. Hi, my name is Matt Fabius. I'm a resident of Burbank. Um, I wanted to speak regarding agenda item number 17. I'm asking City Council to approve the Tiny Homes Transitional Housing Development. Housing is a human right, and it's important that we acknowledge that a policy failure at all levels of government has been responsible for creating our housing crisis and homelessness crisis by prioritizing property as an investment over as a basic need. In the Southern California Association of Governments 2020 housing report for the city of Burbank, the reported number of unsheltered unhoused residents was 209. 49 beds is a great start, but it's not enough to house all of our un unsheltered residents. I hope the city council and city, city staff will continue to work on housing projects, especially permanent supportive housing, so that all of our residents can at minimum be sheltered. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. That now completes in-person public comment. For callers, please remember to lower the volume on your TV or computer and take your phone off of speaker mode when you deliver public comments so that we can hear you clearly. Madam City Clerk, do we have any callers on the line? Yes, we do, Mr. Mayor. We have two at the moment. Okay, go ahead and send the first one through. The first caller is Nathan Adair. Hi, you're on with the City Council. Hi, I'm Nathan, and I would like you to know that I support the proposed safe parking and homeless shelter developments on the agenda tonight. This will provide these tenants with a safe place to live and cheap transportation to use while they work to rebuild their lives. It will also provide the community at large with enhanced safety because these people will leave the other parts of town where they currently live. In addition, it will get us started on making better use of a prime location downtown. I catch the train every day from the downtown station, so I get to see firsthand how these giant parking lots are often only 25% full. I would love to see a future where we convert 50% or more of this parking area into mixed-use housing, and what better way to start than by setting aside a location for people who currently lack a safe place to sleep. Let's do it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next caller, please. The next caller is Scott Myers. Hi, Scott. You're on with the council. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the city council. Uh, my call is to uh, respond to the agenda item pertaining to the quote-unquote homeless crisis, quote, quote. Well, there's certainly a crisis, but it's a crisis of communication. 
as almost nobody in Burbank is aware of most of what your agendas are from week to week, really, please, you must make some effort at notifying residents as to what your agenda is. But homeless crisis in Burbank, no. This is a completely manufactured uh, story by some members of the city council at the behest of what is increasingly apparent, and that is what appears to be a shadow government operating in the city of Burbank, which controls some of you because it brings you campaign organizers and votes. Regarding the homeless, you may have stragglers walking in from Coenga or Vineland, not noticing the street signs are green. But before you spend another moment on this issue of shelters, please, I implore you, I implore the rational members on the city council to learn what really happens in these shelters, like the ones in Los Angeles. The dealing of the worst narcotics, drug dealers literally residing in shelters under the color of homelessness because that's where their customers are. Their customers double as mules who then go out onto the street and sell drugs. They get their drugs for free because they are the mules, or they get them at a discount. You will destroy a neighborhood, and you will have overdoses, cadavers, violent crime on the sidewalks. Please seek the advice and counsel and the story of what the county sheriff can offer you as to what they've seen in the Los Angeles shelters. Some of you on the city council want to destroy peaceful neighborhoods of single-family homes, homes and even mock them. But to the others, please stop empowering these other colleagues of yours. If you house people in a shelter, they will expect to never leave, and you will be adopting them. This is the situation in Los Angeles. And the innocent people, including women, who entered such a place on an emergency, they don't stand a chance. They will get smoked out with meth and often trafficked. This has been documented and acknowledged by the mayor of Los Angeles in a recent article in the Los Angeles Times. So please, please stop the gaslighting. There is no homeless crisis in Burbank. There is one in Los Angeles. Don't import it into Burbank. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Uh, do we have, yes, next caller, please. Two more in queue. Okay. The next caller is Christopher Matthew Spencer. Hi, you're on with the council. This is Christopher Matthew Spencer. I've been a resident in Burbank for uh, the past 32 years, and I live in Magnolia Park. I spent nine months of my life documenting and observing the homeless in the entire city of Burbank as a retired person and somebody that cares about Burbank very much. I provided uh, the city with a lot of detailed records and a lot of audits of what was going on in the city. Uh, my conclusion was the number one cause of property crimes in Burbank is meth addiction. I studied the arrest records of individual people. I gave specific case studies and had meetings with the community development director and the police department and identified to them the causation of the chronic homelessness of individuals such as Carrie Mitchell a person who's been arrested 10 times in the past 12 months uh, for public intoxication. Uh, the city provided him with access to shelter, provided him with a place to live, and he refuses to accept that housing because he is a public inebriate, a public drunkard who cannot help himself. Uh, when I communicated with the city attorney, I was informed by him that only people who can actually accept help will be helped, and, uh, and that was clear to me that Mr. Mitchell... Uh, despite his desire to want to get sobered up, would never be in public housing. I visited the tiny home shelter over in North Hollywood at the invitation of the assistant city manager and the community development director and immediately noted that there was uh, the smell of marijuana, beer cans all over the place. The neighborhood was in decline. I knew the neighborhood well because I actually worked out at the Gold's Gym in the 1990s, and it was a nice neighborhood, and it's no longer a nice neighborhood. Uh, when I called the shelter to assist people in Burbank to help them with finding housing, uh, there was a number of people that just refused housing. I, I had access to housing and volunteered to get them into the housing, provide transportation, provide uh, assistance and money for medication, and those individuals refused the uh, help. 
I documented this with videos. I documented it with emails to the city, and I provided all of this information. It, it's not making any sense to me why the uh, city is going to designate this as a crisis. 43% of the identified homeless people are van life individuals. These are people who are not Burbankers. They came into Burbank in their RVs, and that's almost half of the people. And so with that in mind, I had suggested using barrack-style housing. I'm a, I'm a former Navy uh, veteran. I'm a Navy veteran. I was in the Navy eight years, and I suggested using barrack-style housing as an interim step to test out their theory and provide proof of concept before they spend multiple millions of dollars of public funds. Thanks for listening. Thank you for your comment. Next caller, please. I'm being told that he would like to speak on the public hearing, so... Oh, okay, so... We're done. All right. <clears throat> All right, you. there being no further public comment relevant to the general period of public comment, I doubt now declare that public comment period closed. Uh, thank you to everyone who participated. Now is the time for a brief response from the city council, the city manager, and or the city attorney. Um, Mr. Hess, do you want to go first? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a couple of quick items uh, regarding the uh, parking con uh, patrol issue and the ticket. I know um, our police department uh, did uh, uh, talk to uh, the lady right now, so uh, we're working through that. And I know there's an appeal process if she had the permits, so uh, so I know they're, they, they w stepped out and uh, discussed that with her. As well as any, um, as far as classification changes related to the library positions, any classification changes would come back to you after going through civil service. So you will have an opportunity to review that and uh, discuss that and deliberate. Uh, when that happens, I, I have no clue. Um, I don't think it's imminent, but uh, um, I know they're working through, as you can tell, they're working through some issues. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. Who'd like to go next? Uh, yes, Council Member. Uh, just a, a follow-up on that. Uh, normally, uh, reclassifications come to us on consent. Would we have to specifically request if that comes back to be an agenda item, or is that not traditional? If it ends up being on consent, you could always pull it. So. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Uh, and just uh, for the members at home, uh, Mr. City Manager, any employee of the city is allowed to come on their own time after hours and petition their city government uh, on any issue at any time without fear of retaliation, without fear of losing their job. Is that correct? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. Um, that's all my questions. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Uh, anyone else? Oh, uh, Council Member Takashi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as always, thank you to everyone who came out tonight to speak. Thank you to those who called in. Thanks to all the folks who sent us emails and asked for meetings. Uh, several of you commented on items that will be discussed later in the evening, so we'll hold off on responding on those. Um, thank you to the folks who are our regulars, our groupies, who come every, every Tuesday for your comments. There was just one thing I wanted to follow up on. Um, one of the callers asked, um, said that there are many people who are not aware of the agenda from week to week. Can you just briefly comment on how folks in the community can know what's going on from week to week? And I believe there's a way to get an alert of like the, the agenda that's coming out, right? Yeah, I'd love to call up our public information officer, Jonathan Jones, and he could provide that 411. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council. It's been a long time. Happy to be back talking to everybody. The agenda goes out every week from our clerk's office. It's also followed out by the city's public information office. I would invite everybody to check us out on BurbankCA.gov. You can sign up for constant contact and get alerts about the agendas, all that good stuff, as well as follow us on social media, BurbankCA.gov. And there's also the Burbank 311 app that I would highly recommend following for updates, all that good stuff, leading you back to social. All of the agendas go out the week before and everything is out there. And if you want to go back and watch, you can always go on our YouTube page and rewatch any meeting. And just a follow-up, on our website, we actually have an agenda forecast for correct. weeks in advance, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Jones. Oh, and one more. If I may add just one last, it is out on Thursday, late afternoon. Late afternoon, so, that is correct. So you can always guarantee that Thursday late afternoon, if there's no hiccups, that it would be out there. That is correct. A hiccup would be Friday. 
Absolutely. Just saying, if it's not there Thursday, to, yes. check Friday. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Um, Council Member Mullins, anything else on your end? Uh, no, I just wanted to congratulate everyone who received uh, the proclamation tonight. And of course, uh, Dolores Huerta, it was an honor to meet her here in person. So um, really pleased to see her here with us today. Uh, thank everyone who emailed us, called us, and uh, wanted to talk about the items on the agenda tonight, which is the uh, for the board, uh, planning uh, board, uh, specifically planning commission, that is. Uh, so we will be talking about that. And uh, the city manager already addressed the other issue regarding the um, library staff. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Um, Vice Mayor, any comments? Sure. What a day. Um, I'm excited for, for all of the proclamations we had. I know you have two fellow former library board members right here. Um, so we're, we're very excited and I was also in awe to once again see Dolores Huerta and as you all see, I am almost speechless every time I see her. Um, I will say in the spirit of that, thank you to all our commenters especially and including those who came from our labor unions to speak, proving that organizing is very much alive. Thank you for coming down. I won't mention anything else about the agenda items, but I am glad to see that organizing is live and well in all forms of activism. Um, to Patty, thank you for coming to share with us. We will address um, at the proper agenda item, but I just want to thank you for coming to speak to us. Mr. Scroggs, as always, thank you for keeping us up to date on what's happening in the media entertainment industry economy. We need to continue hearing it. I always want to shout you out for that. You keep us well informed. I appreciate it. And then finally, I'm really glad that uh, Judy, who came to speak to us, is getting assisted with the parking information. But I will share a shout out there to our police department. We do have a wonderful system that folks can use online to contest a ticket. I am not perfect. I have gotten parking tickets, and it's a great way to go online if there's any issues, if you have questions. Um, our officers can be very responsive online, so definitely make use of that. Um, and other than that, thank you to the folks who came to talk about items on and off the agenda. We hear you every week. We appreciate that and all of the emails as well. And thank you, everybody. Si se puede. Thank you. I'm going to go back to Councilmember Mullins. Yes, Mr. Mayor. I think it's uh, important that what the speaker mentioned that uh, uh, she made a comment, I guess the city needs money like everyone else, so therefore they're out there giving more parking tickets. Uh, I, I wanted to maybe just remind everyone the reason why there is people are noticing more parking tickets because we have hired an outside contractor to help us with that. Correct. Yeah, we are using uh, LAS. We we were down uh, 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 officers and, um, and we couldn't get them. So uh, we, we went to a more contemporary model that we're piloting right now. And um, uh, we have we are at full strength at this point with them. So uh, so you're seeing more presence out there, uh, them enforcing uh, uh, the parking uh, restrictions throughout the city. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. I'll keep my comments brief. I just want to thank everyone who showed up in person tonight, um, those who called in. I know there's a few more waiting to give your public comment. Um, you know, it's a record number of public comment periods tonight, and it's great to see so much uh, activism and enthusiasm. And I want to echo the vice mayor's comments, especially on a night when we're honoring a, lab a labor li icon. It's really great to see IBW out in force, uh, members of AFSCME, uh, just very uh, serendipitous, to say the least. Um, I did want to just make two very quick uh, specific comments uh, to Mr. Donahue regarding the ethics complaint. Uh, thank you for apprising the council of what's going on. We are receiving your emails. Uh, my understanding is that's been referred to the city attorney's office, so we're going to leave it in uh, his capable hands for whatever appropriate response, if any, is uh, is forthcoming. Uh, and then to Mr. Schlossman, um, the, the guy carrying the cardboard sign. Um, I wanted to say that uh, I know you show up uh, every week and I know you're concerned about the bond measure. Uh, in the past, I've invited you to communicate directly with me about your specific concerns about the bond. Um, but one other alternative, if you don't feel comfortable having that direct line of communication, I actually wanted to compliment Mr. Bax, who shows up every week and painstakingly uh, walks us through your line of thought so we understand your concerns. Perhaps, Mr. Schlossman, um, not to tell you how to do it, but that might be another model that you could look to if you'd like to educate not just me, 
but the council and the community about what specific concerns you might have. Although I will add that the bond measure is beyond the purview of the city council. That is a matter, a uh, subject matter of the school board and only the school board in this instance. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you, everybody. Um, oh, that prompt to follow up? It did. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I just want to mention one thing. There was a caller um, who spoke about a member of the community and gave their full name and description about them. I, I want to thank us other members of the community who often come down, um, folks who have ethic complaints, uh, folks who have uh, issues with our school board members, not coming down to this microphone and uh, disparaging members of our community with their full name in front of everyone in public. It, I, that shows a level of respect, and I and the council greatly appreciate that. Um, we have had a lot of that in the past, um, years ago, and um, to see that that, uh, that form of public disparity has changed and is no longer um, uh, acceptable amongst our uh, community, I, I think is a good thing. So thank you to those of you who, who don't do that. I, we really do appreciate it. Okay. Any other follow-up? Uh, the last thing I'll say, Mr. Jones, I'm disappointed. Not really. But you also forgot to mention that every Monday night, we launch the Mayor's Minute, which is a one-minute summary of what's on the meeting agenda. And I will just say, before you explain more about it, because I know you're going to, I just want to mention that Mr. Spencer follows that religiously. He watches every video, as he does most of my social media. So it does get out there and educates people about what we're talking about each night. But Mr. Jones, what would you add? Jonathan Jones, Public Information Office. This started with Council Member Anthony. Mayor Schultz has done a fantastic job. Every Monday we come over and he does the Mayor's Minute. It is a, it's a very well-watched and received minute of what's coming up the following day at council and Brianna Cresa and the public information office does a great job of putting the script together and working with the mayor on that so yes apologies that is an excellent call sir you got it and I know I got at least one follower Mr. Spencer thank you um, all right so that completes public comment and response let's go to the consent calendar the consent calendar can be enacted in one motion uh, Ms. Clark would you please read the consent calendar for this evening Thank and you, Mr. Mayor Scroggs, Schultz. I owe you a call. Thank you, Mayor Schultz. We have 10 items on tonight's consent agenda. Item one is approval of the successor agency minutes of the joint meeting of February 13th, 2024. Item two is approval of the housing authority minutes of the joint meeting of February 13th, 2024. Item three is approval of the parking authority minutes of the joint meeting of February 13th, 2024. Item four is approval of the public financing authority minutes of the joint meeting of September 12, 2023. Item five is approval of the youth endowment services fund board minutes of the joint meeting of February 13, 2024. Item six is adoption of an ordinance amending title two administration and title six motor vehicles and traffic of the Burbank municipal code to transition parking management to the Community Development Director and oversight to the Transportation Commission. Item seven is acceptance of a donation of a new concrete play yard, fenced dog run, donor wall, and renovations to the existing turtle pond, valued at $48,260, from the Leadership Burbank Class of 2024 to be installed at the Burbank Animal Shelter. Item eight is adoption of a resolution approving the establishment of the Salary and Conflict of Interest Code designation for the classification of contracts administrator and adoption of a resolution approving the citywide salary schedule. Item 9 is approval of the updated City of Burbank records retention schedule and adoption of a resolution amending the citywide records retention schedule for city records. And the final item is review of the 2023 Military Equipment Annual Report and renew ordinance 22-3974, approving the military equipment funding acquisition and use policy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Uh, would anyone like to make a motion, comment, question? I'll make a motion to move the consent calendar as it's stated. I'll second. Okay, a motion by Mullen, second by Perez. Any other discussion? Seeing none, let's go to a roll call vote. Council Member Anthony? Uh, yes, on 1 through 9, abstain on 10. Council Member Mullins? Yes. Council Member Takahashi? Yes. Vice Mayor Perez? Yes. 
And Mayor Schultz. Uh, yes to all 10. Uh, item carries 5 Items 1 through 9. Item 10 carries 4 one All right. Now we go to uh, our one and only public hearing this evening. This is the time and place for the public hearing of the Burbank Housing Authority to consider the Public Housing Agency annual plan for fiscal year 2024-2025 and propose amendments to the Housing Authority administrative plan. Uh, before I go on, if you'd like to comment on this item, please fill out a public comment card if you're here in person or if you're going to be calling in, please call in now at 818-238-3335. Reminder that you will be placed in a queue until the public hearing comment period begins. Uh, before we begin, Council, um, I will note that Councilmember Mullins uh, left the room temporarily. Uh, of the remaining Council members, any disclosures? Okay, none for the record. Madam City Clerk, have the notices as required by law been given? Yes, they have. And do we, and I'll show this for the whole community to see, do we have the complete file of exhibits, <laughs> correspondence, emails, and other documents that I read over the course of the last week after putting my kids down to bed every night? You do, indeed. Wonderful. Um, Ms. Clark, has the city received any written communications on this matter? And if so, have they been provided to all city council members? We did not receive any correspondences on this item. Thank you. Uh, will the representative of the Community Development Department please come up, introduce yourself, and summarize the matter for us? Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Vice Mayor, and members of the City Council. My name is Odette Ivazian, Housing Specialist, and I'm before you this evening to present you the fiscal year 2024-2025 annual plan and the required documents for the administration of the Section 8 program. The purpose of this presentation is to give an update on the activities of the Burbank Housing Authority to continue to receive funding for the Section 8 Rental Assistance Program. I'll provide more details later in the presentation. In summary, the goal of the program is to assist the most needy and vulnerable households in the city who, if not for this rent subsidy, would be at risk of becoming homeless. Program participants utilize the Section 8 rent subsidy to lease a unit in the private market and pay only a portion of the contract rent for their household income making the unit affordable to the participant household. The Section 8 program meets the City Council goal of providing affordable housing in the community. I'll discuss Council goals and objectives more in the next slide. At the end of my presentation, I will end with an update on estimated funding and next steps. First, a brief overview of the Housing Authority. The mission of the Burbank Housing Authority is working together for a safe, beautiful, and thriving community. The goals and objectives outlined in these documents continue to meet the requirements of the Section 8 program tailored to the Burbank community within the funding allocation provided each year, including, as noted on this slide, to improve and expand rental opportunities for lower income households. In order to continue to receive Section 8 program funding, the two HUD required documents are the administrative plan, which establishes local policies and procedures for the administering the Section 8 program, and the annual plan for the upcoming fiscal year, which provides a progress report for the annual year of 2020-2025, five-year plan. Each document is explained in more detail in the next couple of slides. HUD requires housing authorities to submit revisions to the administrative plan if necessary. The primary proposed changes this year are EHV, minor changes to policies and procedures, project-based vouchers, addition of new chapter explained in the next few slides, added definition in the glossary for the new project-based voucher chapter. Highlighting this evening, a new tool that is an enhancement to housing choice vouchers. The Burbank Housing Authority is proposing to impl implement project-based vouchers. Project-based vouchers are an additional tool provided by HUD for housing authorities to utilize. This tool allows the housing authority to use a portion of its overall tenant-based voucher funding, allocating them to a specific affordable housing project. 
The purpose of implementing project-based vouchers is to encourage property owners of existing housing, newly constructed housing, or rehabilitated housing to make these properties available to low-income families at an affordable rent. This enhances the city's ability to maintain an affordable rental housing stock that is at risk of becoming unaffordable for low-income families. HUD allows housing authorities to utilize up to 20% of their existing voucher allocation to project-based vouchers and an additional 10% for specialized populations such as homeless families, families with veterans, elderly persons, and supportive housing for persons with disabilities. 20% of the total voucher allocation may be utilized for project-based vouchers and, and approved on a case-by-case -case basis. Tonight's action simply allows this process should the board want to use this enhancement in the future. In the final year of the five-year plan, the Burbank Housing Authority has assisted, as of tonight, 870 extremely low and very low income households. This figure includes 13 veteran affair supportive housing vouchers or VASH vouchers. Staff continues to work with the VA to receive referrals for two available VASH vouchers. Furthermore, the BHA was allocated 67 emergency housing vouchers through the American Rescue Act of 2021. Of the 67 allocated vouchers, all 67 vouchers were issued and 62 have been housed. The remaining five are looking for a unit. The Housing Authority continues to educate landlords and tenants on housing quality standards, and staff also continues to administer the Family Self-Sufficiency Program. The proposed, program, the proposed program documents were presented as required to the Resident Advisory Board made up of current tenants on the program. A public meeting was held on February 14, 2024. The meeting was advertised in the city's website, published in the Los Angeles Times, and 900 postcards were mailed in English, Spanish, and in Armenian. And 900 postcards, excuse me, um, um, my apologies. The resident advisory board did not have any questions, comments, or changes to the document. Staff received one comment during the public review period, which was related to local experience to the selection criteria for project-based vouchers. The Burbank Housing Authority has not yet received the final program budget for housing assistance payments for the upcoming fiscal year. However, notice was given that we can expect an increase. Therefore, staff is budgeting for an estimated total of $11.2 million to administer the program. With this level of funding, it is expected that Burbank will fund all current voucher holders on the program with the opportunity to add more. EHVs receive a separate pool of funds. As funds are available, staff will issue additional vouchers up to the allocation. This requires staff to closely monitor voucher utilization, turnover, and funding, and as, staff, and as funds are available, new applicants will be selected from the waiting list following the processes as outlined in the administrative plan. Staff continues to apply for more vouchers when applications are available from HUD. If approved this evening, the updated administrative plan and annual plan will be submitted to HUD by the deadline of April 17, 2024, to continue to receive federal funding. This concludes staff's presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, before taking questions, we will now open the public hearing to hear from any person who would like to speak on the matter. Each person may address the council for up to three minutes on this public hearing item only. And for members of the public who are here in person, if you haven't already done so, please complete a salmon public hearing card and hand it to Ms. Clark or Ms. Tai if you'd like to speak. For those wishing to call in, if you haven't already done so, please call 818-238-3335. Callers will be placed in the queue until all in-person comments have been received. At this time, we will begin the public comment period with any one-minute comments that have been voluntarily made, followed by the three-minute comments. Ms. Clark, do we have any comment cards? We do not have any in-person. We have one caller in queue. Great. Then we will consider in-person public comment done. We'll move to the callers. Let's send our caller through. The first caller is David Watley. Hi, David. You're on with the council. Good 
evening, Burbank Housing Authority. My name is David Watley, and I am an advocate for veterans, and I'm calling in this evening with regard to the uh, administrative plan, annual plan for the Housing Authority, and I just want to say, if I just wanted to, it was mentioned, you know, VASH vouchers were mentioned, which are, you know, specific vouchers for veterans that provide, you know, income um, or assistance for veterans with their housing. I don't know if there's any way that the Housing Authority of Burbank can take a look more into um, project-based vouchers um, in terms of a pro- an affordable housing project that can really uh, maybe utilize, leverage this funding that is received from the Department of Housing and Urban Development to further assist our veterans. Now, I don't know. I, I'm not sure exactly, you know, what staff has done in terms of, you know, m- most current outreach or whatnot and in, in terms of, uh, you know, this, this um, what I'm speaking on. But I just think that it might be something that the Housing Authority of Burbank might want to look further into. And so basically that's basically my comment for this evening. And also I just wanted to, uh, going back to the previous agenda item, uh, honoring Dolores Cuesta, I just wanted to commend the city of Burbank for um, honoring someone who is truly uh, a civil rights, not only a civil rights icon, but an American icon who has received a Presidential Medal of Freedom Award. And I just, I wanted to commend the city of Burbank for that. So with that, thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you, David. Uh, Ms. Clark, any other callers? That was our last call. Okay. Um, Does the council have any questions of staff? Questions only. We'll get to comment in a minute. Yes, Ms. Mullins. I was wondering um, if they would, if they have an answer to the caller. Yeah. Yeah, And then. Sure. If you'd like to do it separate, that's fine. Uh, Do you have any specific response to the one caller? Yes. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council, Maribel Leland, Housing Authority Manager. Uh, To uh, respect to the caller um, who was inquiring about possibly utilizing project-based vouchers for VASH, um, um, homeless veterans, the proposal this evening is to add a chapter that would authorize that tool, that enhancement, enhancement to utilize that in the future should it be approved. And one of the things that would um, staff would follow is the prescribed process from HUD that would require a request for proposal. So should the City Council Housing Authority Board have a particular um, special needs population that we would like to release a request for proposals for that would be released out to the development community and that would be something that we would then go through the process uh, for uh, review and approval for project possible project-based vouchers so that is the tool this evening that staff is proposing to utilize and include in our administrative plan Thank you for that response. Darn council member, you took the one question I had. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, for, <laughs> for sake of the record, we now declare the public comment period closed. Uh, council, questions, we'll go to comment in a minute, but questions of staff on this item. Council member. Um, by including the project-based vouchers, um, what uh, uh, veterans obviously is one population we can go out for. Are there other qualifying populations that we're allowed to specifically ask for elderly like is there an age limit that kind of stuff like how does that work if we ask for a specific group yes absolutely there there could be very specific it could be for a permanent supportive housing vouchers vash vouchers it could also be for for form, for transitional housing units that maybe were in a, different developments that now could be included as part of a project based voucher program and the real benefit is that in in uh, the communities that we've looked at that do utilize project based vouchers such as the cities of Pasadena Pomona city of LA county of LA then there's um, on site perfor- uh, supportive services for uh, project based voucher so there's really that additional support it could really entail a a wide variety of of opportunities and when when targeting that and focusing the ask the the on-site supportive services are they more effective because they know the kinds of folks that are coming in and that way you're able to utilize resources better 
Absolutely, yes, council member. That is really part of a, of a developer when is responding to a request for proposal, that would be part of what they would have to respond to. What are the supportive services that uh, they would propose to uh, provide with a project-based voucher application? Excellent, okay, thank you. Thank you, council member. Who'd like to go next with questions? Council member Takahashi. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation, very well done. And since the chapter on the project-based based vouchers is the new chapter for uh, in, in the document, that's where going to be my questions are going to be around. Um, and um, so my, my first question is that you know, Section Eight and, and Burbank Housing Authority has been around for a while. So, what instigated including project-based vouchers now and not previously? And what's what's the what's the reason for including them today? Thank you for the question. Um, the Section 8 housing voucher program um, allows participants to reside anywhere in the city. It's a tenant-based voucher. And so by being able to reside anywhere in the city, there's no concentration of a specific population um, in a certain area in the city. So PBVs is a tool that housing authorities can choose to utilize for um, a specific property. And so this is a policy change, and based on um, past priorities and policies, the rental market in the years past, PPVs were not considered at that time. And so um, with increased housing costs, rents, um, this tool could help uh, facilitate uh, the creation of units um, with deeper subsidies for extremely low um, households, families. Great. Thank you for that. Um, and you would mentioned that other cities have project-based vouchers, what's the success rate and their, and their use of those in those cities? Um, yes, there are other cities, as um, Maribel Leland um, just mentioned, City of Pasadena, Pomona, LA City, LA County, um, and b based on what they have shared with us, it is very successful. Great, that's great to hear. Um, so if a property owner is considering it to potentially apply for a project-based voucher for their units, what would be the benefit for them to apply for one of these vouchers? Um, the benefit to the owner is that the, the owner is, they receive a guaranteed housing authority payment from the housing authority, so the, which pays a portion of the total contract rent for that unit. So it's a guaranteed check that they receive versus not having a guaranteed check coming in every month. Right, and to that point, how would a landlord's experience be different with a project-based voucher versus a tenant that has a regular tenant-based voucher? It's pretty much the same. It's pretty much the same. The only difference is, um, which really isn't related more uh, to the landlord, it's more for the tenant. So um, yeah, there are some rules and regs that would change pertaining to when the tenant can move, so on and so forth. Okay, great. And uh, let's see. Um, can a, can a uh, property owner who, who would be applying for these uh, vouchers, can they determine how many units in their, on their property to apply for? No, the, the, um, the allocation, it, the, the PBVs are based on the allocation of the housing authority's um, voucher allocation and the percentage that we are allowed, which is 20% plus 10%. Um, so therefore, it's not up to the landlord, it's up to the housing authority. Okay, so the landlord would apply for a certain number of units and then the housing authority would determine whether that, to, to grant the full number of units or less or? The housing authority would put out an, RF, um, an RFP outlining the objectives and then um, interested landlords would then apply to that RFP. Okay, and let's see. Um, and then how long does the project-based voucher last for that unit? Uh, it's a contract between the housing authority and the landlord, and it's for 20 years um, with um, an additional um, extension for another 20 years. Okay. So what would happen if somebody moves during that time, if somebody moves in or out? Does it, does it, it can stay a consistent price for whether there's one tenant or multiple tenants moving in and out, or does, is there an impact? Are you referring, my apologies, are you referring to the tenant or the project as a whole? Right, so the landlord who is has a voucher for their unit and their tenant moves in or out of the unit, does it affect the voucher at all? Or does um, it stay consistent with depending on who lives there? 
Yes, so, so, so the way that um, the Housing Authority would determine the contract rent is all going to be based on um, the household's income. Okay. And so that's, that, that would be um, conducted um, with the caseworker and they would inform the, the tenant as well as the landlord of what the portion of rent is. So when and if a tenant does decide to move from within the project from one unit to the other, yes, mm -hmm. that amount will change. Okay. And then what happens after 20 years if they don't renew the voucher? Does it just go back to market rate? Does, it, does the landlord just take a full rent in? What happens after that? That ends. I'm happy to chime in on, on that question, question, Council Member. That would be something that we would look at, housing staff would look at well in advance of a, of a contract ending. Um, the, the recommendation I can just tell you from the staff perspective this evening is to extend for another 20 years, if at all okay. possible. As far as we're aware, HUD does not have a deadline or a limit as to how long you can extend. So my guess is that um, housing developers or, or property owners who want to maintain their affordable units will, will opt to extend that. That, that, that contract. Um, however, that said, if that is certainly the case, then we would work with HUD, work with the property owner to see what other way or mechanism um, we could, uh, we could do, use, utilize in order to maintain some affordability. We have that circumstance with some of our affordable units that um, do have affordability covenants that maybe mm -hmm. are expiring through a former rehabilitation loan program, for example. So we have those opportunities now to work with landlords and finding new units in some cases for existing households in those restricted unit, uh, rented units. Great. Thank you. A couple more questions, Mr. Mayor. Um, the units that are uh, that have the project-based vouchers applied to them, do they fall under uh, the um, ordinate the AB 1482 requirements for rent increase and whatnot? Mm -hmm. uh, Typically, the Section 8 program uh, does fall under uh, the, uh, the AB 1482 rent cap. Um, in the project-based voucher project, in a, in a proposed project, should this be approved um, by the Housing Authority Board this evening, it would really depend on a, a several different parameters, whether or not the whole development is affordable and if there's an affordability covenant on the whole property, because as um, the council may be aware, there is an exemption for affordability covenants on properties that okay. The, the AB 1482 doesn't apply. However, the specific project-based voucher units, which is Section 8, would apply. So it would we would really look at that closely to see what um, parameters okay. and what rent increases would apply to the specific units. Okay, and you would work with the landlord to help Absolutely. them understand that. Yeah, Absolutely. and, and if I could that. chime in, just generally speaking, mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of times the covenant restricted units, um, they're more restrictive because they're tied to the affordable rents and um, which is a factor of the area median rent and whatever percentage group, what, whatever the contracted affordability level is. So okay. um, it's not going to be able to move 5% plus up to 5% with CPI as under 1482. It's going to be limited to uh, affordable rents as defined by um, whichever law they're contracted. Got it. Okay. Okay. And my last question is, uh, since this is a 20-year contract, what happens if the property is sold or transfers ownership um, while this, the voucher is in effect? Um, thank you for the question. As there is a 20-year contract um, uh, for, the pro for the project, um, should a sale be initiated, the Housing Authority would need to reach out to HUD and request for further guidance. Okay. Great. Those are my questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good questions. Thank you, Council Member. Um, Council Member Mullins, anything? Thank you. All right. So I want to. I have questions regarding the um, the project-based vouchers. So on page four of the PowerPoint presentation, I think it's slide number seven. So there is. Which you, what you're basically asking council is that you have um, housing can authorize 20% of existing voucher allocation to project base, but we can also do an additional 10%, Correct. which um, I did a quick calculation. It will be about 308 vouchers if we go to the full 30% um, to allocate for project base. So my question is, how is that going to impact 
uh, the rest of the 718 voucher? Would it impact the current uh, existing or maybe future individuals who have a need and they want to apply? If we take away those 308 vouchers from them to allocate to project base? I'm happy to start. Thank you for the for the question with the answer. So a staff's recommendation is is to uh, project based uh, 20 percent of our current allocation. So that figure would come down a little bit lower. Uh, Ms. Ivazian mentioned in her presentation that we do have um, currently about 870 participants on the Section 8 program. So we certainly staff does not recommend or, or would like to impact or would impact it, um, that percentage, we don't want it to impact our existing participants. So therefore, um, it's we would be suggesting a 20% um, of project basing for our current allocation, then that would give us the ability to look at funding, um, develop with the Housing Authority Board's recommendation on RFPs, what kind of uh, units we are looking for, what kind of projects we are looking for. So that's how we would approach that. And then based on an RFP and a selection of a project, uh, then we would make sure that the funding was available and again, wouldn't be any impact to existing participants. Okay, thank you. Because um, doing the calculation, it would be below the 866 that you currently, they're eligible right now. So I know you're striving on um, having 1,027 vouchers. This is for the 24 uh, 25 fiscal year, or this is for the new contract moving forward? The, the um, actual uh, project basing would not be into an effect until July 1st. This is for the upcoming year, okay. and we would submit this into um, HUD for their records, and then it'll still take some time for staff to go through the RFP process um, present to the Housing Authority Board a, a potential project. So it would be moving forward. So we would be looking, as, as Ms. Ivazian mentioned, that utilization of funding, what really is available in order to determine um, a, a, a potential project. Okay, thank you. Um, I do want to ask a question regarding um, a discussion that took place at this um, council, uh, not the current council, but the former council, and I, I recall former Mayor Springer had mentioned uh, last time this report came before them that the city of LA had additional, I want to say 800 vouchers, if I remember the exact conversation, that were actually returned back because they did not use them. And I recall at the time that she had asked if why can't the city of Burbank go after these vouchers. And so I'm going to maybe repeat the question again two years later uh, and ask if cities do have additional vouchers and instead of returning those vouchers, we can definitely make use of them if they're available for us and if we can, have to, we can actually get them. So I want to hear back, has anything been looked into this or can we look into it? Can I start? Yeah, please. <laughs> so the un unused vouchers, um, those unused vouchers are not Section 8 vouchers. Those vouchers that the discussion um, pertain to um, are called special purpose vouchers, like the emergency housing vouchers. Mm -hmm. And those vouchers, if you don't use them, we say, Housing Authority says, excuse me, HUD says, if you don't use them, you lose them, right? So they, they take them back. And so with, um, as an example, the emergency housing vouchers, Burbank Housing Authority was allocated 67 vouchers of which we issued all of those vouchers. So no vouchers um, were taken back from HUD. So um, I hope that answers your, your question pertaining to the special purpose vouchers. I, I would add, if I may, um, Council Member, when there is a, a notice of funding availability by HUD for uh, VASH vouchers, as an example, that is one application that staff did apply for, and we did receive 15 vouchers. Um, also, we did receive uh, permanent supportive housing vouchers a few years back. All 20 were re requested were received and are utilized. So as those funding opportunities do are released, and if we see anything with um, recaptured vouchers from other communities that is available, that is something staff continues to look at and apply to. Thank you, and at this point, that's when you start reaching out to the individuals who are on the list that to see if they can uh, use the vouchers that you were able to obtain in addition to what we have. 
Correct, and it would also depend on what, what the process is and, and how it would give us the guidelines as to how we would proceed in reaching out to the, the prospective voucher recipients. Okay, thank you. Of course. Great, thank you, Council Member. Uh, Vice Mayor, any questions? Honestly, no, <laughs> I know the system pretty well. Um, but I just thank you for, for going to this. We always talk about proactive, not reactive, and this is these, um, I appreciate Councilmember Takahashi's questions because it really gives a sense of what we're looking at in the future with these project-based vouchers and um, how the issue is not necessarily the voucher, but the money. So thank you for, for the work you're both doing. Thank you, colleagues. Um, the only question I had, could you remind me, I believe we had uh, four uh, resident advisory board members attend the hearing. Um, was there any substantive feedback that's noteworthy for the council from those four members? No. Okay. I, I read the report. I didn't see it. I just wanted to make, make sure. I'm assuming they just showed up. Thumbs up. Correct. Got it. Okay. All right. Any other questions? No questions. I now declare the public hearing closed and the council will now deliberate. What is the council's pleasure? Councilmember Mullins, you look like you're going for the mic. I was reaching for that mic. That's why I'm calling you. I know. You see me. Um, well, I think it's, it's really important to... Uh, I like staff's recommendation with the... Uh, the project-based vouchers mm -hmm. to focus specifically on um, a targeted community such as the caller, the veterans, for example. Um, I do have kind of a question, and it's really not too long. Is, is the 20 percent, does it have to all be allocated to a specific group, like we can allocate it to all veterans, or can we break it 10 percent, 10 percent to another group? The, the 20 percent um, is the of the total allocation, and we, uh, the Housing Authority Board, can can decide on the parameters of any request for proposal. Um, so I'm I'm really open to hearing my colleagues. I think 20% is a good number and a start for staff's recommendation. Uh, veterans is a group that we definitely I'm in support of focusing on, and I maybe my colleagues can see. If what other groups, I know there there's so many groups out there in need, a lot of individuals, maybe individuals who are um, in need of housing or losing their homes, that this is another population that we can definitely look at allocating percentage to them as well. So this is just what I recommend to move forward with the 20%. Oh, yeah, if I could, I believe training. staff said, this is just the enabling language that allows us to take vouchers, which are usually given to individuals, and setting some aside for a project, but we don't actually have a project. And so we may not get a veterans project. As the council knows, we actually have a veterans housing that we, as we helped BHC. We have 11 units. Um, there may not be, uh, when we have units available up to 20 percent maybe it's only 10 percent initially it depends on who comes and makes a request so we wouldn't recommend you earmark them because we don't know if someone qualifying for those criteria whether they're going to actually submit a proposal and we'd hate to have them limited and not available to whoever came forward staff can clarify if i have that wrong but i no, thank you, um, um, Mr. McDowell. That is absolutely correct. The, the, the recommendation is for um, the ability to project base 20% of our total allocation. Simply that would be the action. In the future, there could be different projects that come before the Housing Authority Board for consideration. And one of them you may be familiar with, our, our, our housing partner, the Burbank Housing Corporation. They do have a, a development that they're going through the development re review process with. Um, they have been working with planning staff, so that's one proposal. It, it wouldn't utilize, and it, 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 the proposal isn't to utilize the 200 of the allocation. It'd just be for a portion, and then there would be another opportunity for another um, group or another project, depending on the, the goals of, that we're seeking, whether it's transitional housing units or veterans. So it would really depend on uh, the different projects. Great. Thank you for that clarification, and I think that gives you more flexibility based on who's applying. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Anthony. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, 
So I'm in, I'm in favor of uh, staff's recommendation um, for, for one major reason. Um, I used to uh, manage a building that had uh, Section 8 folks in it. Um, when you have Section 8 residents, once they're already there, you realize they're just members of the community and they're arguably some of the best tenants you can find. The problem is the stigma of new housing developments and their ideas of who Section 8 people are or could be. Um, and it's usually folks who've never had a Section 8 tenant. Um, and that's unfortunate. But the bias is there and the bias is real. However, by using project-based specific asks for certain populations, it allows folks to get away from their unknowable bias and petition for a specific group. Um, veterans, senior citizens, uh, people with disabilities, uh, folks um, coming out of incarceration, folks dealing with, you know, uh, any number of populations that a p potential developer feels comfortable with and can actually get on board with and think about the specific folks who they would be uh, providing housing for. And until that bias in our society goes away with Section 8, um, I think using project-based um, allocation of these vouchers, because like we said, we've turned some back in because we couldn't get them used, allowing folks to come in and look at our specific requests and offer even uh, a specific population and a certain number, um, I think is going to help us uh, meet the needs of folks and allow for um, more, more usage of these vouchers in the future. So I, I'm going to be in favor of this. I think our city attorney wants to weigh in. Just, just one clarification. Staff, staff stated on the record, we have not returned any vouchers. Oh. Sorry, yes. The, yes, sorry. Correct. All right, thank you for the correction. Any other deliberate, um, yes, council member. Sure, just briefly, uh, I agree with what council member Anthony and council member Mullen said. I think this is a smart addition to the housing authority's uh, annual plan and to add to your toolbox. I think it makes sense. I like the idea of having some of the vouchers stay with the unit versus following the individual. I think that's, that's smart to have that as a possibility and also as an opportunity for new developments to be able to bring it in automatically rather than hunting down someone who might have a Section 8 voucher or vice versa. Um, and I'm really looking forward to see how this ends up being implemented in our community. And um, I'm sure like later after it's been implemented for a bit, we'll get a report back and finding out how we can really make best use of the vouchers to create stability and certainty for all parties involved. So I think it's smart. I'm really glad that we added it. Um, so thank you to staff for doing that, for all the hard work for adding it. And I'm certainly in favor of the staff recommendations. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor, anything? Sure, um, I, I will just add, um, in addition to what my colleagues have all said, these project-based vouchers also give us the opportunity when we go to that RFP to get folks who are interested in these specific categories and add to the housing stock. Um, it helps us attract folks who are probably interested in building this housing but don't know we're interested in it as well. So it's, it's a win-win for all of us. Um, thank you for putting it together and Let's go do this. Oh, and the only thing I will mention is, um, if my colleagues agree, I, I am looking forward to seeing this, and I'm sure you're already thinking about it, in next year's report as a category. I would love the chart for, for how we did, how it's being implemented, and what's next. Great. Thank you all. Before we uh, entertain a motion, I did think of one question for staff. Now, these project-based vouchers, I, I don't want to go too far afoul and talk about something that's not on our agenda, but in the abstract, in theory, where there have been conversations about the Civic Center project and whether there would be an opportunity to use city-owned property for housing development. In theory, is that something that could take advantage of these kinds of vouchers? Yes, that is certainly, an, in theory, an, an opportunity to utilize project-based vouchers for, for a housing development such as that one. Wonderful. Okay. That, well, I think that that's just food for thought for another day, uh, but certainly would want not want to see these vouchers go to waste and 
maybe that's one possibility of what we'll see in a few years. I also want to thank you for the comprehensive staff report. That made for some very nice uh, going to bed material. A couple pages in, put me to sleep every time. I'm kidding. Well done. I appreciate the red line version too. That's a lot easier to keep track of all the proposed changes. Um, all right, with that, does anyone have a motion they'd like to make? Not all at once now. Oh. All right. I can, sure. do it. I can make oh, the motion. All right. all right, let's see who gets to it first. <clears throat> I'll do it. Go um, for I'll it. move um, that the council adopt a resolution of the Housing Authority of the City of Burbank approving, one, the Public Housing Agency Annual Plan for fiscal year 2024-2025, two, updates to the Section 8 Administrative <laughs> Plan, and three, authorizing the Executive Director to execute the certifications required by the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. Second. Okay, motion by Anthony, second by Perez. Any other discussion? Nope, let's do a roll call vote. Councilmember Anthony? Yes. Councilmember Mullins? Yes. Councilmember Tagahashi? Yes. Vice Mayor Perez? Yes. And Mayor Schultz? Yes, motion passes. Thank you. Good work, everybody. All right, uh, Ms. Leland, I guess you'll take a seat for a little while. We'll see you back soon, right? <laughs> okay. We have six reports to council this evening. After staff's presentation uh, for each report, city council will proceed with in-person public comment only. So for those items, please fill out a yellow public comment card, hand it to the city clerk, and you will have uh, three minutes to speak on the item at the conclusion of each presentation, um, as long as you've not spoken regarding that item in one of the prior public comment periods this evening. Now the first report to council tonight is approval of the 2024 City of Burbank Investment policy. Ms. Crystal Palmer, elected city treasurer, is here to present the report this evening. Ms. Palmer, floor is yours. Good evening, Mayor Schultz, Vice Mayor Perez, Council Member Takahashi, Council Member Mullins, Council Member Anthony, and my fellow Burbank residents. My name is Crystal Palmer, and I'm your city treasurer. Tonight, I'm here to present a proposed 2024 investment policy. This policy has been reviewed by the two oversight committees, the Internal Fiscal and Treasurer's Review Group and the External Treasurer's Oversight Review Committee. On the Fiscal and Treasurer's Review Group, we have Council Member Anthony, Council Member Mullins, City Manager Justin Hess, Assistant City Manager Courtney Patchett, Financial Services Director Jennifer Becker, and CFO of BWP Joe Lilio. On the Treasurer's Oversight Review Committee, we have Darren Guggenheimer, CEO of Gain Federal Credit Union, Norlin Karras, former CEO of Cedar Sinai Federal Credit Union, Richard Martin, CPA, and Scott Reif, retired Senior Vice President of Boston Private Bank and Trust. So aside from the date, name, and other minor edits, there are only four proposed changes to the policy worth noting tonight. First, under non-negotiable certificates of deposit, we added language to clarify that under Section 53653 of the California State Code, treasurers may waive collateralization requirements for that portion of deposits insured pursuant to federal law, such as the FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and NCUA, the National Credit Union Administration Insurance. So this has always been allowed under state code, but we wanted to make sure that this is clear under our own investment policy. What this would allow us to do is invest in our local banks and credit unions certificates of deposits. So this was brought about because a local bank reached out to me and, see, and asked if we could invest um, in a CD that they offered. It paid um, much higher than treasuries, but the problem was they do not collateralize, even though that CD was 100% fully insured. So what this language would allow us to do is invest in our local banks and credit unions. Um, these investments would still be 100% insured because they would be under 250000 and that money would stay in our community. It would help our local businesses and our local residents. So the second change to the investment policy is under the money market uh, mutual funds. So we added language from the state code to clarify that exchange-traded funds, or ETFs, are not a permissible investment for local agencies. So while the, the reason for this is while similar to mutual funds, ETFs are a lot more volatile because their price changes throughout the day. Um, there is also a lot higher interest rate risk and market risk. So we think this makes a lot of sense for our own protection. 
Third, under liquidity, um, the calculation was updated to reflect the numbers from our 2023 to 2024 budget. The necessary liquidity for 24 calculated at 124 million increased from 115 million in 2023. And finally, under the list of qualified brokers from which, from which the city may purchase investments, um, there are two changes. So one of our current brokers, uh, Susan Munson, recently changed firms, uh, switching from Cantor Fitzgerald to Academy Securities. With this move, uh, she completed an updated broker-dealer questionnaire and submitted her new firm's financial statements, which were, which were reviewed by the city treasurer's office. We recommended the city retain Ms. Munson's services. She has a lot of industry experience, um, over 30 plus years, and she is also active in the California investment community. What we also like is that her new firm, Academy Securities, is veteran owned and operating, operated. Um, so their social mission is to help recruit and train military veterans so that they can transition into meaningful careers in finance after their service. I personally uh, met some of these brokers, um, her colleagues, and um, it's a really great program for them. So the other change is one of our current brokers, John Doak from UBS, has changed his area of focus and is now only serving wealth management clients. Uh, he recommended his colleague, uh, Chris Pochino, take over his coverage for the city of Burbank. We performed due diligence on him and he completed an updated broker-dealer questionnaire as well and he also submitted his firm's financial statements. Um, because of this, we reviewed his documents and we recommended we approve his application. So in conclusion, the 2024 uh, investment policy as proposed uh, is in compliant with the current state code uh, within, uh, as governed by California. Uh, these are all the changes I have and I uh, look forward to any question input you may have. Thank you very much, Ms. Palmer. Don't go far. Uh, Ms. Clark, do we have any public comment? We do not. Okay, I'm glad you didn't go far. Any questions from the council? Or comments? Or motions? Please, yeah, go for it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a couple comments. Um, but just generally, thank you for always your well-presented um, uh, reports um, to make sometimes complicated investment strategy very, very um, um, digestible. I appreciate your inserting the... Um, the new section of the non-negotiable certificates of pot deposit to be able to keep our investments in our community. Um, that that extra step is it's small, but I think it's very it's very appreciated to to do that for us. And then I really like uh, how you mentioned that um, the Academy Securities is veteran owned. And these little details, I mean, there's so much going on with our city's investments and and all the money. And for you to take the time to look at these little details to make it really um, reflect the values of our community. I just want to commend you for that. So, and thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Any other questions or comments? Um, Ms. Palmer, just one. Um, we don't need to throw it on screen necessarily, but slide number three, um, it says under section 53653 of the California government code, Treasurers, such as yourself, may waive collateralization requirements. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously, it's, it, if approved, this will be a discretionary call that your office gets to make. What would be the factors you would consider in deciding whether to go with someone and waive that requirement? Um, so under our mandate of safety, um, liquidity, and yield, uh, first is safety, right? So if we feel that our investment is not safe um, because of one reason or another, then um, we would not proceed with uh, waiving the collateralization. So, for example, um, in this instance, I would only invest in CDs that are 100% insured. Uh, I know there are counties, um, one is up in the Bay Area, and they actually invest in CDs in local banks that are way above the 250000 um, insurance cap. Um, they do that uh, to help their community. Again, that is a judgment call. But again, our mandate is safety foremost, and so I personally would not go beyond the um, insured uh, maximum. Okay. Thank you very much. Classy move, not naming the county. <laughs> <laughs> any, uh, well, it was true. Uh, any other questions, comments, or would someone like to make a motion? I move forward to make a motion to approve the 2024 investment policy as proposed. Second. Great motion by Mullen, second by Anthony. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, let's do a roll call vote. Councilmember Anthony? Yes. Councilmember Mullins? Yes. 
Council Member Tagahashi? Yes. Vice Mayor Perez? Yes. And Mayor Schultz? Yes. Motion carries. Great work, Ms. Palmer. Thank you. So again, don't, don't go too far now because <laughs> our second report to Council this evening is receipt and review of the City Treasurer's Investment Portfolio Report for quarter four of 2023. So that's the date ending December 31, 2023. Um, uh, City Treasurer, Ms. Palmer, uh, will be presenting again whenever you're ready. So now I'll be going over the Treasurer's Report for December 2023. Like the investment policy, this was also discussed by both the Treasurer's Oversight Review Committee and the Fiscal and Treasurer's Review Group. The city's portfolio currently stands at $581 million. Um, this chart shows how much it's grown just in the past couple of years. For example, in December 2021, it was at $481 million. Um, this chart also highlights the CalPERS payment we make every July, which saves us a uh, million dollars um, because of that prepayment. Uh, this pie chart shows how our portfolio is allocated to the different asset classes. So our biggest chunk is U.S. agencies at 35 percent, corporate medium term notes at 17 percent, a joint powers authority pool 13 percent, municipal bonds at 11 percent, CDs at 10 percent, money market fund at 6 percent, treasuries and supranationals both at 4 percent. Uh, this table shows how we are in compliance with the California State Code and our own investment policy. The average duration of the portfolio is about 1.98 years, which is the average uh, uh, given that the maximum investment we can make is at five years. Uh, we, as we can see in the chart, we still have a lot of liquidity with our money market fund and uh, camp balances. At the same time, though, we are starting to uh, extend duration by investing in those four to five year uh, investments just so we can lock in rates for future income. Our yield in December was 3.32%. This is in line with other cities. Uh, for example, uh, our neighboring city came in at 2.92%. So the yield curve is still inverted. And as I mentioned, we continue to invest in these higher yielding liquid securities while at the same time starting to lock in those uh, five-year uh, yields. This shows our income summary from the coupons we receive. Again, this has increased significantly just in the past uh, several months, and we received $1.5 million just in December 2023. Under the ESG provision we approved a few years ago, I just wanted to highlight one investment uh, we made recently in Inter-American Development Bank. Um, the city of Burbank invested in a five-year non-callable bond, which yielded 4.43%. Uh, founded in 1959, IADB is headquartered in Washington, D.C., and it serves as the main source of multilateral financing for economic, social, and institutional development in Latin America and the Caribbean. It has 48 member countries and 26 borrowing member countries. What we like is how diverse their projects are. So, for example, their projects include the Amazon Initiative, which promotes the bioeconomy, con conservation, sustainable farming and infrastructure, and the well-being of indigenous communities in Ecuador. They help raise funds for conservation work in marine areas in Barbados. They help improve maternal, neonatal, and children's health care in Guyana. And they also help improve preschool and primary education in Guatemala. So it's a wide variety of projects, and it's things that if we can help with with our bonds, then um, it's definitely worth doing. So going over the economic conditions, uh, labor market. So from when I last presented in September, the unemployment rate is still the same at 3.8%. Uh, one thing we're continuing to see is the improvement in the labor force participation rate. However, we are still seeing a shortfall of about 2 million workers. So why is that? The reason is a, a recent study showed that we're still missing a key demographic. Um, it's those who've retired uh, early, those primarily workers age 55 and older without a college degree. Um, it started in a pandemic and it never really recovered. In fact, it even declined further. 
So there's a couple of reasons for that. One is a lot of them are frontline workers who are not usually able to work remotely. And um, one other thing is this same study showed that this phenomenon is primarily concentrated among white individuals who in general have higher wealth saved or for retirement. So, the re so that because of that, they can retire early. Um, so why does this matter? Um, because of this, the labor market is stronger than it, what it could have been because we're missing these two million workers. Um, this helps offset all the layoffs we're starting to see, um, not just here in Burbank, but all over the country. So with relatively low unemployment and continued wage growth, you would expect that Americans should be able to have a higher um, savings percentage in the past few years. Looking as, at this chart, however, this shows that the savings rate for advanced, which shows the advance of a savings rate for advanced economies around the world. While all savings rates have fallen since COVID, the US actually saw its savings rate dip below pre-pandemic levels. Of course, inflation is a big factor. However, economists are also seeing a fundamental shift in how people in the US save and spend money. Similar to how the Great Depression made a whole generation more frugal, um, if you remember how your grandparents always you know, saved uh, plastic wraps and Tupperwares and all those things, it seems that COVID has left a legacy of encouraging people to live life to the fullest in pursuit of spending for experiences. Um, so people are maximizing life now, um, spending a lot on international travel, live entertainment, both of which are up 30% last year, 5x the rate of overall spending growth. And economists are saying that unless there are widespread job losses with a recession, this YOLO, you only live once trend, should continue and potentially trigger ongoing inflation, especially in certain service sectors. The good news is, even with all this experiential spending, based on more recent patterns, how households still have excess savings equal to about 4% of US GDP. So we saw last year that lower and middle income households have been the, benefic been the big beneficiaries of strong wage growth. Uh, while wages for higher income households have actually been stagnant. We actually are continuing to see this trend. More recently, for example, we know that California mandated a $20 per hour minimum wage for fast food workers. Although this law is primarily just for fast food workers, one thing to keep in mind is that this affects other entry level industries that recruit from the same pool of workers. So as a result, it is expected that other lower wage workers should also see the benefits, right? So if now you're working in trucking and you're only making $15 an hour, you can tell your employer, hey, I'm just going to work in McDonald's and earn $20 an hour, so you just pay me $20 an hour. So this should have um, wider repercussions beyond the fast food industry. So because lower income households also have a marginal, higher marginal propensity to consume, uh, strong wage growth that they're seeing should also result in higher spending, uh, which we continue to see. So what's interesting about this economy is that people in general view their own financial position as very good or excellent, even as they also say at the same time that the economy is worse than before. This makes sense, right? A lot of people increase their disposable income either from switching jobs, uh, receiving salary increases, or benefiting from you know, cancellations or reprieve under personal loans. However, I think what's frustrating for people is that even as their disposable incomes have finally increased after years of stagnation, prices have also increased a lot, especially for food, which people purchase on a regular basis. It's really frustrating, especially if you're um, household that did not see a lot of that growth. Because as we know, a lot of that growth was really for your lower to maybe lower to middle income households, right? So if you're in the middle, middle class, maybe upper middle class, you didn't see this huge wage growth. And, um, it, and at the same time, you're still seeing all the price increases. So when the pandemic happened and we saw price hikes, 
people were relatively okay with that, right? Because we viewed it, viewed it as temporary. We knew there were supply chain issues and we were all, honestly, we were all just grateful at that point to be able to get our hands on toilet paper. However, it's been four years now since the pandemic started and prices have not gone back down. In fact, it seems like prices continue to increase. So we look in that chart on the left. Bleach uh, compared to 2020 is 75% more. Deodorant, 60% more. Baby wipes, 56% more. Paper towels, 43% more. It's, it's almost like they don't want us to clean. Um, <laughs> and it's only been four years, so we still remember how much things cost, right? We're, we're not like, we know we're being reasonable. We're not like our grandparents remembering when burgers used to cost 10 cents 50 years ago. We know burgers used to be just $12 five years ago. So why are they $20 now? So car insurance is another big thing. It continues to increase. The average full coverage premium is now $2,500 in California. The good news is it's still not as bad as Florida at 4,800. So uh, one thing to keep in mind, in case you're thinking of moving to Florida. So the housing market, there's still not enough supply in the housing market. We've discussed this a lot, but, and we usually talk about how much we can build, how we can build more housing. But one thing we don't hear about as much is how much longer people are now staying in their homes. In 2005, for example, people usually stayed in their homes for about 6.5 years. Nowadays, people are staying an average of 11.9 years. In California, with Prop 13, it's even longer. People stay in LA, for example, for an average of 18.7 years. So the problem there here is that we, it's almost like musical chairs, right? We wanna add more chairs so that we can all have housing. But there are people who are just staying put. They're not playing the game. So there are chairs that are never going to be vacant or it'll take longer for it to be vacant. Um, because people are not as moving as much too, we are seeing a mismatch in homes and the sizes of families in these homes. Um, empty nesters, for example, own 28% of large homes, while millennials with kids only own 14% of these homes with three bedrooms and up. And it makes a lot of sense that people are choosing to stay put, right? So for a lot of baby boomers, for example, their homes have already been paid off. A lot of people were also able to lock in those lower mortgage rates a few years ago. So here in California, even if your home is now worth a million dollars, but you've locked in your property taxes at $2,000 a year versus the $10,000 or $15,000 that new buyers are paying, it makes a lot of sense. There is really no incentive to sell or downsize. So more and more people now think a soft landing is likely and most polled economists believe a recession, if it does happen, will not start until 2026. We see this optimism in asset prices with S&P and even Bitcoin at all time highs. So with a strong labor market and continued inflation, five year treasury yields have remained elevated as it, as, it, as it is uncertain now when projected rate cuts will actually happen. The Federal Reserve is projecting three rate cuts this year, but it has also re reiterated that it needs more proof of slowing inflation before cutting rates. Inflation has come in slightly higher than expected in the past few months. And the most recent job report last Friday showed that the U.S. added over 300,000 jobs just in March, much higher than the 200,000 forecasted. As a result, the market has now revised its expectations and is thinking that, that the Fed will really just cut rates maybe twice this year. So despite this better than expected economy, there are of course wild cards that could change our current course. One of these is the ongoing fiscal deficit with the US government. While we are fortunate that we do not have a deficit in Burbank, nor are we projecting one, this is not the case for our country. Without major reforms to spending programs such as Social Security and Medicare, the debt to GDP ratio is projected to jump up significantly in the next few decades. 
With increased spending, annual issuance of treasuries has doubled since the pandemic. Right now, it may not be a big deal because the U.S. is considered a safe haven and we have strong, we're seeing a strong demand for our treasuries from both domestic and foreign investors. In the future, though, if demand weakens, rates may have to increase to attract investors. So overall global growth is expected to remain flat at around 3.1 to 3.2% in the next few years. Here in the US though, we expect to see a slight slowdown to 2.1% this year and 1.7% next year. In general, while the likelihood of a recession has receded, central banks around the world are still continuing to fight inflation, and there's still a lot of uncertainty from the wars in Ukraine and Israel, especially as they impact both commodity and energy prices. So as always, our strategy is based on our mandate of safety, liquidity, and yield in that order. Safety or principle is our foremost objective, and we continue to closely monitor our holdings while performing comprehensive due diligence on all new investments. With liquidity as our secondary objective, we also continue to maintain adequate cash levels and meet both to meet both anticipated and unexpected cash flow needs. Finally, our third principle is yield. Markets continue to fluctuate, and this volatility has really allowed us to take advantage of uh, by allocating investments opportunistically when rates rise or to specific asset classes when spreads widen. While short-term rates remain high because of the inverted yield curve, we continue to ladder our portfolio strategically investing in longer-term instruments so that we can lock in yields for future income. Uh, this concludes my presentation, and I believe this is a note and file, but I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Palmer. Uh, this time I will ask you to not go too far. We do have one public comment card. Uh, Mr. Donahue, if you'd like to come up, you have three minutes uh, once you begin, and then we'll, we'll get back to you, Ms. Palmer. Mayor Schultz, Vice Mayor Perez, Council Members, talented staff. My name is David Donahue, and I am a homeowner and resident. I did not plan on speaking to the Treasurer's report, but it is a wonderful opportunity to call to everyone's attention some of the issues that I've been speaking to this dais about numerous times, the cost of living. One of my favorite topics is the Burbank Water and Powers Integrated Resource Plan, or IRP. The city treasurer just mentioned things about the cost of items, baby wipes, toilet paper, bleach. If you look at the cost of energy, you look at the cost of gasoline, you look at the cost of wages, and everything's are going up exponentially. They compound. They compound in ways that the average person is very difficult to see. But when the well-meaning, well-intended, and I'm sure good-hearted Burbank Tenants Union complain that the landlords are raising their rates too high, you just saw why. Mr. Bax, in as an elegant way that he can, as an engineer, provides very, very succinct details. But for me, sometimes it's hard to get, I get lost in that. This is a, a presentation that I believe is very relevant today. You all are our elected leaders. Some have and are running for higher office. I ask you to keep in mind your power of your position, the perspectives that you all will hold as you look at these metrics. You remove control out of the free market. You are now driving these things up in ways that are almost impossible to control. The one thing I want to kind of call, and then I'll, I'll sit down, call out, is the particular item in the report that people are not moving. Ask any homeowner in Burbank who has lived in their home more than a couple of years, why would they want to move? They probably refinance, like my wife and I, and have a below 3% interest rate on our house. I am an affiliate member of the Burbank Association of Realtors, and their problem is for their clients who want to sell and move, how do they find something of comparable value when the interest rates are almost triple what they were? There are, so it's, you cannot sell for something and get a like product, particularly in California. You may in another state. 
It is a very detailed report that the city treasurers gave. I would just share my perspective that I think that there are components missing and that there's a much larger sort of state, national, and global issues at play that affect all of these things. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your comment. That's the only comment card that I have. Uh, so that will complete public comment on this report. Um, before we go to questions, uh, Ms. Palmer, do you have any response to the public comment? Um, no, not specifically, but uh, thank you, Mr. Donahue, for your public comment. I think this is the first time I've gotten public comment on my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Not due to a lack of interest, I assure you. I think most of us are just sitting there like, minds blown, like, okay, wow. Anyway, that's great. Um, I have a couple comments and questions, but I want to go last. Anybody else have a question? Com yeah, council member. Um, yes, I just want to say uh, to Mr. Donahue, uh, the, the city treasurer is limited in her scope on what she can cover, but there are a number of other greater factors affecting this. Um, the um, city treasurer subcommittee that we sit on uh, has a little bit more flexibility under the Brown Act. And I know you've attended in the past, and uh, we do um, allow for more uh, broader conversation in those uh, subcommittee meetings. Um, those are publicly agendized. Um, anyone in the public can come down there, uh, make a public comment, and, and we keep it a little lax. We allow um, a, a modicum of back and forth. So uh, if you're interested, I do encourage you to come back, and to anybody else in the public, um, we can have a more robust discussion. We're not on a time crunch or anything at those meetings, and um, it's a little bit more open. Thank you, Council Member. Um, Council Member Mullins, are you going for it? Yes, I, um, I do want to thank our city treasurer. Um, she's always very thorough, uh, and we do discuss a lot of, in the, on the committee, um, a lot of um, these um, numbers and how you arrive to these numbers and you're always very helpful in explaining and making us feel good about the investment and trust in what you do. Um, I am, and I asked you that question yesterday, I'm like, how do people afford um, living nowadays because inflation is really high, but yet I see that they're still out there, they're still buying, they're still taking vacation, they're still buying cars. And it's uh, sometimes it's, it's mind boggling with the, um, the economy and the inflation the way it is and, the, and people continue to spend. And I just learned a new word today, the y YOLO. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what? what Maybe that? it's more more um, legally accurate to say you just learned a word today. A word today. That's not new. <laughs> it's new to me. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, let me write it down. It is new to me. So thank you for that. You didn't share that with me in my meeting with you. <laughs> but I always learn something new from you. Um, yeah, so I, I know there is really not... Um, we don't have an answer to it, but I, I'm always scratching my head going, how do people afford the high prices that we are all seeing now, but continue to spend and our expenditures are still going steady, they're not dropping. Um, even though nowadays, I know the economy has been good as far as job market, but I've, I've known of at least three individuals that have lost their jobs recently. So I'm hoping that the job market continue to, to be steady or rise, not decline. So we can really see that offset of the expenses that is happening right now. So thank you for all the work you do. Oh, thank you, yes. And, and to answer your question, I mean, I think we're all just struggling to, um, you know, it's prioritizing, right? We we have a budget. I think we all have a budget. And then with higher prices, we just have to make certain choices, right? So if we prioritize travel, then maybe we cut back on eating out. Maybe we cut back on those purchases of clothing. Um, maybe we take the extra step of going to five different grocery stores because the sales are different in each grocery store. And I think all those little things add up, right? Uh, just to, you know, make sure that we stay within our budget. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. 
Thank you for the presentation. I just have one quick question and a couple comments. Um, you mentioned that um, in one of the slides about long-term investments and, and choosing to do a little bit more of long-term investing for the three to five year. Normally, you invest more for the one to two year length. Can you just speak a little bit more about why right now um, having a little bit long-term more investments is something that you're choosing to do for mm -hmm. um, the investment policy? Okay, so just to keep in things in perspective, right, our short-term uh, money market rates, for example, yield 5.2 to 5.5%. However, these rates could drop any time, right? So once the Fed starts cutting their rates, um, this could drop down to 4 or 3% in the next couple of years. Um, so at the same time, longer term, we could invest up to five years. So if I invest in a five-year bond right now, uh, for example, the other day I bought a Toyota corporate bond, it yielded 4.98%. Um, it's not as high as that 5.5%, right? So Treasury is even today about 4.4%. So let's compare those. Um, it's not as high, but then you're guaranteed that 4.5% to 5% over the next five years versus that 5.5%, which could easily become just 3% two years from now. So it's it's making that choice to say, hey, you know what, it's okay that it's slightly lower yield, but at least mm -hmm. I'm guaranteed that yield for the next five years versus just for the next you know day or two. Okay, and the follow-up question, when you lock into those longer investments, is there any risk to um, lowering the liquidity that we have on mm -hmm. the percentage? Yeah. So those longer investments are locked in, mm -hmm. um, so you don't get the principal until the end of five years. Right. Um, and that is the reason we ladder our portfolio. Um, so meaning that we want to make sure that we have maturities um, constantly, right? So this month we have 10 million maturing, next month we have another 10 million, so that it meet, meets all our cash flow needs. Um, we do, we are not you know, illiquid and have all our you know, eggs waiting, at, waiting for us at the end of five years. Right, great. Okay, thank you. That was my question. So I have a comment, though. Um, I, I find that your presentations and the financial presentations are the most entertaining and energetic of our presentations. <laughs> so I, you guys are competing with each other for that. And so I appreciate that very much. Other um, departments, you know, take note. Very entertaining. I think we have, to com we have to compensate Ooh. for the <laughs> topic. <laughs> but there was a point there where I think you started to, like, almost... Like not saying, but a little bit rhythmic. It was it was pretty it was pretty entertaining. So so right. thank you for thank that. You. Um, you definitely are enthusiastic and about this topic. It's it's um, the presentation was very clear and thorough. So appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member um, Vice Mayor. Questions or comments? Yeah, I also have one question, one comment. <laughs> Um, my my only question is, and, and I'm not even going to ask about the economy because I don't want to hear about home prices again. <laughs> um, when it comes to our yields, what I know you touched a little on this, and I missed the number, but do you have any other comparisons for what is our yield compared to other local jurisdictions? Um, so one number that I provided was a neighboring city. Um, other cities um, are pretty much in line with our yield. Uh, it really depends. Um, it is not necessarily an apples to apples comparison because each city has their own investment policy. So if a city's investment policy is not as restrictive, their yields might be slightly higher. Um, if they only invest in really short term instruments, their yields will also be higher. Um, but it is pretty much in line uh, with other cities. What was the, well, what was the, per, or the yield that you mentioned before? Was a number? 2.92%. Uh, Got it. Um, and then my other, my comment was, I really appreciated you highlighting the Inter-American Development Bank investment. That was very nice to hear. I'm glad to hear our money is going to good sources of investment rather than some uh, sketchy sources of investment that are <laughs> available to us legally. But thank you for that. I, I really think you put our money in good places. Thank you. Great. Ms. Palmer, um, I have... Uh two comments, but I'm going to start with my question. Um, you mentioned in the presentation that the Fed is anticipating possibly two rate cuts. Possibly. Well, obviously, mm -hmm. we have to wait and see what they do. Um, if that were to happen, how, if at all, would that affect our investment strategy later in the year? Mm -hmm. So right now, um, 
we're still anticipating these two to three rate cuts to happen, right? Um, the markets are thinking maybe one in July, maybe one in September, not too close to the election. Um, so depending on that change, um, say for example, no rate cuts happen, then we might stay in our shorter term, shorter term money market instruments a little longer uh, versus rushing to lock in those longer yields. Because once those rate cuts happen, then yields would drop, especially for um, you know both um, money market and uh, longer term instruments. So I think it would just affect our timing in terms of when we would uh, decide to um, really um, put more money towards our five-year uh, investments. Thank you, Ms. Palmer. Um, the only comment that I have is in regards to our public comment, and I'm going to be answering this uh, in only one capacity, and that's as an elected city official for the city of Burbank. You know, when I look, so I'm, I'm just so folks can follow along if they wanted to, I'm, I'm referencing slides about inflation and the housing market, because I really think that tells the story of what we're seeing in Burbank. The affordability crisis is an enormous problem that's facing our residents, our businesses, and impacts the city too, um, maybe a less direct way, but it's, it's there. Um, we're seeing record high inflation. And so, yes, I think that as city leaders, we have to, of course, factor in the policies and what we do, how it can impact market and prices. But I also think, to be fair, you know, the slide about housing tells me the story is we need more housing in Burbank. Because if you're a homeowner right now um, and you locked in and, you know, you have a good rate and you have the protection that Prop 13 accords uh, with regards to your property tax, why would you sell? And so it freezes up the inventory and we don't have nearly enough to go around, which means that folks can't, it does create what one commenter talked about earlier this evening about permanent tenancy. There's no upward mobility in our economy. The other thing that we have to be mindful of is that as we make policy, look, we, state and local government has long said both for homeowners and other jurisdictions with regard to rent control, there has to be certain protections put in place to limit the amount of increases that folks will see year to year. And a lot of that, in my view, has been driven by a concern about what's going to happen to folks on fixed incomes that are going to struggle more so to keep pace with inflation. Um, I bring out all that up to say that, look, we always have the constant struggle of how much regulation is necessary, how much, how, what does too much regulation look like? One could argue that everything will be much cheaper if we had no labor standards in place. We didn't, pro we didn't protect people from working more than 40 hours in a work week. We didn't have OT or workers' comp. But there is a cost. There's a cost to our human capital to that. So there is, we always have to en endeavor to find that right balance of proper government intervention and regulation to ensure that we are protecting workers from exploitation. But also also ensure that we're not over involving ourselves to the point and, and guarding against these unintended consequences on market forces. I could probably give a TED talk for two hours on that, Mr. Donahue, but I wanted to say I appreciate your comment. I think you've brought up a lot of really good issues and I wanted you to know, sir, that you're heard. Um, but these are obviously a lot of competing pressures and Back to you, Ms. Palmer. I appreciate that your office factors all of this in in our investment strategies and always ensures that the commit that the city has adequate liquidity and access to financial resources to meet our obligations. So, with that, anyone want to make a motion? Oh, that's right. We don't want to move to note and file. Okay, fine. <laughs> note and file. Unless there's anything else going once, going twice. Ms. Palmer, outstanding work as always. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, our third report to council this evening is regarding an appointment to fill one vacancy on the planning commission for an unexpired term. Madam City Clerk, would you please present the report? Thank you, Mayor Schultz. This evening, we'll be presenting uh, item number 14, which is appointment to fill one vacancy on the planning commission for an unexpired term. I will give you a little background on this. On February 23rd, the City Clerk's Office began advertising and accepting applications for one vacancy on the Planning Commission for an unexpired term ending July 31st, 2027. This vacancy was created by the resignation of current member Michael Elric. To obtain qualified candidates, a notice of vacancy was advertised through the following channels. The City's website, City Council meeting announcements, all social media platforms managed by the city clerk's office, a press release which was sent to the Los Angeles Times, the Burbank Leader, and MyBurbank.com, notices posted on the City Hall Bulletin Board, and informational messages on the Burbank Channel which play during city council meetings, 
community groups and organizations, and through a constant contact email notification. The deadline to submit applications to the City Clerk's Office for the Planning Commission was Monday, March 25th at 5 p.m. The City Clerk's Office received 11 applications, and I will read the names of those applicants in the order in which their applications were received. Emin Gabramasihi, Kevin Masterson, Jason Bennett, James Ingram, Alan Rajakic, I and apologies if I mispronounce anyone's name, Alex Jaramillo, Demi Tupua, Terry Norton, Greg Jackson, Daniel Turk, and Catlin Brinsley. Um, one of the applicants, Jason Bennett, currently serves on the Sustainable Burbank Commission. And if he is appointed, this will create a vacancy on the Sustainable Burbank Commission. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. First, let's take uh, any public comment that we have on this. Do we have any public comment cards? Great. Okay. So everyone here gets uh, three minutes. Uh, so first up, we will hear... Oh, I'm sorry. This is the one. Sorry, we are still offering one minute to those. Okay, so Mr. Donahue, you go to the front of the queue. Um, and then once you're done, I'll bring up our three-minute speakers. Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council, Staff, Dave Donahue. I've been to a lot of commission and board meetings, and I find that the a lot of really good people have been appointed. I also say have seen that a lot of people have been appointed that don't have very much experience. They're asking questions that show and indicate that they really are not aware of the subject matter. And sometimes at a recent commission, I actually had to educate people on what there was a difference between a particular term uh, of side running. Now, this pertains to the Transportation Commission, but some of the elected and appointed, appointed individuals were not aware of the term and didn't know it. So Mr. Krisky is a really great staff, uh, city staff member. He helped all of them, and he also facilitated change of a slide. I only bring this up because your appointment to this particular board is very important. There's a lot of critical issues, so finding the most qualified, in your opinion, to be appointed is very important, and thank you very much for that consideration. Thank you. Um, so now we move to our three-minute public comment cards. First, I have Terry Norton, followed by Catlin Brinsley. Good evening, council members. I'm Terry Norton, applying to the Planning Commission, and I'd like to tell you about myself. I have an extensive resume in planning, building, and construction management field, from single family dwellings to high rise, from planning a project to implement implementation of the plans and completion of the project. Our family business was based in Burbank for more than 15 years. This gave me in-depth, hands-on experience working with building codes, ordinances, and government agencies at all levels. I have been a member of the State of California Code Authorities Committee, ASME, ANSI Committee, National Code Authorities Committee, Building Owners and Management Association, BOMA, and many others. I have presented code regulation enforcement seminars to code enforcement agencies, as well as at numerous conventions regarding codes and equipment. I have held certifications for leadership in energy and environmental design, accredited professional. Lead AP, Project Management Institute, Professional PMI, PMP. Both certificates require examination and extensive experience documentation in the area of planning, design, and construction. I have also held several state and city licenses to design and install a number of different building systems. My 40 years of broad experience, having held many pertinent licenses and certifications, ensures I am qualified to execute the duties of the Planning Commission in concert with the City of Burbank and its Council. I will use my experience to carefully review, 
each project put before the Planning Commission and work within the Burbank guidelines to the best benefit of our citizens. I want to thank you for your consideration. My phone number is 818-669-6920. Do you have any questions for me? I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Norton. Um, I will also note that I have two comment cards from individuals who don't want to give comment but do want to go on record as being in support of Mr. Norton. Uh, first, I have Zach Solomon followed by Ben Frank. So we will note that both of those comment cards and comments have been received. Next, I have Catlin Brinsley followed by Jason Bennett. Good evening, council members. I'm a bit nervous, so apologies in advance. Um, my name is Catlin Brinsley, and I would consider it an honor to serve Burbank as a member of the Planning Commission. I grew up in Los Angeles, the child of an independent filmmaker and an actress, singer, dancer who turned to real estate to support our family in the early 70s. At a very young age, I began helping, building fences to create private yards for appreciative tenants and really paying attention to how people's living space affects their quality of life. I now own and self-manage 26 apartments and houses and am involved in every aspect of tenant relations and property maintenance. Prior to moving to Burbank in 2013, my family lived in Tokyo for more than a decade. This exposed me to a completely different city structure, dense housing units, a convenient and efficient transit system, and tightly knit small communities. These are all qualities that Burbank also focuses on, though certainly with our own distinct cityscape. As we grapple with affordability and state mandated challenges, we will need to find creative ways to build more densely while supporting affordability, uplifting our small business members, and preserving and maintaining the character of Burbank's distinct neighborhoods. The Planning Commission plays a vital role in this process by approving conditional use permits in line with municipal code and by advising City Council on zone text amendments. My background in real estate provides a contextual and holistic understanding of the projects and issues the Commission is likely to consider, and my training as a lawyer provides me with the skills and knowledge to apply state and municipal code to specific projects. I prepare thoroughly and am interested, deeply interested, in how we craft the next decade of built space in Burbank meeting state mandates while preserving the essence of what makes Burbank special. I look forward to collaborating with the skilled city planners who prepare clear and thorough conditional use permit presentations to facilitate commission consideration and approval, such as the adult daycare CUP presented at last night's meeting. At the same time, I see the Commission's role to include advising City Council on zone text amendments by representing the voices of the residents of Burbank on what are sometimes divisive and challenging issues, such as the gun store zoning amendment also discussed yesterday. I am a patient and engaged listener and would add a fair and balanced consideration of the issues involved to all of the Commission's discussions. I hope you will favorably consider my application to fill this vacancy on the Planning Commission. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. Next, I have Jason Bennett, and that is my final comment card. Mr. Mayor, Council Members, good evening. Good to see you all this evening. Jason Bennett, Sustainable Burbank Commission. I've had the privilege of being here several times over the years to advocate for myself for various commissions, sometimes more successfully than others. Uh, but there's one word that I feel like I always want to bring up when I'm here, and that is the idea of abundance. Burbank needs to be an abundant community. It needs to be a community of abundant housing, abundant businesses, abundant transportation options. And the only way that we can do that going forward is to continue to build and improve our city. When I came here to talk about the Transportation Committee, I talked about how we needed more bike lanes, more bus lanes, how we need to have more options. When I applied for the Sustainable Commission, I talked about how we needed to build in a sustainable way, how we could have green infrastructure and green building. 
on the planning commission, I want to bring all of those things to bear. I want to bring an attitude of yes, an attitude of new, an attitude of growth. I want us to continue to make Burbank a great place to live, and I want to continue to make it a better forward-looking community. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Bennett. Um, I believe that completes in-person public comment. I'm going to hand these back. Uh, before we go through the process of selecting, I'm going to declare a five-minute brief recess, and then we can come back and attend to our business. All right, everyone be back in five minutes.
right. Uh, welcome back from the recess. Thank you, everyone. As I do from time to time, I like to overthink things and consult with the city attorney. I had a chance to do that. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, we can move forward. Is there any brief response to public comment? I don't think this should be a deliberation, but any brief response? The only thing I would add is just that as we sit here from time to time, um, there are many instances I can recall where it's a really tough choice because you got a lot of great applicants, and tonight is probably one of the toughest I can remember. So. All I want to say is I wish I could appoint all of you. Um, I really appreciate all of you for applying. Whoever gets it, congratulations. And if you applied tonight and don't get it, please do not be discouraged. Please come back, uh, serve on this or another border commission. Our city absolutely needs people like you to serve. So thank you all. Okay, brief. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, because I wanted to actually make comments because I do appreciate we have 11 excellent applicants. Um, Every one of your resume and your qualification is really overwhelming for me personally. And I know I've spoken to some of you, and I'm very impressed. It's like the mayor said, it's really difficult to make a decision because there's only one position available. But uh, thank you for applying, and please continue to do so. Thank you, Council Member. Vice Mayor. Yeah, and just to wrap that up, I, I want to thank everybody that applied, but I'm really grateful for those of you that are here quite frankly, and joining us till this hour at night, and and who made the time to call, to email, to seek out a meeting, your, not only your expertise, but also your interest in serving the community does not go unnoticed for all of you that are here tonight. So please do continue to apply. Obviously, we can only appoint one of you. Continue to apply. Continue to stay involved. You are all beyond qualified. Does anybody else want to make a comment so I can further delay a tough choice? <laughs> I'm kidding. All right. Um, then I think before we go through, just one kind of to rehash the procedure for everybody. Unless my colleagues disagree, I don't think we need to read through the names again. So what we will do is Ms. Clark will call each name. If you'd like to vote for that individual, we're really simple here, show of hands. Uh, if anyone gets three affirmative votes, congratulations, you are appointed. Ms. Clark, would you like to walk us through, if someone does not get three votes, what the procedure will be next? Then we will go to a second round and if needed, a third round. Fantastic. Any questions from council before we start? Ms. Clark, go ahead and start calling names. Eman Gabra Masihi. Kevin Masterson. Jason Bennett. James Ingram. Alan Radjikic. Alex Jaramillo, Demi Tupua, Terry Norton. For the sake of time, Madam City Clerk, I see that five votes have been cast. So unless there's any objection, we'll, we'll dispense with reading through the names. Councilmember, did you have something? Um, if it's all right, I'd like to move that to become unanimous. That's okay. Okay, so the, for the top vote together. Got it. So that would be uh, a 5 0 appointment of Mr. Bennett to the Planning Commission. Um, Mr. Bennett, congratulations. We don't really have an opportunity for you to speak, but congratulations. Uh, and I will note for everyone who applied tonight, Mr. Bennett's appointment now has created a vacancy on the Sustainable Burbank Commission. So if you're interested in serving in that capacity, there is an opening, and we hope to see you apply. So thank you, everyone, for coming out. Congratulations again, Mr. Bennett. All right. Um, I tell you, the, these are the votes that haunt you because it's just so many good people. Yeah. Um, I lost my first vote, so I, I feel all of you. Yeah. <laughs> all right. The. All right. So that brings us to our next agenda item. Uh, next, uh, uh, next item is a report to council regarding a uh, proposed approval to excuse the absences of Patty Hollis, an Art and Public Places Committee member. Uh, Madam City Clerk, I invite you at this time to please present the report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This evening, I will be presenting item number 15, approval to excuse the absences of Art and Public Places Committee member Patricia Hollis. Patricia Hollis was originally appointed to the Art and Public Places Committee by the City Council on October 1st, 2019, and was reappointed on July 12th, 2022, to serve a term that is set to expire on July 31st, 2026. According to the committee attendance report, 
Committee Member Hollis has missed the following three regularly scheduled meetings due to planned travel arrangements, of which she notified both staff and committee members in advance. January 8th, January 16th, and February 27th of 2024. Member Hollis expressed her unwavering dedication to serve on the committee and emphasized her commitment to the public art projects that fall under the committee's purview. At the March 4th committee meeting, the committee reviewed the absences of Member Hollis and recommended that the council excuse these absences as stated in the recommendation letter from Chair Kat Olson. The committee agrees that committee member Hollis's exemplary service and dedication is of value to the mission of the committee. Additionally, tonight we have Mar Marissa Garcia, Parks, Recreation and Community Services Director, and Patricia Hollis, who you heard from earlier. At this time, I'm happy to answer any questions council may have. Uh, thank you, Ms. Clark. Before we take questions, I do have one public comment card. We will hear from Kat Olson for three minutes. Hi, I'm Kat. I'm the chair of the Arts and Public Places Committee. Um, you just heard our statement, um, you know, due to some uh, planned travel, once in a lifetime opportunity, uh, Patty missed a greater than the threshold number of allowed um, absences, but we're, at our last meeting, we already had her back on the job, and she is a treasured member of our committee. Um, she gave myself, staff, all of our committee members um, plenty of notice that she was going to be out um, and an accurate um, estimate for when she was going to be back. And she's an asset to our committee and our community. Um, and I just wanted to come and speak on her behalf this evening. So uh, thank you so much, um, Council. I ask that you excuse her absences. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Olson, for your comment. Um, I don't have any other further uh, public comment cards, so we'll declare public comment period closed for that item. Uh, Council, any questions uh, for Ms. Clark? Um, Council member, if you have a comment or a motion, that's great too. Um, so I, I wanna share um, and actually have a discussion with Council, and this really has nothing to do with Member Hollis, I want to talk about our policy and talk about um, the purpose for the code that it specifically indicates you miss three meetings, um, that council has to hear this and whether we continue accepting the member to continue serving or not. So the code, as we all know, is written for a reason and we need to take that either we all decide that we're going to take the code seriously and uphold what the language is written in here, or are we gonna uh, allow to make exception on situations that for some individuals may uh, be just having a hard time coming to the meeting or because of a job or because of travel or illness, there's multiple reasons. When um, I was sitting in the city clerk seat, uh, 10 years I've had brought in a, a lot of these reports to council. And depending on the situation, I've seen some individuals being removed from the positions due to just different reasons that they came for excuses. And not one of, uh, of them had the board or the chair said, yes, go ahead and remove them because we don't want them. Every one of the letters that come to council says, we support them, we want them to continue because as a body, of course they support and they want to continue having them to serve. Um, tonight we have 11 applicants of all these individuals that want to serve the community. So we have um, a lot of people who want to fill in these positions. Having absence um, in three in the role or 75% of the time for the quarter, I think puts an impact on the rest of the boards and commissions. I think the majority of us served on boards and commissions and you know, if one more individual cannot make that meeting, there is no quorum and they may have to cancel the meeting. And it really puts the, the other members in a difficult situation because they know they have to attend. Um, so it makes it difficult on everybody else. And I wanna again talk about this has nothing to do with Member Hollis, I just wanna, that we discuss our policy, whether we're gonna agree that we're gonna make just exception and we need to change the code, perhaps, the language, or are we gonna look into this and see what we're gonna do moving forward. So, so I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, Council. No, so um, 
what I, I really wanted to discuss this, but unfortunately it happens to be, um, you know, the member that we're talking about tonight. I know we've had a couple of uh, excuses. They were on the consent agenda, and I requested last time moving forward that all this needs to be coming on the actual report so we can have a discussion because there's a code and there's a violation. So whether we adhere to the code, we look at the violation, and we need to find out what can we do as a body to move forward from this point on. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. I'm not going to weigh in, but I would like to ask the City Attorney. Um, Mr. City Attorney, uh, obviously it's in the report, but if you could read for the public benefit the code section that Council Member Mullins was referencing. The code section is Burbank Municipal Code Section 2-1-403 entitled Absences and Vacancies. And um, uh, Council Member Mullins is correct about the three consecutive regularly scheduled meetings or 75% of meetings. So there's a standard for attendance upon which the board commissioner committee must consider and uh, decide. The board commissioner committee shall consider the reasons for the absences with the member and make a determination whether they should be excused or unexcused by the council. The report is then transmitted uh, to the city clerk who agendizes it. So that's where we are right now. And the only guidance for council is, it's the last sentence of subsection A on absences, the city council shall take appropriate action, including but not limited to excusing the absences removing the member, or such other actions as the council deems appropriate. So um, there's no mandatory action. It's any action that you deem appropriate. Thank you, Mr. McDougall. Colleagues, if I might, I'm not going to weigh in, but I just have one other question, and this would actually be for Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark, could you please remind us um, of board member Hollis's, um, when does her term expire, and could you give us the exact date of the missed meetings? So the term is set to expire on July 31st of 2026, and the dates of the absence were January 8th, January 16th, and February 27th. So they were consecutive meetings all in 2024. Great. Thank you. Um, who'd like to go next? Council member? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Did you say January 8th and January 16th? That's correct. What is the what is the regular frequency of Arden Public Places meeting? Um, can one, I get one of get them the might have been a special meeting? So I'll let yeah. Marissa, can I ask Ms. Garcia, our director it. of Parks and Rec. Good evening, Mayor Schultz, uh, Council Members, Marissa Garcia, Parks and Recreation Director. The Arden Public Places Committee uh, meeting uh, does not have a set uh, meeting like they meet monthly. They they are actually an on call. They meet. Um, as needed. So hence the two meetings in January. There was uh, items that they needed to meet, uh, two meetings in January, and uh, hence why there were those two meetings in January that she missed. So she missed two meetings eight days apart. Correct. So the likelihood of missing one of those meetings was greatly increased because of the closeness of the second meeting. That is correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. uh, Council Member Takahashi. Yeah, to follow up on that, please. Um, so when she made the plans, and she let the staff know ahead of time, correct, that she was going to be traveling? That is correct. She didn't know yet that there would be two meetings that close together in January when she made her travel plans, I would uh, imagine. I believe that is correct. Yeah. Because normally, you know, our commissions and meetings, uh, boards meet once a month. You know, planning boards an exception sometimes. But um, so to, to make plans for travel, one would expect... If you're going to be that even gone that long, you'd only miss maybe two. So that's is this is this unusual or to have meetings so close together like this for this? It, yes, it's not common right. that aren't public places. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else want to wait? Yes, Councilmember Mullins. So if the second meeting was um, agendized. Because of the absence, if one more member would have been absent, would you have had been able to have the meeting, or you wouldn't have a quorum, I'm assuming? There's seven members? Seven members. There are seven okay. members. So you would still have a quorum for the meeting to go on? Correct. Okay. Yeah, you would need four absences <coughs> yeah. to lose quorum. Okay. Correct. 
Anyone? Uh, Vice Mayor. Yeah. So I, you know, Councilman Mullins, I hear you in that um, the policy, you know, we have a policy. But my question now becomes, is the policy maybe too vague? Are we not considering things? I'm even thinking about the fact of just for our schools, we have a difference between an excused absence and an unexcused absence. When I hear the reasoning for the absences, and, and again, this is my sub subjective criteria because that's all I have to go off of, but I, I thought about, did she notify her colleagues in advance? Um, was this something planned, a one-time thing? Or is it, I have class now at this very same time and I'm going to miss the next 10 meetings in a row because that's just how it is. And then the third thing is, is she sharing about it? Is she conducting herself in a way where she reports back, talks about it, all of that? And, and I see all of that here. But to your point, that is one council member's opinion. That is one person on this body's opinion. That's how I'm looking at it. And I think there is room for discussion on a more standardized way of looking at this. And that's exactly why uh, we're discussing this today. So um, we can all move forward from here understanding what is it that we expect? Do we want to change it? Again, and I, I say this, I wish she was in the room to hear it, but this has absolutely nothing to do with the member. It's the policy and when would we make an exception? It's actually our code. So when do we make an exception? When we do not make an exception, is the code strict? Do we want to change the language? Do we want to have this kind of discussion publicly in front of everybody about each member? So I, I, I need, uh, this is our fourth one, I believe, within six months period that we're now discussing over absence. We didn't discuss the last three of them because they were on consent. Um, so moving forward, because these situations do happen and they're happening more often than usual, so I'm asking my colleagues, what do you want to do moving forward? And I'm happy to, to approve the excuse and move forward on that one. I don't have any issue, but what are we going to do moving forward? Unless the city attorney so, or my colleagues have some input to what we need to do. I, I'd actually like to weigh in, Mr. McDougall, before you, if I might. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, no, I, so I, I actually, um, with all deference and respect to Ms. Hollis, I'm going to disagree with you on, on one very narrow point, Councilmember Mullins. I think if we want to re revisit the policy, that would, in my view, be a new agenda item. Um, I think this is very much about Ms. Hollis. I, I, you know, look, I'm in favor of keeping her on the commission, but I would like to say a couple things out loud. There are a couple factors weighing in her favor. I appreciate that the committee chair is here to speak on her, befa her behalf. I appreciate that Ms. Hollis was here to speak on her behalf. Um, before I go on, I actually do have one question for either, um, either our, 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 our department director or Ms. Olson, our committee chair. Did Ms. Hollis, prior to the travel, uh, convey to either of you that these were unchangeable or you know, long-term pre-scheduled travel plans? Because right now, I, I don't see that in the record. Ms. Olson, thank you. Since uh, Ms. Hollis is in here to speak on her behalf, this was definitely a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for overseas something really special so this wasn't just she was zipping to vegas and thought this would be great and you know fiddle dd with my responsibilities this is truly a once in a lifetime opportunity um she was really excited about it um it had um family roots with it so it was really truly something special and um just to uh to say again that this was in that we met so frequently um, is unusual um, for our committee. We've had a lot with airport and Ritzy. We just we've had a lot of things to keep moving forward recently, um, and that is sort of uh, separate from what we typically see um, for our committee, and not something that she could have foreseen months in advance at the time that she was planning um, these arrangements. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I, I say this because for um, Ms. Hollis or for future uh, Border Commission members, um, if you're making your case to the council, that's the kind of detail I'd like to hear, uh, is that these were unavoidable travel plans. Um, you know, the way I look at it is, you know, when I think of an excused absence, I think of a death in the family, a major illness. Travel plans to me are sort of on the fence. I, I don't think she should be booted off the committee, but in general, 
I'm looking for something a little bit more truly unavoidable. I would have liked to have heard that from Miss Hollis. In her case, though, um, I'm comfortable, given her passion to serve, her history of service to the community, of allowing her to continue serving. Um, I would be supportive of a future agenda item to revisit the policy. I also think it's important that we talk publicly about it, because as we saw tonight, we had 10 other people that applied for a committee spot that would love the chance to serve, and so giving someone a second chance, it, it's a big deal. Um, the only other question I have, Mr. McDougall, as I read the code, if I'm not mistaken, we could excuse the absence. Even if we found that they were unexcused, we could still take no action, action and not remove her. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I think it, so. It's not a policy. It's actually ordinance. So it can only be changed with an ordinance. But the ordinance is general enough. It allows the council to take any action it wishes and the matter's properly before you within the procedure. So okay. I think you're in the right place and you have flexibility to make um, whatever determination you want based upon the facts. So I'll, I'll just give my two cents and then I will cede the floor to hear from my colleagues. Based on what I have, I don't know that I can quite make the finding that these are excused absences. However, I would feel comfortable uh, saying that based upon what we have heard tonight, that Ms. Hollis be permitted to continue serving. Uh, and hopefully that sends the message of, I understand it was a once in a lifetime trip, of course, but when you sign up to serve on a border commission, as we all do, um, I have to modify my travel arrangements and miss family reunions because I've decided to serve the Burbank community. That applies to all of us. I don't think that anything that she's done, though, merits removal from the committee. So that's one council member's perspective. I'd like to hear where all of you are at. Can I follow up on that, Mr. Mayor? One mm -hmm. thing, just, and I, I know this is food for thought for a later discussion, but be it Ms. Ms. Hollis or another one of our members, one thing that we've seen come up in commissions, because I, I, I got to sit through a very thorough discussion on one of our commissions about this for one of the members. The question of how much to share also came up. You know, do you have to say that you're traveling because there is a sick family member? What if, you know, you don't, what if that's confidential? Um, do you have to share about your own medical time you're taking off. So I, I think all of that to say, right now, based on the policy that we have, I would excuse this because because it, it's, it's on us as a city. We don't have a clear policy to say, right, this is an excusable, this is excusable, this is not, this is what you have to present or should present, where you're not were you to miss a certain amount of meetings? I, I feel, as I sit here, too, that it's it's unclear. So I do hope we agendize this for later. And given given the policy and given what was shared tonight from Ms. Hollis, from our Director of Parks and Recreation, and from the Chair of the Committee, I would say I, I would excuse her, given the information that she has in front of her as a commissioner and that we have. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Anthony, then Councilmember Mullins. Um, yeah. Um Mr. Mayor, I believe you're the only person up here that hasn't served on a border commission for the city. And I will tell you, my colleagues over here know that you can't always make a meeting. And you do your best. You reach out. You tell people that you're going to be missing. Um, you try to get the information after the fact. And you do everything you can to stay involved and stay informed. Um, illness. Traffic accidents, um, deaths in the family. There are things that happen that take you away from your ability to serve. I am not comfortable sending a message that travel plans, either once in a lifetime or spur of the moment, are an excused absence for service to the city. Um, however... Ms. Hollis has served, she's in her second term. She served very well on this board. Planning a trip in the amount of time that one would think they would only miss a single, if two at the most, meetings, and then suddenly come across very quickly consecutive meetings. When I had first heard this report, I thought she had, she was out of, the country for three months. And I'm like, you don't leave for 90 days and expect to get your position back. Looking at the actual timing, I realized it is a much shorter time that she was gone, and there just happened to be extenuating circumstances that created multiple meetings in a row. So 
no, I would not like to excuse these absences, but I would consider them to be the, in the same time frame, comparable to only missing two. And so I'm comfortable keeping her on the board, but I, I want the folks to know that this specific board has different timings and anyone else serving, um, the 11 people who showed up on our uh, packet today who want to serve, know that this is a commitment. It's a commitment to the city. It's a commitment to service. And there are only a handful of reasons where, why you should be gone, although we do allow people to miss a few. We have that flexibility. Um, I'm actually, personally, comfortable with the language as is because what that does, it allows us to have this conversation. It allows people to know that if you miss X amount, you got to come down here. you got to plead your case. You don't have to tell us everything. You can go offline. We are easy to contact. Um, our email is you know easy to get a hold of, um, have a phone call. But keeping it in place forces a conversation to be had about why, why you weren't able to serve, why you weren't able to give that commitment. So um, I'm, I'm okay moving forward. Um, that's where I'm at. Thank you. <laughs> Council Member Mullins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and um, Council Member Anthony. I, I am in agreement with you that the language, the ordinance was put in place for a very specific reason and it's been in place for many, many, many years. It has worked. And I think it, it holds members accountable to make sure that they're committed to serving the community because this is important roles that they take on and it can have an impact on the rest of the members if they're not present and if they're not attending. And the other members can also, um, it, in some way it's unfair if they're making every meeting and, and you know other members are missing meetings. Um, and I, I wanna remind all of you that we do receive an attendance report and the attendance report is there for a very good reason Staff also has responsibilities, and I've had this discussion with our city manager, to remind the members, you're at strike one or two, so please make sure you're not hitting third strike because it can cause you to come in before council and have this very difficult conversation. We don't, we don't want to have this conversation. Believe me, this is the last thing I wanted to do tonight. <laughs> Uh, but we have to, we have a code and, and my responsibility as a council member is to look at the code and uphold that code. I saw the pictures and I saw her vacation, it looked wonderful. I went through every one of her photos and I think it was an amazing trip and, and by all means, you know, she had an opportunity to go and she did go. So it's, it's you know, I, I am also in support like everybody's saying, she notified, um, Staff, I think we needed to let her know also that this is could be walking a thin line because three, you know, there is going to be absence. So um, I don't mind at all having her continue serving, but I think the message needs to be sent to all the boards and commissions. I like the language; it's been in the ordinance for many years. I think maybe now I know the city manager said also he. Um, reminded staff that they need to be reminding the boards to let them know, you know, strike one, two, there's the third one, you're gonna go to council. City clerk is gonna come and get us, give us a report. So I think moving forward, we this is a unfortunate situation that we're having this dialogue about it, but it needed to happen with this council because we haven't had this conversation about one of our members before. So thank you, I am in agreement, we should, have her continue serving. I appreciate you coming late in the evening to talk to us about it. But um, mo moving forward, I think we need to really evaluate the attendance report, evaluate how many absence and the reasons for it. Thank I, you. Thank you. I'm going to call on Ms. Clark at this time. I just wanted to remind council members, if I could, that the original purpose of the trip was her daughter's wedding. Yeah. So it wasn't just a vacation. That's all I want. just wanted to clarify thank, that. Thank you for thank that you. clarification, Ms. Clark. 
Um, Councilmember Takahashi. Thank you for repeating that because that's what I caught too. Um, I don't know if any of you, your children, I, Ms. Mullins, your children have been married, mm -hmm. but that is a big deal, especially if they're married, getting married in another country. So that is not, um, it, it, it's not a small thing. Um, so um, I, tonight I wouldn't really prefer just to focus on this particular individual situation, but I am open to a discussion later, agendized item to discuss the, pol always willing to adjust, uh, to discuss policies or, or this ordinance. F given the language we have in the ordinance now, it is up to us in our subjective decision tonight, that's just how it is, and in my subjective op opinion, um, this, we would not be here tonight if there was that, wasn't that extra meeting. So if that January 6th meeting, 16th meeting didn't happen to be assigned, we wouldn't even be sitting here. Mm -hmm. She would have been missed the two, and that would have been it, mm -hmm. right? And so it just happens to be that that was inserted in the calendar, and so that's why we're here, because technically it falls under the three meetings, but otherwise it's just really an unusual situation. I don't think that's her, should be her responsibility to ensure that she's here for every possible meeting that would be in, within a span of a normal meeting cycle, in, in case something pops up. I think that's kind of an unreasonable expectation for somebody. But um, I, you know, to the point that it, it technically does fall under missing three though, so we're here talking about it. I also want to mention that um, not, only did she, not only did she let the staff know she was going on this vacation so they could prepare, make sure every, you know, they had a quorum and they were all ready. While she was on her wedding trip and vacation, she took the time and in intention to take pictures of public art specifically for the purpose of bringing it back to the Public Art Commission. And I think that shows a dedication to her service. I mean, the question here we're asking is, well, if we're not there, if you're not there, then you're not dedicated. I think her saying, well, I'm not there, but while I'm not there, I'm gonna do this work. It's like extra credit if you miss an, a, a test, right? And I think that she did that. You know, she got the extra credit points. There have been times I've had, as a council member, I've had to meet, miss important things for other things. And so while I'm doing that other thing, I'm thinking about the thing I miss, it happens, right? And I think that showing dedication in different ways, going to a meeting is just one of the ways, and then there's another way. And those, some of those pictures were really, really great examples of public art that we can then use as examples here. The last picture, I don't know if you caught it, was in the middle of a, of a, of a square, a giant sculpture of the Thor hammer. Okay, so that would be something we could put in our city because it's very appropriate. So here's an example. So I think that just kind of looking at um, how the whole picture and not having the, a really strict rule of just three absences is, is somewhat of a, it was definitely a, a, you know, a technical reading of the, of the ordinance, but I think in this particular case it makes complete sense to me to keep her I, I do not want to lose her on the commission it's clear that she's dedicated and that um, she you know cares about this topic so I, I definitely think that we should keep her on thank you vice mayor do you have anything additional yeah I mean just to re-highlight I think councilmember Takahashi you summed it up perfectly that's exactly how I feel and and for me the biggest thing is there was a meeting set without she didn't have precedent when she set the timeline for her travel that there would be an additional meeting one week apart. I, I agree that that is, to me, an unreasonable expectation. At, for a commission member, we have to remember that, yes, commission members along with city council serve the city. They are not held at the same expectation of city council. We have signed up to be available almost all of the time. <laughs> they have signed up for regular meetings and have agreed to serve for committees that perhaps don't interfere with their work commitments or with their, you know, regular school family commitments. And I think it's rather hard to set that if you don't have a set meeting and if it's possible to set a meeting at arbitrary timelines like one week after the other. Right, I mean, most of our boards and commissions don't function in that manner. They're monthly, at a regularly scheduled time. And if there's a special meeting, it's called for often in advance, and in, in that month in advance. So that's something I think really worth considering, at least in this specific case. Thank you, uh, but Council Member. I'll go to you next. But before I do, um, just given the late hour, and I want to move the agenda, uh, I'm going to offer a brief comment and a suggestion, and then I promise to go to you first. Um, I hear both of you. I don't wholly agree. Um, 
I, I don't really want to. I don't. I want a five zero vote here because I want Miss Hollis to feel empowered to continue serving. Um, your po both of you. Your point is well taken. That the lack of a definition in the code about what is excused or unexcused is is well taken. Um, what I would say though is when you choose to apply for this particular committee or commission it does have an erratic schedule. Like that is a, a responsibility that you take on in serving on that committee, an expectation that you hold. Um, in my view, speaking as one council member, I do not believe she should be removed. And I think that there are instances where travel, especially in the instance of travel required by your employer, um, could be the basis for an excused absence. I think that a wedding, while an amazing event, and I would absolutely want anyone to go and experience that, um, I don't know that it rises to the level, in my mind, of an excused absence. However, I don't really want us to lose the forest through the trees here. Mr. McDougall, the way I read the code, I don't think the council needs to necessarily necessarily make the finding that they're excused or unexcused. We can make the determination that the right outcome tonight is to take no action with regards to Ms. Hollis and simply allow her to continue serving and perhaps revisit the definition at a later date. That's how I think we get a 5-0 vote. It balances what you're both saying, but it also balances what I feel and some of my colleagues are saying and that it, it, we don't necessarily want to call it excused. Mr. McDougall, is my analysis fair? If you don't vote to remove her, she will remain. Well, that answers it, folks. Councilmember Anthony. Uh, I would just say, you know, in the future, if this does come back, I'd be in favor of putting a time limit on the three excused absences, like hmm. three consecutive uh, missed three consecutive missed uh, meetings within a 100-day period or something or a 90-day period or something or, or no. It's, it, We're yeah. getting into deliberation We're on the other it, item. But I don't want to get into it. But like putting a timer on it is fine. Um, I, would, I would like to do, so under the code, we can take any appropriate action. Yes. So I would like to move that we find these are not excused absences and leave it at that. And do nothing else. I, that's very confusing. <laughs> Fine, I will, rem I will rescind my motion. I would entertain a motion to simply allow Miss Hollis to continue serving, notwithstanding recent absences. That I way, make, we're not. I want to make that motion since I brought this <laughs> upon you. And it's again, it's for discussion and there is healthy discussion to understand what we need to move to do for moving forward. So I do make a motion to continue Member Hollis. To, to allow Member Hollis to continue serving on the uh, board, the committee, of uh, the Arts and Public Place Committee. Second. second. Oh, you got a we second and a third. Seconds, yes. All right. Any, any other discussion? I mean, I could find one excused and then the other two. No, never mind. All right. I'm just so... <laughs> I'm just so glad you reminded me I hadn't served on a board of commission. I somehow <laughs> forgot that fact. All right. Uh, any other discussion? Seeing none, let's do a roll call vote. Uh, Mayor um, Schultz, can you clarify the second? It was a dead heat. Uh, I, I heard Councilmember Takahashi. Thank you. Councilmember Anthony? Yes. Councilmember Thank Mullins? You. Yes, I did make the motion. You did. The uh, second. Oh. It was the second. They oh, okay. both said yeah. okay. second at the same time. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Council Member Tagahashi? Yes. Vice Mayor Perez? Yes. And Mayor Schultz? Yes. Thank you. All right, motion carries 5-0. That was fun. Uh, now, that we're now that we're strolling past the 10 o'clock hour, our next uh, report to council this evening is an update on the city's five-year homeless action plan. Uh, Ms. Simone McFarlane, please present the report along with any other staff members who are here to help and assist with that presentation. Fantastic. So I have a suggestion that we could make your gavel Thor's hammer. Wouldn't that be cool? You know I'm game. <clears throat> so Simone McFarland with Community Development. Um, I'm going to introduce my staff a little, bit, uh, a little bit further into the presentation. Great. They are on it in PIO tonight. It's already up. So um, I would like to uh, thank you for allowing me to present the homeless plan update. This item is tonight is for note and file. And I'm sure that you'll remember City Council adopted the plan in 2022, and it's a five-year plan that ends in 2027. <clears throat> Under this plan, there are six core strategies, and we will go through these strategies and their metrics tonight. Additionally, Council adopted a core metric that could be conceived as an overarching goal to reduce our unsheltered 22 
2022 population count 50% by the end of fiscal year 27-28. While our overall homeless count was 265 in 2022, the unsheltered count I'm sorry, the unsheltered count in 2022 was 188. This means that 77 people were, were homeless but still had shelter. For the point in time count in 2023, the unsheltered population was 181. While this reduction may not seem impressive and certainly shows that we have more work to do, it's important to note how many people we have helped. During 2023, we helped house, sent to rehab, or returned to their loved ones more than 80 Burbank homeless residents. Hala Home Again LA worked to help 40 families, Street Plus assisted 10 people, and 30 Burbankers received emergency housing vouchers. At this point, I'd like to clarify that you heard tonight we issued 67 emergency housing vouchers. However, this is a county-wide program, which means that we had to accept county-wide applicants. But 30 of those were actually Burbankers, and we pushed to have them participate in that program. The 80 individuals and family members leads one to believe that while we're helping a large number of people, our homeless population continues to increase. And in fact, when the point in time count comes out in, by LASA in a few months, we believe that Burbank's count will increase from its existing 252 pe persons and that it will mostly likely occur in those people living within their cars or vehicles. Before we review our goals, our metrics, and our outcomes, I'd like to point out that the 2024 metrics have been set and they've been added to the back of your staff report. So as we go through each of these goals, I'm not going to go through them line by line and bore you to death. Um, instead, I'm going to talk about the highlights in each of the goal areas. So let's get to it. Starting with capacity building, to build our internal capacity, we must rely on our service providers and, our communi and communicate with them well. Because of these needs, we've increased our partner relationships by 15 to include nonprofits such as comprehensive community health centers who provide, sorry, I'm gonna sneeze, <laughs> who provide medical and wellness services, Frontier Distribution who offer free phones, and the Salvation Army Adult Rehab offering back to work assistance. A highlight of this section is a teaser of what's to come in the future. Staff has become, begun working on the development of the Homeless Advisory Committee in terms of possible mission, makeup, building schedule, meeting schedules, and the committee for the committee as this group will help staff and council with recommended strategies and solutions along with being tasked as a working group that will increase education from the community, within the community, create engagement and advocate advocate for legislation. Staff will bring a report to council and it's currently scheduled for May and we'll be asking council to appoint a council liaison to this committee. In the area of advocacy, staff continues to attend meetings and provide letters advocating for programs that can assist homeless and the city to provide more funds, increased mental health and drug rehabilitation facilities along with additional housing. Much of this was recently approved in the legislative platform for 2024 by council as it outlines Burbank's position on our policies and homelessness. There are two program highlights in this area. The first is the city is working with the Burbank Housing Corporation to build a new housing project on Fairview that will contain approximately 60 affordable housing units. This will come back to City Council this summer, and we've allocated $1.8 in home ARP funds that have already been attained for this project, and staff is working with BHC to identify additional funds. Secondly, the City has received $373,536 in Major H funds to help support our Homeless Solutions Fund. This fund helps fund various needs, such as finding housing, uh, security deposits, holding fees, motel vouchers, and et cetera. It helps to fa also fund our outreach, and we're currently applying for more funding. However, we've been told that our allocation this year will be about $50,000 less. A reminder here is I'm preaching to the choir. Burbank still does not receive a direct allocation of major age funds. <laughs> 
And while we contribute $9 to $11 million a year, to date we've received $2.7 million back, and we've contributed more than $55 million. Put that in your back pocket. Uh, the county hopes to increase this amount, uh, a sales tax to uh, half a percent, where now it's a quarter percent, with the majority of the funds going to the city of LA during the next election as an initiative. As proposed, there still is not a direct allocation in the new initiative, which would go on the ballot in November. In the area of access and engagement with additional Street Plus funding funds allocated by the City Council last year, during the budget cycle, staff has hired a homeless outreach coordinator. The coordinator helps by supervising, guiding, and training staff on service assessments, case management, and resource navigation. All of this makes us more efficient while increasing our outreach presence. This is reflected in the large number of engagements listed in metric 3.1 of 381. Additionally, the SAFE, our homeless storage program, is doing very well. 37 of the 40 storage containers are full, and we're requesting another 10. Last year, we purchased a shower trailer and provided 540 showers. That's a lot of water. Um, offering showers is important as it provides a chance to feel clean and renewed and promotes engagement between us and the homeless. This number includes repeat visitors. Lastly, the 311 application can be used for reporting people who are in need and ha has been success highly successful with more than 300 service requests last year. And while we like to see this number really high because it tells us our system is working and we ult uh, is working, we ultimately just want to see it really low because we want to have less incidences to report. I'd like to take a second here and talk about the complexity of Burbank's homeless programs. The programs have grown similarly to how a new business might start. We've leaned on our friends and our family, our other departments to make it successful. Homeless is not a community development department program, but a citywide program led by CDD. We have our internal partners through the city attorney's office, police, fire, parks and rec, library services, information, and the city manager's office. We've cobbled together funds from 15 various sources to create 17 different programs that help with the homeless and housing. Many of these sources are from grant funds and they come with strings attached and require tracking, monitoring, compliance, and auditing. Additionally, we have two large proposed construction projects that could eventually house people needing transitional housing. And if this wasn't enough, the ho homeless team currently monitors 11 CDBG programs. It's a full plate and it has been for some time with only one and a half persons before our new hires. So luckily the council allocated two new positions during the last budget cycle and we recruited Sanayi Gonzalez and Marlene Galvez who is filling, um, they're filling both staff positions and this is also in addition to Bob Newman who you all already know doing our outreach efforts. And I would be remorse not to mention our loss of our fearless homeless leader who passed away in February. We are still reeling from his loss and I wish he was standing before you today instead of me. I truly miss Marcos. Under the goal of shelter and house, housing accessibility, we have established the Motel Voucher Program. This got off to a late start because the county was late completing the contracts and while this chart shows only three families uh, have been using the program, we've actually s have seven and it, the number continues to grow. We've also been diligent, wor diligently working on a future homeless solution centers and while I'll only give the highlights here because we have that on the next item, um, I'll go into further detail later. Today, we've hired an architect and engineering firm to begin drawing up preliminary plans for Front Street, and tonight we'll be asking council to move ahead with this site as a selected project site. The project will include 26 tiny homes along with 14 parking spaces for safe parking. Additionally, one of the largest challenges we found with housing is finding affordable housing in Burbank. Through a contract with Home Again LA or HALA, we're offering housing navigation to our EHV, voucher, EHV and PSH voucher recipients. 
so our emergency housing and permanent supportive housing vouchers. This has been found to be beneficial as HALA acts as a representative for the voucher recipient as they look and apply for new housing. Additionally, EHV vouchers all receive, also receive aftercare assistance that is supplied by Hope of the Mission. In the area of health and stabilization, I'd like to highlight that the number of assessments, our number of assessments have grown exponentially. This has been partly due to our additional team members and Street Plus personnel approved by council last year. This is in, extremely important as the information goes into our Homeless Management Information System, or HMIS database, that helps our track our assistance and develop plans for future assistance. It can include pertinent data about a person, their needs, and a plan for moving forward, and it may include different types of housing. Additionally, uh, the police department is desiring to hire an additional MET team member so that they can have someone available seven days a week. They've received $200,000 in funding through Congressman Schiff's office that would cover the first year's cost and are working with the Department of Mental Health to have a position filled and assigned. This has been an extremely frustrating process with DMH not responding, and we could use council's help in talk by talking to your electives, or your peers. As part of the opioid settlement court cases, dis distributors and manufacturers of opioids were mandated to pay out funds to be used for opioid prevention. We elected in Burbank to receive the money directly instead of passing it through to the county. And as a result, the city will receive approximately $100,000 a year for the next 20 years. The city's already received approximately $280,000 and we're in year three. Knowing these funds were coming and that they have a requirement to be spent on opioid education and prevention, staff elected to create a working group of nonprofits and city departments to help determine the best use. The group consisted of the Burbank YMCA, Boys and Girls Club, Lila, which is the French private school we have in Burbank, Family Services Agency, and internal departments. Together, the working group created the following programs that are in now various stages of implementation. The Boys and Girls Club is offering workshops as part of an after-school program with other nonprofits and Park and Rec, along with Lila, and they are given to junior high and high school students participating in these programs. The Boys and Girls Club will also hold a parents' meeting where parents will be informed of how to look for opioid use and what they can do to address opioid use within their families. And then lastly, Family Service Agency is creating a program that provides counseling and referrals for treatment. The initial program is for 12 months. The last goal area is in the area of capacity building. Our library and park and rec partners with city council funding have hired a social worker that they share. This person helps guide homeless and at-risk homeless obtain and helps them obtain services. This past year, she's worked with more than 800 people and it's at, is at capacity, while demand continues to increase, which may suggest that we will need somebody, another person in the future. Under our Lifting People Up program, our partner, Hala again, has helped 878 residents with financial literacy, helping them to climb out of debt, creating savings, and budgeting their finances. This program went citywide last year, hence the significant increase. Our last highlight is the 2244 North Buena Vista, or the Old Boys and Girls Club, AKA the Old Fire Station. <laughs> We're just reinventing it over and over again. So staff has been working on obtaining an architectural and engineering firm along with funding to rehabilitate the old building and then lease it to HALA per council's directions. Staff will be asking for a sole source contract for architectural and engineering at the next meeting during the consent item along with approving an exclusive negotiating agreement with HALA. Full details will be shared in the report, but the building is slated to be Hollow's new headquarters and will house four tiny homes for families. Outreach will begin um, once the preliminary designs are developed, and staff along with Hollow would like to see this project move quickly. Get it open. 
As you can tell, there's a lot going on with this tiny team, and we wouldn't be successful without our internal partners. I want to thank all of them and the nonprofit agencies for working with us. As I said at the beginning of this presentation, this item is presented as a note and file, but we're here for any questions the council might have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McFarland. Um, do we have any public comment cards? I see none. No, we do not. Okay, then, uh, Council, it is a note and file, uh, but this is a great time for questions and comments. Who'd like to begin? Yeah, Council Member Takashi. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, that was, I, I think that was almost as energetic as, uh, as uh, the tr City Treasurer's presentation, so thank you. Um, so I have a few questions about the... Well, first of all, this is a very excellent report, and I appreciate the numbers and the real data that we can use when, you know, for the next item especially. But I wanted to talk, ask you about particularly the shower and the storage areas. Um, so I'm seeing here in the, this is slide number nine, that there were 540 shower participants and 948 storage visits. Is that right? Okay. That was in the year, the whole year, 2023. So... Um, did, have we? This is this is quite a lot of people visiting the, the, the storage and, and using the showers, right? A lot of folks coming in and out of that location, using the facilities, moving in and out of that space, being in that space for a little while. Have we received any complaints or concerns from the community about those two programs this year? Good evening, uh, council member and mayor and vice mayor, Robert Newman, Community Development Department. And answer is no, we haven't received any uh, complaints about any individuals. The only complaint that we've had this past year is about a shopping cart that was out front, which of course was uh, removed and taken into the safe. Okay, so with the thousand people who come in and out of the storage and the 500 plus people who use the shower, not one person complained about those people moving in now okay um, and then um, have you based I mean we don't have the police department here but just based on your general knowledge have there been any uptick in that area of crime or reports of crime or concerns about crime around that space oh police is here we actually Yay. do have our police department Wonderful. here <laughs> um, so did you catch the question I can repeat it he doesn't miss anything. <laughs> Captain, please. I'm Captain Dennis Kremens. I, I can't speak to your uh, specific. We haven't done any uh, any uh, studies on that in particular area, but to my knowledge, there's been nothing. We're, we have crime control meetings every day, and that hasn't been a, a topic of discussion. Okay. So follow-up uh, question. I don't think we have anything there. Okay, follow-up question. Have you had any concerns or questions or, or incidents around drug use in that area? in the last year with these individuals using these services? Uh, I don't think so, but I, I would have to, you know, to be honest, you would have to run it, do an analytical run on it to find out. But uh, to my knowledge, that's not an area where we typically encounter that type of uh, activity. Great, thank you. And then uh, this is for all of you. Do you find that when people use these services, both the storage or the shower, that afterwards or before they hang out, just hang out there? and whatever, or do they use the services and move on? Uh, go ahead. Great question. So it actually is a mixture. Uh, some people come and use the services and, and go about their way. Uh, but a lot of them, uh, more and more, as they frequent the uh, navigation center and take the showers and use the storage, and are finding out that we also have other uh, services to offer, other events, are actually uh, feel comfortable there. And so, and are, are there uh, and come and, and uh, take advantage of some of the other services. Oh. And, and as you know, uh, um, it's a great opportunity to, to build bridges with those individuals, right? Shower, clean clothes, you know, they're fresh. And that's a good, a good uh, point uh, to begin to uh, work with them on finding out what's going to help them transition out of homelessness. So it's, it's quite effective. Wow. Well, thank you for saying that. I was trying to paint a picture, I think, for folks in the community of what happens there and what goes, you know, what the, what the interactions are like and what has already, what the impact has been with this data already. So it, it's kind of prepping us for the next item. So thank you, Mr. Mayor, for allowing me to ask those questions. Of course. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Who would like to go next? Uh, yeah, Council Member Anthony. Uh, I, I just have a follow-up <clears throat> uh, for the Captain. Um, 
crime in general, citywide, is it lower than last year or higher than last year or the same? Are, are you it's it's general about trends? the same. I can tell you with uh, our total contacts with uh, you know people who are unhoused, it's uh, it's on track to be lower. Generally, as calls for service, uh, our 5150 holds for evaluation are lower also than uh, than the previous years. Interesting. We've only done nine to date. You know, last year we had I think 70 total, so we're on. Uh, pardon me, on um, we had 16 to date, so we'd be on track for like 64 at the end of the year, okay. extrapolating you know to uh, December. Okay. Thank you. I mean, I only ask because someone called in and said we're spending money on homelessness and now, crime is going to go up. But we, we do have an uptick in in calls about people creating uh, uh, disturbances that are that are homeless. So that was uh, uh, it's it was three six hundred and thirty six last year. We have one hundred eighty one year to date. So we're on track for seven hundred and twenty okay. at the end of the year. So that that is trending upwards. Okay. We, but we've done more welfare checks on them this year too. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Captain. Um, Councilmember Mullins. Thank you, Captain, for clarifying that because hearing, um, listening to staff, our numbers have actually gone up. The, our homeless population numbers have gone up this uh, last count. I know we don't have the final numbers, so it didn't. I was a little confused with uh, with the population going up and and that we're not having that many calls. It was a little confusing, but well, you. Well, sometimes, I mean, mo most of these statistics are somewhat inferential because we don't label people as such. Now, if we find in the course of investigation, sometimes people will call and say there's a homeless man, you know, and, and you know, provide other details. Other things that will come out in the investigation. Sometimes we get a call that somebody is, uh, you know, publicly inebriated and is uh, unconscious or whatever it might be. So we find out in the course of an investigation, but we don't, we don't target that specifically. Uh, we do try to track it to the degree we can on uh, officers' logs that if somebody you know is homeless, so we have at least an idea of uh, the expenditure of resources and to provide you know information to you know forums like this. Hmm? Um, I do have another question um, in preparation again of our next item. If you can explain what our current process when we get a, a call and there's a, an individual that we need to send staff, I know Street Plus, they do a great job approaching um, individuals. What is our process right now? When would we do uh, when we approach the individuals and what can we do to help them? Um, and can we enforce any laws or rules on them You know, for if, if we do and we don't have a shelter? Well, that's a great question. Uh, thank you, Council Member. So um, right now, um, obviously, Street Plus approaches them, right, with our holistic humane approach that, uh, uh, you know, we w really want to get to know the people and connect with them, build trust. I mean, those are all the important aspects. Uh, what's important, uh, though, to have our own infrastructure um, is, you know, we've done a lot of placements, right, 160 to date since the program started in March of 2019. Uh, but obviously those were all outside of Burbank. And of course it would help to uh, have our own infrastructure uh, to have people places for them to go, okay? Because Street Plus has a robust engagement, uh, but it'd be nice to have uh, outlets. And some of those people would like to stay in Burbank and we would like to uh, continue to help them here in Burbank. Um, so yes, it is important to uh, have some of this uh, infrastructure. And, and last but not least, as we know, that uh, with the Ninth Circuit Court's uh, ruling, uh, the big aspect of how they felt is that you can't ask people, uh, you know, to move or do anything if you don't have some place for them to go, right? So, uh, and it's going to be interesting to see what happens with the Grant Pass case. It's coming before the Supreme Court on the 22nd of uh, April, at least that's when it's scheduled. So, I think we're ahead of the curve. Uh, by all these plans and these things that we're going to put in place to help our most vulnerable, and overall it's going to help the uh, community. Mr. Mayor, if Please. I could supplement. So uh, Marcos Gonzalez, uh, 
who Simone made reference to, back in 2006, 2007, started talking about this continuum of care that we were going to try to create. And back then, all we had was an agreement with Glendale to, to use their shelter. Um, we didn't have anything. And now we have um, resources, we have an approach, we have a task force, uh, we have many ways to deal. And this is uh, a, this report that you received this evening is really a description of how full that is. The next item, which I won't go into, um, though, is part of that continuum that the city has been building for almost 20 years. Uh, and so it's uh, the council is really to be credited for backing um, this uh, goal of providing robust services. Um, uh, council has really put resources behind that. Um, and so to, to answer um, uh, Council Member Mullen's last question, we don't um, address the unhoused uh, uh, from a criminal perspective because we do or don't have shelter. We address, uh, to Captain Kremen's point, we address crimes that are being created because crimes are being created or cr crimes are being perpetrated um, whether or not the individual is homeless. If it's a drug crime, they're being um, contacted because there's a crime, um, not because they're homeless. Um, the, the encampments are dealt with based upon human uh, public health and safety. Um, and so there is a sensitivity to people being unhoused and the attention is paid to um, uh, to Mr. Newman's point, to provide services, but um, they're not just kind of swept along. We're attentive to what the conditions are and whether there's a, a public health safety aspect. In one case, we were planning a, a cleanup activity with multiple departments uh, based upon uh, a concentration and the amount of potential combustible material that was being amassed in an encampment, and it actually burst into flames before we could actually conduct the cleanup. Uh, this was under the Burbank Bridge. Uh, it was also not only under the Burbank Bridge, um, but was also next to some of our critical infrastructure. So we were addressing it based upon certain criteria, um, not whether or not we had services. We were trying to deal with people uh, for their service needs, but again, it was the public health safety. So there is a committee that meets regularly um, but I just want to point out, you know, there's a lot of talk about the Grants Pass case and what's going to happen. But I think regardless of that, Burbank has had a very successful program from my perspective that we haven't relied upon that bright line that the courts, fuzzy line that the courts laid down um, because we're not looking at whether we can exercise some criminal enforcement measure based upon their status. If there's a crime, then uh, we'll take action on the crime, and they may or may not happen to be, you know, housed. So, um, in my mind, you know, the court will come down with a decision, and this council will make uh, a responsible decision on shelter, and that may or may not have an effect. But I think we'll still treat crimes as crimes, and uh, we will also try to match services to people that need them. And if we can provide increased robust shelter options, then um, that will be all the better for it. Yeah, go for it. Question um, for staff. Will, um, would, will the city receive additional funding from Measure H if we do have a shelter in the city versus not having a shelter? So one of the things that we will be doing if council decides to move forward is we'll be having conversations with LASA because LASA offers a certain amount of funds to pay for beds and for safe parking. It's a set number and they, um, they change it every year. And so one of the things that we'll be asking for is that funding. Does this relate to the next item? We should probably Do you want try to, to draw a line here and finish the current item. Yeah, I'll, 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 
Miss McFarland, I'll allow you to answer, but we can just keep it very general, not sure. specific to any site, and then obviously save any other commentary for the next item. Sure, sure. So it, 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 to sum it up, there would be funds through LASA, the LA County Housing Authority, and so they pay a certain amount for beds and safe parking spaces. And so that would be one of the considerations that we would have, and we can talk about that more in the next item. Great. All right. Any other questions? Or co okay. Uh, Vice Mayor. Just really quick to Simone's point, it is literally per bed per space. So we haven't had anything that we can apply for. So let's go get that funding. Um, few questions. One thing that I was wondering in, in our plan, is there anything that we have planned to around the homeless count in, in having conversations with LASA about the fact that it's always done in January on a cold night and this year it was raining. I, it irks me every time because there are concerns about are we getting an accurate number? And I'm not saying that we will 100% sure get an accurate number if we're doing it in sunny, like warm California conditions, but we know that the rain, the cold, tends to shift people around. And from the count, I wouldn't know if that's increase, a decrease, right? So have, have we advocated in that sense, or do yeah. we have plans to? So a couple of things. Every year we tell them we don't want to do it at this time, and it's always on a Tuesday night, which is a council meeting night. Um, and we've told them every single time, and they've said, well, we're assigning you the night that you get assigned. The other thing that I wanted to bring up is that they have, um, they have sh told us that they realize that the, the count is statistically inaccurate. It's only accurate at the higher level, at the county level. At the city level, it's not. And we've known that for years. We've said that for years. And now they're finally saying, agreeing with us. Our, our perspective is that eventually we want to know, we want to know every single homeless that's in our city, where they are, what their names are, and have our own internal count. So that would be the thing that we would love to do in the future. How we get there is it will take us some time because we have to continue to um, upgrade our outreach and then our monitoring and then the way that we track our th items. So we're, that's one of the goals that we have, the internal goals that we have. So we can tell you 200 names of people and where they are. That's amazing to hear. And wow, progress. I'm glad LASA is acknowledging that it's incorrect. Um, okay. My second question is, you mentioned that staff is attending some regional meetings and have been participating in some things. Can you give me some examples of what those regional meetings are? Sure. Another great question, thank you. Uh, so first of all, the um, SPA2 care coordination meeting that we had, uh, attend on Thursdays, and uh, so uh, our Street Plus outreach team is there. Um, we also uh, participate uh, with the COG, San Fernando Valley COG, and we did, there's a, a homeless meeting that we uh, participate in. Um, we also uh, participate in a meeting with the uh, CEO's office of the Board of Supervisors of the county. Um, so that's just to name a few, but there's several meetings, so we have a jam packed calendar. That's helpful. But, it, but it's worthwhile, you. of course, to interact that's with all helpful. these. That's helpful. I'll see you at the spot two meeting. <laughs> um, my my third question is: so I know in our um, in our goals it mentions that our goal is twenty five spaces of safe parking. I know we discussed that last time when we talked about safe parking and changing that or, or looking at a different starter goal. I know this gets a little bit into the next agenda item, but I'm more asking about this. If we're looking at fourteen spaces for um, um, for that that site do we have plans for another 11 spaces somewhere or are we changing the metric we'll talk about this but more in the next item but it has been the 14 spaces are dependent upon how much space we have and how much space it would take so if we wanted to up those spaces then we would need to find some additional areas which could be possible um, we just have to do some more research 
Got it. I'm just more curious about the metric it, itself. Like, is is mm-hmm. would we be okay with that? And just that's the final because we're not looking at anywhere else. Are we exploring other? What, one of the things that we'll have to look at at the end of the day is what makes financial sense and what can we afford. So that'll be one of the other considerations. And we can talk about that. I don't want to. I don't want to get in trouble with our city <laughs> attorney again. We, we all do eventually. It's okay. <laughs> Um, and then my last question, which I promise won't get you in trouble with the city attorney. Um, can you describe a little bit in action 4.6 about housing stabilization aftercare for voucher holders? Is it all HALA services or are there other services? And can you just walk me through that process a little bit? We have, we have two programs and, um, I'll let Mr. Newman chime in, but we have two programs. One is through HALA for the emergency housing vouchers. And then we have one through Hope of the Mission for the permanent supportive housing vouchers. So we have two different people that work with them. Yes, our Burbank Housing Authority, you know, uh, recognized uh, that, you know, it's, it's fine to give people vouchers and to put them into uh, units. But uh, after what they've been through to get there, right, generally, there's a, a lot of under, underlying issues that need to be addressed. So uh, they uh, took a opportunity to uh, find a way to fund to, so we could have our own aftercare, so we could provide those people with case management. Uh, so Home Again LA has helped with the navigation to get them into a place, and then Hope the Mission uh, helps to stabilize them so they can maintain that housing. Love to hear it. Um, one more, sorry, two more questions. Um, what kind of service requests are we getting on 311? Is it generally just reporting of individuals and places, or is there anything in particular that we're getting? Um, can I get a breakdown? No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, another great question. So the 311 service is really taken off. I mean, people are really using it, right? And I hope that's the same for uh, other departments as well, which I'm, I'm sure that's the case. And most of the calls are just when somebody sees somebody homeless. Um, and so it's a compassion 311 saying, hey, I see this person at this loca- location. Um, uh, those are the, mostly the calls. And we respond to each and every one of them. Uh, but occasionally we get a call with more detail. Um, that uh, and sometimes people are sending pictures um, and that require obviously not only for the Street Plus outreach team to get involved, but the Met team possibly to get involved uh, and one of our other uh, departments or our partners. Um, so it's working out really, really well. But most of the calls, I would say, are ones where they see somebody uh, just passing through or you know sitting at a bus stop and the concerned citizen wants to report it. And uh, we're very happy for all that information. Great, thank you, and and I love to hear that as well because it gives us as a city the opportunity to really triage and and send the appropriate team out there. So I'm really glad that exists. And folks at home, if you're watching at this time, download the 311 app on your phone. Um, you can find it in any of the app stores. <laughs> uh, my very last question, thank you, Mr. Mayor, is. Um, when you talk about the opioid fund use, I know you mentioned a few of, we have one of the, the French school and then um, the FSA. Have we talked to the school district about this? Do we have any plans for the future of them? We actually did um, ask the school district if they wanted to participate. And at the time, they were not unable to. So we will reach back out to them next year when we renew the plan. Thank you. That that's yeah. That's really interesting because you know it's ongoing for the next twenty years. So, I I would be surprised if they don't want to get involved eventually. We can take the kindergartners and they'll graduate before we're done. Right. And and <laughs> I, just given our last meeting, we heard there are issues, unfortunately, with drug use at our schools. So, you know, it would behoove them to get involved. Um. That is. Those are all my questions. I swear. Great. All right. Thank you, staff. Uh, great report. Um. Really quick, Homeless Advisory Committee. So you'll be coming back to request a council liaison in May. Uh, I take it we're somewhat close to forming that committee? Yes, we have a report that we're putting together on that. Uh, We'll outline some some ways that we think, as far as staff goes, it would work, how often they'll meet, who would be involved, um, the types of people that we would want to recruit, 
and we really would like this committee to be a working committee, not just a policy committee, but somebody that a group that actually goes out there and gets their hands dirty and works with us. And so we're going to talk about composition, all that in May when we Correct. go for the day. Correct. Hey, maybe that's something I should serve. I'm kidding. I'm just making sure you're awake. Just making sure you're awake. All right. We'll get you on a commission sooner or later. <laughs> Very good. That's a, a, I got to be the butt of this joke, right? Um, no, in, in all seriousness, um, great report. Um, you know, I'm not going to repeat anything my comment, my colleague said. I, I guess the only comment and kind of question, and maybe Mr. Newman, you're the best person to address it, but I open it up to anyone. Um, there seems to be a concern in the community that, you know, I've heard this phrase, if we build it, they will come. There's a concern that by building more infrastructure, you're attracting some unwanted element to Burbank. I think that that's a very outdated mode of thinking. Um, I, I guess it's a comment, but I'm asking for your expertise, Mr. Newman, and anyone else who wants to weigh in. Um, Notwithstanding the, the numbers, which we don't even have officially yet for this year, we had two years back to back of downward trends in our unhoused population. And at a time when we're seeing skyrocketing rates across the county, it would seem to me that we are finding success by making unprecedented investments, especially at the site of the safe. Um, and so I guess, Mr. Newman, from what you've seen and heard on the ground, is that your assessment as well, that these investments are actually producing positive results for Burbank, as opposed to some who might characterize it as negative. I would agree with that totally, yes. I think these investments, like I said, or like I said earlier, are, are keep us ahead of the curve. But most importantly, we're helping people, and we're giving them an outlet in the place in which we can do so. And uh, I don't believe um, that uh, if you build something like this, it's going to attract more homeless people. Because quite frankly, the people who are, as they would call, service resistant or don't want to uh, be involved in, in the system or participate in improving their life are not going to come to Burbank or any other shelter for that matter. But it will be there for those that we really want to help and, and get them off the streets. And so I think it's, a, it's an excellent investment. And I think the combination of the way that we're doing it, right? I mean, we already started with safe storage. We have a shower program. Uh, obviously, you know, we're talking about tiny homes. Uh, we're talking about safe parking. So we're kind of having a, a, a various solutions that are going to cater to those needs of those individuals. And then from there, they can work with case management staff that can help them get to a, a better place. So uh, I, don't, I think doing it is actually going to uh, help the community and, uh, and, of course, help the homeless people as opposed to not doing it. Great. And, Mr. Newman, thank you, and thank you to all of staff for a comprehensive, comprehensive presentation and in your discussion of it tonight for not letting us lose sight of the fact that we are talking about human beings, people in our community, and people that need help. So I want to thank you all for your sensitivity and attentiveness to that. Colleagues, any other questions or comments? Yeah. Just one last comment. Um, I spent a lot of time going to other cities, uh, going down to the County Board of Supervisors, and talking about homelessness and the right way to do it and the wrong way to do it. There are cities out there that, to the city attorney's point, really delve into that gray area on what is legal and what is not. They push the limits of Boise. They lead with sweeps. They implement um, far more 5150s than could ever possibly be imagined. And, and now with Care Court, it's being used as a, a blunt instrument um, uh, out there beyond our borders. And what we do here in this city is so radically different than what we see in our neighboring communities. And frankly, uh, most places in this country, um, I am very proud of the work that we do the reason I'm able to speak to these other communities is because I bring our record with me and I show them, I say, look, this is the way it can be done. It is successful, it is humane, it is cost effective, and it works. It works. Um, we're doing the right thing here and I appreciate all the work that you're doing and, and it's, it's, it's incredible to see and um, I'm, I'm very proud of, of everything that we've accomplished. Great. Any other comments, questions? It's a note and file. Y'all get an A plus for the year. Good job. See you next year. All right. The final report to council this evening is the contemplated adoption of a resolution declaring a shelter crisis in the city of Burbank. 
approval to create a shelter and housing accessibility through development of a homeless solutions center located at 32 sorry 323 and 333 south front street and 10 verdugo avenue in the city of burbank and approval to request three million four hundred and fifty thousand dollars from the burbank glendale pasadena regional housing trust miss simone mcfarland mr newman welcome back please present the report we are doing a double header tonight before you go on, Ms. McFarland, can yes. I get a motion to extend past 11 so we don't have to interrupt her? Second. Okay, I heard uh, Mullins and Anthony. You're going to get there next time, don't worry. Um, all in favor, hands. Yep, 5 0. Fantastic. Proceed. Great. So we are now going to be talking about the Homeless Solution Center, and I will take my presentation. So tonight we have three items to discuss in this area. The first is staff's recommendation to select 323-333 South Front Street, commonly known as the Hollywood Piano Building, as the preferred site for the Homeless Solution Center. The second is a request to adopt a resolution declaring a shelter crisis. And the third is to approve a request asking the Burbank, Glendale, Pasadena Regional Housing Trust for the funding of this center. So as you've already heard tonight, developing a homeless, center, so homeless solution center is a goal within the count, council's approved homeless plan. This falls under strategy three and strategy four as the proposed site would include both tiny homes and safe parking as well, as well as incorporating the existing safe Burbank's homeless storage center. As part of the process, council will need to remove Lincoln Yard as a possible site. Staff is recommending that this action be based on the comments received at the last council presentation that the site was too close to residential. It would be very expensive to connect to the sewer system and it may be suited to better uses. The recommended preferred site is located at the corner of South Front Street in East Verdugo. As noted before, it would include the existing safe, which is often uh, and is often called the Hollywood Piano Building, and a portion of the Metro parking lot on the other side. All of this land is owned by the city. Staff has been working with an architect and engineering firm and talking to city uh, internal city departments. The site proposes approximately 26 tiny homes that would be used for adults only and are presently proposed to be located within the existing parking lot between the building and the safe. In the pie-shaped area on the right of the diagram, yes, right. Um, currently, each of these units would include a proposed bathroom and shower along with air conditioning and fire sprinklers. The type of these units may change depending upon the cost and our ability to address physical concerns, including fire and EMS access, along with incorporating the proposed bike lane that goes along this route in front of the, the whole site. At the end of this process, the site plan may vary as we continue to look at solutions to mitigate all of these concerns. So we may be flipping, we may be moving around slightly, but this will give you a good idea. The tiny homes would be prefabbed buildings with each unit um, about 200 square feet. And as mentioned before, there are approximately 26 units on the site. The product um, that has been used, that we're recommending would be Connect Homes, and it's been used in various other projects and meets code requirements. To the left of the proposed site, uh, safe parking, the current Shower and hygiene trailer from the safe would be moved to the safe parking area. There would be overnight staff located here along with staff within the existing building monitoring the tiny homes. Operations hours would be approximately 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. They must leave during the day. Um, safe parking participants must, may have access to the building at designated times for activities such as laundry and meetings. Staff does not recommend allowing RVs here as they add a whole nother complexity to the safe parking. If council desired this, we would um, ask that it be phased in. Moving to the center, within the building itself, there is proposed, uh, proposed to be a seating, dining area, reception, private offices for caseworkers and service providers. In the left section of the building, the side that housed the old Hollywood piano was 
where it was located would remain vacant at this time and be used for a phase two proposal. In the future, this could include other service providers that focus maybe on medical needs, substan substance abuse, and or mental health. There was a consideration for apartment style units within this old uh, building. The problem was that to achieve this, the units would need two points of ingress and egress. This would constitute that we would have to install windows for each one, and we could only add units around the edges of the building. The inside has a two-story ceiling. It's about 20 feet high. Um, so these units would also need roofs, and they would have to, we would have to drop down the fire sprinklers to make those work. Uh, lastly, the building doesn't include an elevator, so if in the future we'd use it for something else, we may need to add an elevator. When talking to potential service providers, staff was informed that we need approximately 50 beds to make it, the project financially feasible. We're right at that number, and we're able to fit all that we need for the tiny homes outside, so this will save the inside of the piano store for a future use that could include those services. Here are some conceptual designs um, that provide an idea of what the site could look like from the outside. As you see, there's a green screen along the entire project site. The bike lane that is shown here is a separate project um, that's currently under design and we'll run across the front of the building and then turn on to Verdugo. We wanted to ensure that the Homeless Solution Centers would incorporate a gateway fill as the Front Street I-5 on and off ramps are located across the way. So here is a couple of renderings. There's another one here. It's looking um, from the other side. This one is from the freeway. And then this one is from the freeway at night. It would have a LED um, light. So with uh, any project, you'll hear various opinions and concerns. If the council approves moving forward with the site, staff will work to mitigate these concerns ahead of time within the design and with the selected service provider. The service provider will be required to have someone on site 24-7 resolving problems as they occur. Staff has focused on designing a smaller facility that still meets the financial requirements of the service provider in our Burbank community. To ensure that the Burbank homeless have access to the facility, we would include a catchment zone. The catchment zone is an area where certain people would receive priority. Our proposed catchment zone would be the city of Burbank, and while we could take people from outside the city if there are empty beds, we would focus on those with a Burbank relationship. All participants would be required to be referred through the Home Homeless Management Information System, HMIS, or the Continuum of Care, COC system before they entered. This means that there would be interactions between them and an outreach person, typically one of ours, before entering the tiny home. Additionally, they would need to be considered as a good fit for tiny homes first. For example, some people may be referred to other types of assistance or rehabilitation before. Lastly, residents would need to meet all of the strict rules that are required for transitional housing. Most participants would be here from 90 days to six months and as they look for permanent housing. Additionally, participants would have to continuously meet the rules, such as not being intoxicated or under the influence, and they would need to work on bettering the situation while they are living in these tiny homes. When we look at other similar projects, we learn that calls for emergency service range between one to three a week, and the police department calls average one a month. While this may seem a lot for one site, we must take into account the number of calls for homeless services we already have around the city, and hopefully some of these people would be housed at the site and the calls for service would decrease because they would be oversight all of the time. Overall, the Homeless Service Center offers our homeless along with our law enforcement and outreach teams another tool. If we have open beds, it better enables us to offer to take a person off the street and place them in a safe environment. The same goes for the safe parking. If someone is sleeping in their car near a park or neighborhood, safe parking will offer them a place with restrooms and showers. 
While we would not like to place families in, these in the tiny homes, families could use the safe parking, but it would be our preference to have them work directly with HALA, who's shown a capability to get families stabilized very quickly. The Homeless Solution Center also allows Burbank to do our part to help solve homelessness within our community and strive to reach an overarching goal to reduce our unsheltered population by 50% in fiscal year 27-28. Lastly, if council elects to move ahead, there would be a need for robust outreach to make the public aware of the project. We have planned community outreach events through the process, and this will help provide feedback and help us to mitigate concerns. As a part of the process, staff will use an issue an RFP to contract with the homeless services provider who would run the programs. Some of the requirements of the service provider would have to be an on-site manager 24-7, ensuring security and safety, along with helping people with social services, counseling, referrals, and overseeing the safe parking and storage access. We hope to bring this organization on soon so they can provide input into the design. As part of the request tonight, we're asking council to declare a shelter crisis. Proclaiming a shelter crisis is a specific term and the legal meeting is defined in the government codes 8698. It says a declaration of shelter crisis means the duly proclaimed existence of a situation which a significant number of persons are without the ability to obtain shelter resulting in a threat to their health and safety. By declaring the crisis, there are changes that would be implemented within our process. The declaration would enact appendix, appendix P, which is building codes that relate to the building of transitional housing or tiny homes. It also circumvents CEQA and zoning requirements, but not all environmentals. Because we would use um, federal funds for this project, we would still need a NEPA, and planning would re uh, request a health risk assessment. Additionally, because the shelter crisis could potentially end in 2026, we would want to ensure that all of our buildings could meet future uh, code standards. Without the shelter crisis declaration, the city could not build the homeless center as quickly as possible. We'd have to do a zone text amendment, full environmentals, and create building standards for transitional housing. Next steps would include completing the engineering drawings, community outreach, asking for funding from the Regional Housing Trust, designating a ca catchment zone, conducting environmentals, contracting with the service provider, and identifying ongoing funding for services. In regards to the Regional Housing Trust, the City Council would need to pr approve the request of the funds. The fund request then would go to the Regional Housing Trust Board for approval and then back to City Council for the acceptance of the funds should it be approved along the way. Staff would recommend that we conduct a community meeting once the site plans are solidified and then again when the construction plans are completed. We would come back to Council between these two activities to provide an update. The current timeline for the project to be completed, uh, to complete pre-construction efforts is the end of this year. In beginning of next year, um, end of this year, beginning of next year, and then entering construction in early 2025 with a completion date of early 2026. So to sum it up, tonight's request, we're asking council to approve the front street um, as a preferred site for the Homeless Solution Center, along with declaring an emergency shelter crisis and allowing staff to request $3.45 million in funds for the Regional Housing Trust. Um, this does not complete the process. As stated before, staff will have community outreach meetings and we will come back to Council as we move through. And that is my presentation. We are all here for questions. Well, thank you very much, Ms. McFarlane. Uh, I believe we do have some comment cards. So if you want to grab a seat, um, let's see. I have two cards so far. Um, each of you will get three minutes. Uh, first, we have David Donahue, followed by Joe Pimienta. Good evening, Mayor Schultz, Vice Mayor Perez, Council Members, and talented staff. My name is David Donahue. 
Um, 2022, I spoke to the dais about the safe parking issue. Um, at the time, there were some very significant concerns. We saw those manifested on Forest Lawn Drive with over, I think, approximately 100 RVs and cars parking, setting up camp, and the council member's district for the city of Los Angeles really didn't do a lot. It actually took uh, Sup Catherine Barger, supervisor for the Los Angeles County, to come down and clean that encampment out for the massive health and risk that were going on. I believe that what staff presented there was a lot of good information. One of the, the metrics that I took out of it was the fact and the need for doing internal counts. And that the counts that do happen on rainy days in January are not accurate. I would maybe, this is a comment and also kind of a question, is that any reference that the, the council members make about our numbers have gone down, is that related to the fact that that number is not accurate? and that we really don't know, or is there some other number that I missed? Because if I heard it correctly, if you reference a number that is inaccurate, what's the point? Until staff, and I really encourage this, you should go do the count yourself. That would answer the question. And without it, you don't know. I want to be very supportive of the METS team. I've met the METS officers, and I absolutely 100% will support as an individual and as in my capacity as an activist to have that person so it is seven days a week. We need to have it seven days a week, and we absolutely should. And I believe uh, the vice mayor has also supported that position wholeheartedly, and I would uh, be on that bandwagon with you. The count of these, so that safe parking has 20, 20, 14 stalls, and on the you can't see it because it's probably 0 .20 font. It says 26 vehicles. So I'm not sure if that's accurate, but my concern is that people are going to be attracted to the safe parking. They're going to be in the community because they get kicked out in the morning, they hang out during the day, and they come back in. I believe that uh, Council Member Tagahashi had, it was the first Council Member that spoke about what are the numbers, what are the reports, what's happening. I have faith in this Council that you will do just that. You will keep account. The Burbank Police Department is the best in the country, and they will be able to provide that data to you. And we will be, you know, as always, watching. So thank you very much for staying this late and doing the work, and thank you very much to staff for the report. Thank you for your comment. Next we have Joe Pimienta, and that is my final comment card. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members, staff, and everyone present still, and everyone still present here in the chamber. Um, I did spend a good chunk of tonight's meeting just reading the staff report, and uh, it's great. I, it's uh, it's a really good it's a really great report. Um, I also really agree with the recommendation to support this motion and to support the you know to, to support this. Um, as someone who walks around, I also do encounter like a lot of unhoused people, and as someone who, as you can tell, is very chatty, is also constantly you know conversing with uh, with uh, with unhoused residents of this city. Um, and it always kind of struck me a little odd that, like, within the conversation, you know, um, it kind of leads into like, hey, if you're looking for a shelter, I usually tell them about, you know, I usually tell them about Glendale. So having this project coming about, it also makes me excited. The next time that something like that happens, I can actually say that uh, Burbank will be providing with a solution for them that it's also accessible. Uh, not to mention that uh, if I heard it correctly, with uh, Hala open up in uh, Buena Vista around here, uh, wouldn't it be fantastic if there's also a mode of transportation to get from the Hala Center to the location? It's almost as if providing certain resources would actually help that. That would be great. Um, yeah, no, I mean, like, um, overall, like, I'm in huge support of, I'm in huge support of this. I mean, I also am a huge believer that, um, Providing shelter is one of the first steps to providing stability in someone's living, um, and that is pretty much what a lot of people want, you know, in general. Uh, and also, I just really do think that this can also just be like another way to just um, destigmatizing ho the homeless or unhoused residents with the association that there is with crime, which is also something that uh, I know a lot of people are working really hard to to inform, to, to put in place. Other than that, uh, thank you very much for this. This was very exciting. Uh, I'm glad that I finally got to read the report, and uh, thank you for your service, and I hope this goes forward. Thank you. Okay. 
Uh, that was my last comment card. Thank you both for staying late and giving comment. Uh, staff, would you like to give a brief response to the public comment we've received? Sure, just a couple of things. Um, the homeless count, while we know it is inaccurate, I will say it's the best that we have at this point in time. <laughs> It's what we have, uh, as we mentioned in the last item, our goal is to do our own and to know where everybody is at every single time in the name. Um, the second thing with uh, slide eight, um, I believe David Donahue was referring to this. Um, it does say that there are spaces for 26 car, 25 vehicles. Yeah, I read 25 for what it's worth. Sorry, um, I need my glasses. But that's okay. No, no, either way. Yeah, could you explain that, yeah. that note? So let me explain that. That's a, I'm glad you brought that point up. It would be um, that many spaces, but we would not park them next to each other. So, and could you speak to why you wouldn't park them next to each other? Because if you're sleeping in your home in your vehicle, it's very um, inconvenient if somebody is right next to you. Some of the homeless uh, want to have extra space around um, to feel more comfortable in there. It's kind of like if you were camping in your motorhome and you're right next to somebody, you open the door and their door is open too. It just it it doesn't feel right, right? You you feel like a little bit claustrophobic, and so that's why we would do it that way. Mr. Mayor, just to add, it's also best practice across across the county. It's what a lot of safe parking um, locations Great. have done. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. I'm gonna let staff finish their response and then we'll go to council comments. Um, I, I believe you were addressing Mr. Donahue's comment. Were there any other responses you wanted to share? That's it, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so now we'll go to questions uh, by, let's do questions first, uh, just to keep it orderly. Anyone have any questions for staff? No questions, really? Okay, who wants to go first? Councilmember Mullins, you're reaching for the mic, I think. Let's go. <laughs> We're just being polite and trying not to get called out, <laughs> but no dice. I, you know, Councilmember Mullins has a smile on her face. She's reaching for the mic. I want, well, I don't know if it's a question, but it's, it's a, it, it is to staff to talk a little bit about, um, we had a caller earlier that talked about substance abuse and talked about, um, bringing drugs and alcohol to the tiny homes and perhaps their vehicles as well. So can you talk about the rules and how um, staff or wh whoever the, the manager of the site will address these type of issues? How do we stop them from bringing these type of things into the, their place? So there are very strict rules um, within the tiny homes and the service provider enforces those rules. One of the things that a lot of the centers that we've gone to, they have um, lockers outside or right at the entrance. And if somebody has something that is not allowed within the homeless center, they can put it in that locker and before they walk in. But after they walk in, they are mandated to abide by the rules of the homeless center. And so if there are problems and they're not doing that, they will be um, evicted and told them that they can no longer stay there. Um, we've actually had some of the people that we've referred, I think earlier, um, Mitchell, Carrie Mitchell, right? He was, um, he was evicted from a few of um, the centers that we sent him in. And so that, that would be part of the process. Do they... Are, do they search the individuals before they walk in, or they ask them to voluntarily take what they have on them to put it in the locker? They, they know the rules when they come in. They sign a form that says these are the rules, and they have to voluntarily put it in locker. There's no search of them. So, But if they are caught, then they will be evicted, or some type of um, something will be done. So is, this is one individual per tiny home. Is it just one single bed? There or? are dual beds, except for in the ADA um, buildings in the tiny home unit. Those would be singles, but there would be dual beds. Now that doesn't necessarily mean we would fill those dual beds unless we needed them. Um, 
because that also um, sometimes causes problems when you have two people that don't know each other. But if we had couples, they could put both of those people in a, as a couple in, a, in one tiny home unit. And how do we prevent um, substance abuse in their vehicles? You mean if they have items in their mm -hmm. vehicles, that illegal items? I'm going to let Bob take that. Okay. So uh, basically you're speaking of the safe parking and how we, we would manage that. Obviously, you know, this, it's not a process of where we're going to search and go through their, their vehicles, but there, there are rules both in the safe parking and with the tiny homes in which that will be covered with the case managers as part of the intake process. They'll go over it. And most tiny homes and most facilities have you initial you know, as, as they're going through each and each uh, rule, so and so it can be explained and they can understand that. Um, as far as the tiny, the safe parking is concerned, uh, the rules can be enforced the, the same way. Like I said, there's not going to be any search and seizure type of things in the car, but they do have to abide by by the rules. And of course, the safe parking will come with security overnight, right? Um, to be able to sure to make sure they're safe while they're sleeping in the cars, as well as the rules are enforced. So the intake process is really, really important. Uh, the case managers, like I said, are, will will take people, they'll come through the HMIS, through the CES system. Obviously, there'll be a lot of information from that system that we, they can build off of and interacting with the, the client and making sure that they're the right fit for the facility as well. Thank you. And I know, um, I believe it was the same caller or somebody else that also mentioned the that individuals will congregate in front of the facility. Uh, they're not going to be leaving. They're going to be staying there all day so they can go back in the evening. Is there going to be strict rules about nobody stays there in, around the facility? So is yes, that part uh, of also signing and initialing that they need to leave? Or there's somebody going to be on hand saying, it's time to go look for, you know, perhaps go counseling or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever they were recommended to do? Yeah, well, first of all, the idea is when you get people into a facility, right, is to set a housing plan for them, a plan that they will transition out of tiny homes, uh, that they will, uh, and by doing that plan, obviously, you're going to have a schedule them for appointments and, and other support that they need, whether it's medical, mental, uh, whatever they need. Um, but I would call the attention to going by the safe now. You don't see people hanging out in front of the safe, right? Um, you know, as we mentioned earlier, uh, it was a shopping cart that we received a call on. Um, and as a Captain uh, Kremens alluded to, uh, there it doesn't appear to be an increase in calls. And we plan to maintain, even if the facility gets larger and we're providing more services, uh, such as tiny homes and safe parking, uh, we plan to have a lot more partners, too, uh, that are going to be involved. So. The nice thing about having that piano store is that we're going to have plenty of office space for a variety of services to meet the needs of those clients. And, but that does means that we're going to service them, uh, but they're not going to be hanging out in, in front of it. I'd like to call you, give you an example. Um, I have uh, some buildings that I was involved in the development and management with Skid Row Housing Trust, the new Genesis at 5th and Main, the new Pershing the Star Apartments at 6th and Maple. And to this day, uh, if you go by those buildings, except for people passing through, generally there's not a lot of people from the building hanging out outside of the building. That's part of the house rules, and that's all part of managing. And a lot of times people uh, just think about the inside of the building and what's going on, but actually uh, it's not only about the inside, it's also about the perimeter outside the building uh, for all the community members. So that's the same way we'd approach it here. Thank you. All right, thank you for those questions. Who'd like to go next? Councilmember Takahashi looks like she's raring to go. Yeah. All right, thank you for this presentation. Um, I had that same question, so thank you for asking it. Let's see. So um, we got an email. We got an email question about a concern uh, with. Uh, you know, this seems like it's out of the blue, but I want to make sure it gets addressed. That 
there's a, an increase in commercial break-ins and just kind of crime, petty crime in general. And there's a concern that a, a homeless center, homeless um, support center would, would increase the number of break-ins, would increase the number of petty crime. Is, is there any evidence from other cities or other places that having this kind of service then extends out to the community to incre increase crime data in general? Have you, have you noticed that? Or do you have any information about that? No, but maybe, um, I don't know if PD has anything. Captain Kremens, do shelters cause, oh. cause crime? Right. <laughs> Basically, that's, uh, thank you for the short version, Mr. Mayor. I think I know the answer, but <laughs> Dennis the Kremens again, uh, it's, uh, it's, it'd be highly speculative. I mean, yeah. we haven't done any studies. We'd really have to reach out to give you a fair answer. Yeah. So stay there for a second. Um, so commercial crime in general, though, do you find that there is any correlation with the homeless population and commercial break-ins in crime? I wouldn't say homeless. Uh, people who are drug addicted, certainly. Okay. And many of that, the homeless population do have addiction problems. So you could you can make that uh, argument, but uh, uh, we we don't look at it in those terms. We don't because somebody's homeless. Yeah. That's not how we track crime. Uh, as the city attorney alluded, it's okay. the the criminal act. It's the behavior we look at. Right. And then if somebody has other uh, you know substance abuse issues, that's a, a separate issue. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. I wanted to address that that concern. Uh, let's see. Um, you mentioned during the presentation that um, there was a consideration for a dorm or barrack style, but that wasn't going to be feasible for the reasons that you gave, especially with not having the privacy around uh, using a restroom and having a shower. Um, and But it looks like, but I, when I thought of tiny homes, I know I thought of like each individual separate home, but it looks like they're, they're tiny homes, but they're all connect. The, the model is they're all connected. So it's kind of sort of looks like a barrack in a way, but each individual unit will have the, everything they need in the unit. So from a, like a visual perspective or a con conceptual pers perspective, they're still all kind of cohesive together in the in the village, right? Am I getting it right? Yeah, they, they come in different sizes. You can do what we call two packs or four packs, <laughs> or I think they even have a six or eight. Um, but they come all in one building, and you select the number of units that you want within that building, and basically they bring a crane in and drop it in. Okay, great. Yeah, I had never seen that, that concept before, so I like it. Um, also, you had presented several versions of the Burbank and kind of some stylized frontage off the bike path and stuff. Um, I love that idea that's, you know, can, we, we've talked in the community about having a Burbank sign somewhere, and that's an example. So I hope Jess Talamantes, a previous council member's mayor, is watching because that's something that's been something for him. That he, and it was very important to him that the sign be seen from the freeway. So, and this would this would get both. So, thank you for including that. And also, it just it will be just a nice a nice visual for that area that right now doesn't have that really nice visual. So, kind of public art. Okay, a couple more questions. Grab my notes here. Oh yeah, um, you, men you mentioned briefly in the in the presentation a catchment zone designation. Could you expand a little bit on what a catchment zone designation is? Uh, yeah, so a catchment zone is something that uh, is established um, so that you get prioritize prioritization. Excuse me, it's getting late uh, to the individuals uh, within that community. Okay, and that's something that's been going on. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, you know the tiny home projects that have been built, right? They're council district specific in the city of LA, um, so that's a form of a, a catchment zone. Okay, great, thank you. And then I uh, just have a couple questions about the safe parking. So, um, do we have numbers? I, maybe you presented them, I didn't catch them. Do we have numbers right now of, of how many folks in our community are currently living in their cars? When we gave the last safe parking uh, report, we said we think that there's approximately 60 to 70 that are living in their vehicles every night. Okay. And do you know where, where are they parked? So if they're in our community every night, where are they? They're in a variety of uh, uh, locations. Um, mm -hmm. So there's not like a, uh, a huge amount in, in, in one area. But okay. generally we have them in some of the park parking lots, uh, some of the, the major the boulevards, um, and uh, they're in you know various places. Although I will say when we reported 60 to 70, 
Uh, that was a, a, a accurate number. We are down, uh, down to about 55 is what we're doing. So we, we do our own tracking. Uh, we're not as, not as formally as a point of time count, but we do have our outreach team that is, uh, you know, tracking, making contact. And uh, mm -hmm. so we do have a good idea what our numbers are, so. Okay, and we have received in the past some uh, concerned residents that they see someone sleeping in their car outside their home in a residential street or um, they're sitting in their car for a very long time and they're not sure what's going on. What is the process? So let's say, you know, you wake up in the morning and you see somebody sleeping in their car outside on your block. What's the process for addressing that? How, do, how does the uh, city approach those, those folks? Where do they tell them to go if they're, instead of being in front of the residential place? Well, whether they're in a makeshift shelter or they're in a car, the approach is obviously to uh, get to know them and uh, offer them services and, and see what, uh, what their needs are. Um, and so when we get the service call, via primarily it's going to come from 311, although we may still get a few emails. But either way, however way we get it, we do approach and go out there and engage with the individuals. More time and, uh, than not, we're finding out that, and that's why there is sort of, if there's going to be a bump up in our homeless numbers, we'll see what loss of reports. But it's probably going to be in this vehicle, vehicle dweller area. Mm -hmm. And that's why the safe parking will be very helpful. Because that, uh, uh, a lot of times we're approaching people that actually are, are just finding a, a safe place to sleep. They're going to go to the to uh, you know one of the fitness places, shower and clean up, and go to their job. You mm -hmm. know, um, so they're not generally uh, um, the uh, same tier of, of homeless people uh, that, that you might see in, in other type of settings where they're sleeping. So, but we approach them, and of course, uh, uh, you know, give them opportunity. Uh, we're finding that a lot of the vehicle dwellers are uh, coming now to the safe as well. Mm -hmm. So they are coming down to that to, to uh, get a shower, get some food, get some clean clothes, uh, and you know meet with our staff. And our uh, not only uh, is our Salvation Army, who's the operator, safe there, but also too we now have our our homeless service liaisons headquartered out of the safe. So mm -hmm. actually they're there as well to work okay. with the people. And again, it's it's the proposal is 14 parking spots in the safe parking lot. So that would still have 51, you know, oh, sorry, um, math, uh, 41 um, cars still in the community, people living in their cars in the community. So it wouldn't address the issue completely. It still would have a lot of folks still living in their cars in the community. Um, but would, it, would having those 14 cars there be helpful for your services and for reaching out to them in a more like efficient and cohesive way versus going to each where they're located at most definitely because even in the morning when it's time uh, you know for them to to move out of the safe parking their vehicle uh but you provide services right then and there uh, case management direction so we would have a case manager there early in the morning so there would be somebody to engage with them and and and, and meet with them and and sort of uh, plot and plan what the next steps will be to eventually get them out of that vehicle Thank you. Those are my questions, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We'll go to Councilmember Anthony, then Vice Mayor Perez. Um, the uh, great report. Thank you. Um, the signage that we want to put up, I was just, I'm looking at the photos. So you want to have a static sign that says Burbank and then at night an LED sign? Is that best proposed? It's, a, it's the same sign. It's just lights up at night. Oh. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. And, and we great. could use our imagination. We could say, welcome to Burbank, or Burbank's great, or brought to yeah. you by Burbank. Or, or a big beer. Your Burbank imagination goes it. wild. Media capital of the world. We can, you know. Thor's okay. hammer on the roof. Thor's hammer. One giant Thor's hammer. Um, <clears throat> yeah, no, I've been watching this come together for a very long time. I actually don't have any questions. All right. Uh, Vice Mayor Perez, you're up. I got questions. All righty. Um, in line with some of Councilmember Takahashi's questions, talking about the units, I think it is no secret that I've shared with everybody here that I'm not the biggest fan of tiny homes. I'm shocked, actually. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm sure you're not. Um, so my introduction to tiny homes as a caseworker was essentially the shed setting. 
right? And as we've developed as a society, as a county, there are now over seven sites throughout the county. Um, we've seen the differences where a tiny home can really be anywhere from a shed without a restroom with an eight by eight square footage, which many of our unhoused individuals understand that that is smaller than a jail cell. And it has been a talking point for many of the individuals on the street. So my question to staff is, because these are looking like they're more on the prefab home side with their own shower and their own bathroom, what is the square footage inside each individual unit? So w when we looked at the square footage for a t what we call the two pack, so two units is 400 uh, square feet for both. But what that includes is a little bit of an area for um, some, it's like a storage kind of area where they put some electronics and electricity and stuff like that in there. So I believe that they're a little bit smaller than that. So about 200 square feet, but a little bit. 160, 180, right around that. What about the other ones? I know you said that was a two-pack. What about the... It, they're about the same. Okay. They run about the same. Okay. And they, for sure, we are looking at options with restrooms and showers inside. We have been. We've also looked at um, options without those. Um, obviously, the showers and restrooms will be more expensive because we'll have to run sewer and um, water underneath. The... Um, Sorry, I just lost my train of shot, thought. So, yeah, they'll be a little bit more expensive to do that. So, but we have been looking at that. That was the original concept to add those. Um, I have, I, you should be aware that I've talked to some service providers because I've had some questions about will those showers and the toilets be clogged up all the time? Will they cause a, a service problem? Um, I brought it up to one of the service providers the other day. He said possibly, but maybe not. Um, so it's a there's a pluses and minuses for each one right and that goes back to folks following the rules it really depends and and quite frankly with the rule following it's for the well-being of themselves and others living there um, but but I do emphasize that and really want to note that in my questions because we have to consider cost but also the viability of the project itself Folks are more likely, and this is, goes for anybody, even if you're housed, unhoused, you're more likely to want to be in somewhere that looks like it is a home, right? And the more we get to shed, the less likely folks are going to want to take the beds. The more we get to a single unit, the closer we get to folks wanting to stay in there. And I, I feel like at concept, we shouldn't be hindering ourselves. Um... I also have a question about the rendering overall. So would we keep the piano store? Or would that be demolished? Where where do they, the tiny homes go in relation to the piano store? I'm a little confused about that still. So, so the way we currently have it configured, and it may change because we are having problems trying to incorporate the bike lane and the access for fire. But the way that we currently have it configured is that the tiny homes would go in between the very point where the safe is now and the existing building. So if you're starting from the very corner where the safe is, you would have tiny homes and then you would have the building. The building would remain. And then on the other side in the Metrolink parking lot, you would have the safe parking on that side. That, that in the future may flip depending on... Um, the physical requirements and being able to get fire in there and say be safe. We were having a lot of discussions about can fire get into there when it's right there at the turn, and if there's a bike lane there also with um, some K rail, how do we do that? Mm -hmm. So that that diagram may flip a little bit. Okay, and that that's good to know and. In, in any diagram where it flips, is the building staying, or is there a universe where the building is? No, we have the okay. building staying. At some future, you know, 10 after I retire, <laughs> <laughs> the council may want to come back and take down that building and build affordable housing there, or homeless housing, or, you know, a permanent supportive housing in that site. 
it really would depend. But the, at this point, the building would stay. And if I could just clarify, that decision was made because the building is not usable in its present state, and we want to use the money for the actual housing, and that's really a second phase. What to do? Can can it be repurposed or uh, aside from just offices for service providers? Uh, so that's, it's, can yeah, it, phase two. Can it currently be used as office space for providers? Or is, is that like the idea? Or is that's that like the plan, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It can be. Okay. That's what Mr. Newman said. Great. So that is what I was trying to gather. And I think that's, that's great, especially as a starting point, because it's, again, better to have indoor services than outdoor services. Well, and just to clarify that, you know, the building's basically two sides. One is the old piano store side, which is the high ceilings, um, oh, pretty much open. There's some, some offices in there already. But the other side is offices currently. So there's a small kitchen in there. We would add laundry facilities in that side. We would add some bathroom facilities in that side. And then the um, service provider that we have would do meetings in that area. So those offices would be used on the, the side closest to the safe. Okay, great. Um, other questions I have. I know uh, Councilmember Takahashi started asking about the enclosement type, you know, like having a brick and mortar building. And I think if I could offer staff some feedback. Last time when we talked about this i think we were just talking about the the housing plan in general but but we were asked about our thoughts and feedback about this i asked about having an actual building and what that would look like and i i understand that we are leaning away from that because of the feasibility but it would have been still nice to know and i i feel like council member takahashi shares that opinion given her questions what the number of units would have looked like in there more in-depth information about why that's not feasible, right? Because it's very different to see you are going to have eight rooms versus the 26. So that would have been helpful, I think, at this point, while we're, while we're really in the conceptual phases of this. We, we do have some drawings that we initially did on the inside. I'd have to go back and look to see how many we had in there, but we can send that information to council. Thank you. I would appreciate that. It, it really helps me as somebody who, it, it helps me when speaking to community members and, and for myself, right, as, as somebody who works in this field, I want to make sure we are getting the best possible service space for the money that it's going to take, because no matter what we put in here, it's going to be a large sum of money. And obviously, the best is always an, a, you know, supportive housing type setting that looks more like a home. So when when looking at this, I want to make sure that if that's not possible, I have very specific reasons why and if that's number of units yeah so just forwarding the information to council is could create brown act problems so if council wants that information they should provide direction and it should come back before the council so they can see it mr um, mcdougall i have a procedural question um could that information, if requested, just be sent home as a sent home report? Obviously, we couldn't discuss it unless somebody wanted to agendize that. Uh, it could it could go as as just an informational piece to council. Um, I hear the vice mayor saying that her consideration would be more meaningful if she had it at the time she was asked to vote. So what I'm saying is that's different than just show me what you looked at later after we vote tonight. You know what I mean? So how about this? And then I know, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, I'm going a little out of order here because we're still in questions, but when we're looking, cause I, this obviously has to come back again with other, you know, as we move forward in the process, if the next time this comes before us, you could just add a brief section again with why it, it could even be the same language, why you're not adding the, the brick and mortar space, with a drawing, those drawings included. That would have been helpful this time around, and if we could just re-include that again for the benefit of me, my colleagues, and the public the next time it comes back. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm getting uh, indication from staff that that's something you're all willing and able to do? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, those are all my questions. The rest I have are just comments. See, I do follow the Great. rules. <laughs> 
Yeah, Council Member, go. follow up to that? Please. The brick and mortar, um, it's mentioned in here that that would potentially be part of a phase two program. Was that always phase two, or did that come out of looking at the funding and the timing? So when we originally brought um, this site, well, we actually brought Lincoln Yard in the to the council, and the council wanted to look at this site also. And so some of the direction was to, to create a site that had about 25, to 25 buildings or 50 beds, and to look at both options of tiny homes and the interior. And so we did do both. We looked at both, and we thought, well, we can get the exterior with the tiny homes. We can get that amount of beds on the outside. And so it could either be a phase two for the future, or it, it could be something different. Um, OK, well, then I, I, would like, I would like to have at least some of that flushed out. Um, let's see what phase two is have some potential options when we come back so we know what it looks like so we so something to look well, at um, I, I'm not the most experienced in the room on this subject but there are different housing types mm -hmm. for different unhoused circumstances right there are emergency shelters which are like gymnasium was with, with cots the armory those sorts of things there is the safe parking, uh, which is part of this proposal. There's safe parking just automobiles. There's safe parking with RVs, which um, serve people who have cars that they need to you know, live with. And then there's this kind of tiny home concept. And I think there's different clientele for different form factors. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of our unhoused with pets have not been able to go to shelters because they don't want to leave their pets. People with substance abuse, I've seen them interviewed on the news. They refuse, in, in some cases, veterans who have services available to them, um, uh, I've heard them say, I can't go there because I can't follow the rules. In particular, uh, this one circumstance was a veteran. So I don't know if it's worth having a little discussion. Um, there are different types of housing products, and this site is amenable, right? Question of what we can do on this site presently uh, and what clientele those would serve. Uh, it's not really, it's probably not a great emergency shelter site for the same reasons. Well, we're not being asked to vote on any of the phase two stuff. All, all I'm no, but you were asking for options, and I'm not. So staff needs direction as to whether to proceed with this mm -hmm. and seek funding for this. If you're going to want to see other options later, then there's no, there might be no point, and maybe you need to ask staff that, in bringing back options, because if you're going to change your vote or change the project, then they're not going to be able to proceed with the housing oh, trust to request money. I see what you're saying. Okay. And for clarification, Councilman right. Anthony, what I was asking for is for comparisons of what they're consider what was considered in that brick and mortar space for phase one. Like I wasn't asking about phase two. Phase two is down the line. So can I ask, would that change your decision tonight? Because if it would change your decision tonight, then we don't want to get too far down the line of moving forward with this project and then have council say, no, we don't want tiny homes. We want it all interior because that means we have to go back to the architect. We basically have to start over and, and then bring it back to council. So uh, I think I ask, we need some clear direction on that. Uh, Madam Vice Mayor, do you mean just the section that is the seats and the reception area? Is that what you're talking about? No, I was asking about the concept. So both council member Takahashi and I asked about what we were looking at in concept. To the city attorney's point, there are different types of settings, right? We're not looking at a congregate shelter. This was always going to be a non-congregate site, mm -hmm. right? That was interim housing for folks. There are different types of settings even there. There are motels, there are non-congregate shelter spaces that look like dorms, if you've ever gone to the LA Family Housing Campus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there are tiny homes, and then within tiny homes, there is a wide variety. If you go to the North Hollywood site, there are tiny homes that are eight by eight and look like sheds and do not have bathrooms inside or showers or any of that and have porta potties outside. There are 
uh, on the other spectrum, the prefab home basic looking structures that were showed to us tonight that look more like, for lack of a better word, conjoined bungalows that do have a shower inside, that do have a bathroom inside, and do have a little bit more amenable space. So what I wanted to know in asking those questions is what we were actually going for. Because if I have to be honest, I am uncomfortable with the shed setting. I am more comfortable with the prefab home with a bathroom and a toilet setting. Well, and I think to your point, Vice Mayor, and to the city uh, attorney's point, I think that's the direction and the guidance that council, that staff is looking for from the council this evening. Am I mistaken? It is the guidance. And let me just add, if we look at doing the, the inside of the building and building that out, it's going to be very expensive, right? So at this point, I don't know if we have enough funding. When we did look at those numbers, I mean, we're talking about putting windows inside the brick. We're going to have to lower all those ceilings. Um, there are some other concerns with that building right now that we're addressing um, to make sure that it's in tip-top shape. But, and but, so, and, but that's the information that you'd like to see. So we want yeah. to make sure that we provide that so you can see that we vetted that out. Exactly. And I am comfortable voting with this and moving it forward, but I still would like that information, like I mentioned into the city attorney's point. If I am talking to a resident later, I want to be able to say, we went in this direction because the building, hypothetically, the building offered eight units and that's it. And we would have only been able to house eight to 16 unhoused individuals, depending on how many beds we had in there, versus the um, 26 to 49 folks, which is what we were aiming for, right? It gives us a little bit more to show the community as we go forward. And moving forward in those community meetings, also a good supplement as to why we went in the direction that we went in. So if I could clarify, you, you want the op, you want what was on the table at the time so that we see why this option was made versus what we're going to do next. Because I thought that's... I think they call this common core math. You have to show more of your homework. Right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Show the Okay. I see yes. where you're going yes. with that. Okay. All right. So, Ms. McFarland, is this something that we could do, assuming the council were to move forward and issue an affirmative vote tonight? Could we, I would recommend Vice Mayor Perez, because you might have those questions and you might want to be able to answer them sooner rather than later, that that be included as a take-home report item so that council has the information and then it could always be included in a subsequent report for further discussion. We could certainly include that in a weekly management report, then it's also public. So That's Great. outstanding. I, that would be my recommendation. That's why he's in charge. <laughs> um, All righty. Let's see. I feel like I had one more question. I don't have any more questions. Actually, I have comments. OK. Um, the only question I had really is, is about the timeline. Um, so you don't need to throw the slide up, but slide 18 was talking about the fact that you're hoping to complete the pre-construction efforts by uh, January of next year. So as you're going through the engineering design and you're, you're doing the community outreach, I would envision you're probably gonna have to come back to council at least once or twice. We're gonna have to talk about the catchment zone. It's probably not a formal design review, but I'm assuming you would want to come back at some point to share the the, the somewhat hopefully finalized uh, draft designs with the council for feedback. Is that what you yes. have in mind? So what we'd like to do is once we get the preliminary site plan laid out um, and talking with internal departments and everybody agrees that this is, this is feasible, then we would do community outreach and do a community outreach meeting, getting feedback at that point. After that meeting, we would come back to council and then we would do another community outreach meeting at the end showing what we came up with. Okay, so a total of, of two meetings with an opportunity for council feedback between those two meetings. Correct. And um, just just ballpark, sort of when would you hope to accomplish all of that? When would we hope, for example, to have the first community meeting? When are you hoping to come back to the oh, council? You're really putting me on the spot here. <laughs> <laughs> it's all up to Mr. Hess, I know. But if you had it's, uh, world's your oyster it, here. It's really up to how long it takes us to process the internal, to get the internal alignment of what the site's plan's gonna look like because we still have, we're still having meetings with fire. We need to continue to consider how that bike lane is going to change things. Um, we need to talk to BWP. It, there's a number of items that we need to make sure that we have in place before we do that initial outreach. 
Um, so I would say probably a couple months. And then, it, of course, it's going to depend on council's agenda because you guys have a pretty full agenda. It took us a while to get this, this item on. Okay. So Great. Given the late hour, I have no other questions. I'd like to move to uh, deliberation, if that's all right. Anyone want to uh, start? Oh, Mr. Prescott, you're still with us. How you doing? Mr. Mayor, <clears throat> members of the city council, excuse my voice. Um, it's okay you're here. Yes. Um, before you begin this, this phase, uh, just a few things. <clears throat> I want to make it clear to the council and to the community that the proposal we're making to you tonight, we don't take lightly. We know there's concerns about it. Uh, we also know that there are at least 250 homeless people in Burbank, many of them, most of them unhoused, some living in cars, and they're living in neighborhoods near parks. We get calls, we get complaints. The proposal we're making tonight is, um, there's a couple purposes. It's because um, it's, it's humane to ensure that our fellow human beings are sheltered and cared for. Uh, the other purpose is that it makes it easier for us to help people and enforce our rules legally if we have these options. We have a storage facility because people were storing their things on the street and in order to, on sidewalks, and in order to enforce the nuisance law that we have, we wanted to provide that option. The showers are there as a way to get people to come, right? It's an extra service because it's humane, but also because it's like, wow, I'm clean, what else can I do? Uh, the same can be said for the safe parking and the shelter of some type, tiny home, whatever it is. We heard, we heard you, Vice Mayor, less shed, more home. You know, we, we hear that. Uh, and we hear you, Mr. Mayor, your question is, when is this coming back? We're thinking probably summer. There's still some things to work out. Sure. Um, but we're pretty confident we can get to that next step by then. Simone and, and her team have been working hard on this, and I think we're almost there. So. Yes, did you have a question? I was just going to say, less shed, more house. That is a great marketing campaign <laughs> waiting to happen. to distill it here. All right. that, no, that's good. That's good. And, and, and we mentioned phases, and that's just a loose term. There's no plan for a phase. It's just kind of like we know we have this building, and it's a great asset. So while we're moving forward with this other stuff, let's think about in the near in the future not near future future um maybe there's a, another use for this building or maybe we get to a point where like oh man like like miss mcfarland said let's let's blow it out let's do permits for housing or or something entirely different who knows what the world will be like right in five ten years uh so i just wanted to kind of put that out there and the one other thing is the funding um the use of the housing the uh, burbank glendale pasadena housing trust money the purpose of that is because it is not restricted in the way our other housing funds are. So we're using the more restrictive money for the BHC. Um, for instance, we're going, to, we're going to propose that to you. Um, and so I just wanted to clarify that as well in case there was a question about why it wasn't going to be put aside for BHC. We're actually going to use it for proposing, excuse me, proposing to use it uh, for this project and, uh, and also for the Buena Vista project. So. Uh, if you have any questions, we can answer those, but I just want to want to put that out there before you started deliberating. Thank you, Mr. Prescott. Thank you. Um, I guess that does beg one question for the purpose of the resolution tonight. My question to staff is whether we're talking about the estimated 55 folks that are living in their vehicle or the uh, other portion of folks that are living out on our streets unsheltered, um, it would seem to me that we certainly don't have, as we sit here today, existing capacity to provide for all of those people. Am I mistaken, or would you say that's a fair statement? No, I think that's a fair statement. Then I think that that's justification for the uh, emergency finding. But why don't we go to deliberation? Uh, who'd like to begin? Councilmember Takahashi, mixing it up. Yeah, okay, I'll start it. Um, I'll be relatively brief. Um, I'm, I'm in support of this project. Um, there's still a number of details that are obviously need to be hashed out and um, we're gonna get reports back about that. Um, I also, am really important to me that the community outreach meetings happen, and at least one, if not two, online meetings to, to really get, make sure folks can get on it. Um, I'm, support, I'm in support of the safe parking as described in this meeting tonight. I'm also in support of the tiny homes, but I think because of the, I'm shifting my 
I'm shifting my perception of what tiny homes are after this conversation. I like the concept of basically like little studios that are all together. Maybe even shifting the name of them that's not tiny homes, that like Studio Village or something. I don't know. So, yeah, so it's more of like it, this is actually houses or small, small homes. Um, I think there's also a, a stigma on tiny homes. So that, that name may be coming up with our own. We have a lot of creative folks in our community. We could come up with a different name um, to really d describe it. For, uh, for both the safe parking and the studio home village, um, what's really important to me and then the community is th the management of it. That's clearly an essential part that when the failures we've seen in many of the other examples we've heard of, a lot of it from what I understand is about management. Of those of those areas, so it sounds like there's a really robust management plan, um, but just wanted to underscore that as well as security and security both from the perception of the community being secure and and not you know it's, it, as it is now it's very secure, but also for the folks who are living there and making them feel like they're secure as well. So that's very important to me. But I, I'm I'm in favor of this plan and I'm ready to move forward with all three of the staff recommendations. Wonderful, thank you. Who'd like to go next? Councilmember Anthony, you're reaching for the button. I am. Um, I agree with you, Mr. Mayor, on the findings. The number of people in this city, as well as the number of potential people mm -hmm. who need and desire um, this kind of shelter, uh, there just isn't. The, the capacity for um, Hope of the Valley or Ascensia to be able to take on our people, it's, it's, it's just not there. Uh, they have done a lot of uh, great partnership work with us, um, but it's time for us to realize that our folks need our help. And so just the sheer number, uh, I do believe the findings are there. And I'm in favor of the recommendations because we, we could have made these findings Years ago, years ago, um, you know, I've been I've been talking to community members. I've been talking to staff about this for over seven years now, about when and how and where and what type and the funding. Um, so it's taken us a long road to get here, and we still have a long road ahead. Um, but uh, I think it's coming together. Very nicely, very nicely. Thank you. Council Member Mullins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I, I am too in agreement that we should move forward with this. And um, like my colleagues, I'm sure when we're at an event or gathering, we get people approaching us and saying, what are you doing about the homeless um, issues? Despite what sometime we hear that our numbers have dropped, we, we because they're um, obviously in the community, in the downtown area, they're around our housing. To residents that live here in Burbank, they see the numbers increasing. Um, whether they actually, we have an actual count or not, but it's visible for a lot of people. So we have done a lot, I, I think, as a council, with um, the la the budget year that we um, 24-25, I mean, we increased staffing, um, and we now, you know, we have our two additional staff. We increase the street plus. We're doing what we can in order for us to provide assistance for the homeless population. Also, assure our residents that they that we are doing something. And this is in addition to what we're doing something. This is one more step to getting a lot of unhoused individuals into the system where it can assist them to become successful, hopefully, in the future and find them a home, find them a job, and uh, be able to assist them with um, uh, the mental health. So this is one additional step that we're taking. Um, I am too also very concerned about the management of of the facility. Um, I can't tell you and express the success of this program is going to depend on who we hire, 
who's going to oversee this program because we want to make sure that they will enforce the rules. Um, once the rules are broken and they know there is a way to break it, we're going to lose um, trust in our residents to believe in what we're doing is actually good for um, this this project that we're about to approach. Uh, community outreach is extremely important. A lot of people probably don't even know we're discussing this tonight because they didn't look at the agenda or they weren't aware. But we do need to let them know and give them a sense of security that we are doing, um, we will be doing our best to ensure um, that this area is not going to look like what they picture it to look like. Lots of you know, unhoused individuals just hanging around, drugs and crime and everything that we've been hearing. So I think it's important to get that sense of security from our residents and uh, to do as many outreach. I like the idea about doing online along with, you know, in person. Um, but I think this is the additional step that we're taking to do something about our homeless population. So thank you for bringing that report and uh, for the presentation. Thank you, Vice Mayor Perez. Thank you. And, and I know I'm, I'm harping on a lot of things tonight, but I think I, I want us to get the best product possible. And continuing on, on what Councilmember Mullen said, the success of this program is going to hinge on the management and the type of homes we choose to put in here. It is going to hinge on both of those things. I won't name names, but I do not want to see what we have seen in other areas where there's a tiny home village that is 50% empty because folks would rather sit in a tent waiting out to get into a motel. And I'm speaking from direct experience. I have had clients directly tell me I would rather wait the extra six months to get into motel. And the, when you ask why, because I haven't sat on a toilet in a year. Because it's a porta potty because it's a public restroom because it's something like that. So to Patrick's point, less shed, more home. That is the one thing that I'm hinging on because I want to make sure we are doing right by both the folks who this is going to serve and our community. I don't want to look back at our, our community and say, well, this is mostly empty because people don't want to go there. That's also failure. And so I'm just going to harp on that very much. And I, I love your idea. Studio Home Village. Like, let's take away whatever that negative connotation is of tiny home, whatever else we can call it, because these prefab homes also have a better connotation in general. Um, that, that's a very big sticking point for me. And I'm, other than, if those points are, are heard and listened, I am comfortable voting for this. I have one more piece of feedback for staff around the funds for from the housing trust. It's not so much, and Maribel, I appreciate you reaching out to me today, but my concern was not so much questions today. As the member of this body that sits and represents the city of Burbank on the housing trust, I would like a heads up more than the day of or more than in, in the report. I want to have an ongoing conversation with staff about what funds we're going to be asking for from that body so I can represent our city well. So I would like in the future a heads up and I would like to meet with you all in the next week to talk about how we're going to utilize that funding. So that's my only piece of feedback, not, you know, pointing fingers at anybody, just in general with staff. I would love that so that I can go represent this body really well there and so I can run those meetings well when I become the chair shortly. <laughs> So um, that, those are my two pieces of feedback for staff. And, and the last thing I will say, you know, I'm going to be a Sour Patch Kid tonight. First they're sweet, or first they're sour, then they're sweet. Um, I had a lot of critiques, feedback, and harsh things because, one, this is my area of expertise. Two, I really want us to succeed with this funds, and it's an unprecedented thing that we are doing in this city. It's the first of its kind in this city. We are starting. Now I want to give you all kudos. All of you sitting in this room who have been working on this, and also Marcos, who I know this was a big deal for him, because we are doing the right thing. I heard 
from a lot of your comments, from a lot of your ground floor experience, that you know the kinds of management that we're the kind of management that we're going to need for this facility, the kind of services that are going to work. And I gotta tell you, in this morning's call with Patrick, I was skeptical, but you've you've turned me around because you've answered our questions. And I feel like this is a project that can succeed if we follow the parameters we discussed tonight. So thank you for taking it on because it's brand new, I know, and, and something that possibly was not imaginable a few years ago. So I'm very grateful for all of you for doing this. And I will just end with one thing. I've also been working on this forever. When I was an MSW student, I worked as a barista here in the city of Burbank. And I will never forget this day because there was a woman who fell asleep on a table, which is not legal, and police had to be called. And I had to watch an officer who was about my age at the time have to tell this woman, I can take you somewhere, it's outside the city, and, and just willing to go the extra mile to drive her to a shelter outside the city. And I remember, because I was just like the barista on staff, thanking him. And he said, yeah, well, I wish I didn't have to go that far, or I wish I could offer her something nearby. And I can go to bed tonight and moving forward, knowing that we are working on something that is going to be here and that that won't have to happen anymore. So thank you for that. Great. Uh, any other comments? All right. I'm going to say a few quick things. I'm going to send you all home and then I'll do some more talking because that's what we do at the end of the meeting. <laughs> You laugh pretty loud there, Mr. City Attorney. <laughs> <laughs> Only because uh, I know you're not going to let me go. So. No, no, you, we, you and Mr. Hess are staying. Uh, no, good morning, everybody. Welcome to April 10th. Or, uh, yeah, it's April 10th now. Um, so all I'm going to say is this in lightning round speed. Uh, Captain Kremens, thank you for staying here. I'm going to say what I don't think you'd feel comfortable saying, but I'm just going to use my experience as a prosecutor. Um, in terms of crime, I don't think it ever benefits to profile. Um, I can tell you that there are people that look like me that come from means that have money and they too commit crime. Um, people commit crime for any number of reasons. And to, we heard tonight and we've heard outside of this meeting that there are some people suggesting that homelessness breeds more crime. I think that that is a very misinformed, uneducated opinion to hold. People commit crime for many reasons. And I think that if we continue to partner with and invest in our police department and MET and Streets Plus and all the tools that we have, we're going to continue to keep this community safe. So to those who think otherwise, reach out. I'll have a conversation. I'm happy to educate you. Uh, and I'm sure we all would, too. Um, I absolutely think that we have a shelter crisis. I appreciate the record we've made today. We don't have the means to provide for the people that are unhoused in our community. And I think we have a moral obligation to do so. Doing so also allows us to maintain a safe, orderly community. It benefits everybody. So I absolutely think there's a record to make the finding. I also want to say that, yes, this is the work of a lot of people that sat here tonight um, and some people that are no longer with us. But tonight, as late as it is, it's a pretty monumental night. Because I think we as a city are saying, we're no longer going to be in the passenger seat. We're going to grab the wheel. We want to have a shelter site, a homeless solutions location of some kind in the city of Burbank. And I really hope and expect that to be a 5-0 vote. Um, you know, the last thing I would just say is I echo all the feedback that was provided tonight. If we're going to build it, let's build it right. Um, uh, less shed, more home, I think is absolutely the right sentiment. Uh, yes, there are unanswered questions. And no, the council is not taking a shortcut or trying to curtail public participation. Um, but I will just you know, leave you all with this. I haven't been working on this 10 years. I came into office uh, at the tail end of 2020. And I know that we worked on this a lot, uh, Councilmember Anthony. In four years, I brought up a concept that was pretty ridiculed in the public, the safe parkings, and, and now it's incorporated in this plan. In four years, I wanted to do something meaningful about addressing homelessness and providing for the unhoused in our community. And I want to thank staff because you have brought that feedback and the feedback from this and prior council to life. I know we're just at the ground floor of this thing, but we're finally turning the page and saying, let's do something proactive. Let's not continue to put our first responders in an impossible position as the song goes, if you got, you know, it's time to go home, but you can't stay here. We're not going to have that reality anymore. Now we're going to have a resource to provide for people. And, and, and truly the last thing I'll say to the many commenters who will probably disagree with me next week when they show up is uh, the unhoused, the, the problems, the concerns that you, you, you think that we're inviting into the community, it's already here. 
These people are part of our community. You can dig your head in the sand and you can ignore it or you can be proactive and you can provide a resource for them. I choose the latter because it's better for them and it's better for the Burbank community. So I'll proudly support this. Somebody go ahead and make the motion. I would be happy to make the motion. All righty. And it's a, it's a two-parter, three-parter? All right. Three. So three parts. I move that we ad adopt a resolution of the Council of the City of Burbank declaring a shelter crisis, approving the submission of a declaration of a shelter crisis pursuant to SB 850, Chapter 48, Statutes of 2018, and Government Codes 8698.1, 8698.2, .1, 8 and 8698.4 to the Los Angeles Continuum of Care. Review and approve the development of a homeless solution center located at 323-333 South Front Street and 10 East Verdugo Avenue, Burbank, and approve the request of $3.450 million, million from the Burbank-Glendale Pasadena Regional Housing Trust to help develop the project. Oh my God, it's late. It's actually early, but okay. I'll second. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, we have a motion and a second. Did you catch that, Ms. Clark? Yes. Great. Any other discussion? Any long, anyone get on the soapbox, add a few more comments for the B-roll? I'm kidding. All right, let's go to a, let's go to a, a Council member Anthony? Yes. Council member Mullins? Yes. Council member Takahashi? Yes. Vice Mayor Perez? Yes. And Mayor Schultz? It's been four long years. Yes. Thank you. Great. All right. All right. So everyone, uh, except for a city manager, or city attorney, feel free to go home. Thank you all for your service. Uh, you two are kick keeping around for a little while. <clears throat> so we will now hear council comments, including reporting on council committee assignments, attendance at conferences, regional meetings, and community events. Uh, I see council member Mullins reaching for that microphone. So council member Mullins, we go to you first. I, d I do it. I do it out of respect. <laughs> the most experienced, please, by all means. I had my mic off, by the way. <laughs> okay, let's see where I... On uh, Wednesday, April 3rd, we attended, uh, we, I think most of us were there, the Rotary Clock Tower dedication. Great event, I love the clock. Um, and congratulations to the Rotary and the city for having it. Uh, on Wednesday, the same day, we had a joint special meeting for a joint um, meeting with the BOSD. A um, lot of good discussion. And also, I met with the city uh, treasurer to discuss the investment report. Um, that's it for the week. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Takahashi, I see you reaching for it. I was reaching for it in my mind. I, I, I knew that, yeah. <laughs> Let's see, on the 27th, March 27th, I went to the Senior Citizen Board. Yes, um, it was at the Tuttle Center, so that was kind of neat. I'd never been there, so it was kind of neat to see it for the first time, and I realized in three years, or two and a half years, I am qualified to attend those uh, programs. I can benefit from them, <laughs> which is exciting. Uh, they have a lot going on. Um, the 28th, I went to the uh, Valley Economic... Valley Economic Alliance Board of Directors meeting. And the 29th, as uh, several of us went to visit, we're here for the visit uh, from Chunyum Council from South Korea. That was pretty interesting. Yeah. On the third, I was not at the Rotary Clock um, dedication, which I was bummed about, but I was doing something else downtown. I was at a BizFed transportation forum, and they had three panels. There was a, a public transportation panel and a goods um, transportation and fleet fleet management panel and a clean energy panel. And then the almost the entire audience was, was were businesses in either the industries that were discussed or just in general. A lot of concern around um, uh, transportation of goods like trucks, utility trucks, fleet trucks, and electrifying them and the difficulties around electrifying them. And so they were discussing hydrogen and other options. So I thought it was a really, I, I went, to, I went for, to this uh, event thinking it was mostly about public transportation and learned a lot about fleets and goods um, transportation. And then um, the third, th that evening we had the joint VUSD city council meeting. 
The fourth, I went to the SCAG Energy and Environment Committee meeting. Um, that evening at six, I went to the Burmaic Armenian Association Business Mixer, the mayor. Uh, right before that, I was at the grand opening of the Cambria Hotel. And, and then on April 6th, I was at the Burbank Community Band space-themed uh, concert, which was amazing. And I was able to attend with our youngest, who uh, graduated, it was at the John Burroughs High School Auditorium, and our youngest uh, graduated three years ago and had not been back to J uh, John Burroughs High School since the graduation, and so we all went together and they went back together. It was really neat to, to do that with them, so. It was a biz I just realized it was a very busy couple <laughs> weeks. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councilmember Anthony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, on the 27th, I attended the Transportation Commission meeting. Um, I gave a stern talking to some of our commission members about their role and not stepping outside the job of commission member and all that that entails. So that was interesting. Um, the 28th, I attended Burbank Housing Corporation's open house for the new ADU um, project that they put together. It's actually two units um, and it looks gorgeous. It's uh, the first, uh, the ground floor one is their first fully ADA accessible um, uh, unit and it is incredible. And the one on top obviously is gorgeous as well. And they are going to be talking to you, all of you about future stuff. Um, they already gave me a, an earful <laughs> when I was there. Um, we had the uh, delegation uh, from South Korea. I attended the Fiscal and Treasurer's Review Group. Um, we had our joint meeting. And then yesterday, I uh, did not blind myself by using the correct eyewear and saw the uh, partial eclipse. Uh, that was fun. I'm glad you didn't blind yourself. And it's sad we have to remind some people not to do that. <laughs> but uh, glad you're okay. Yes, some of them are, were higher elected officials than I was. I Baffling. Vice Mayor Perez. All right. On Thursday, March 28th, I also attended the Valley Economic Alliance along with uh, Councilmember Takahashi. On, at 10 a.m. then, I went to the open house for BHE, BHC's newly completed ADUs. One other thing to mention, Councilmember Anthony, it's actually their first all-electric as well. It is completely electric. It is a phenomenal space. It's really well lit. It's beautiful. Um, on Friday, March 29th, I was also here with my colleagues for the visit from the Chernam Council from South Korea. They had great questions, along with our assistant city manager, Courtney Padgett, who had some great answers for them, too. Um, then I attended a Zoom meeting with Eric Rodriguez, who's our SCAG representative, um, or SCAG liaison, as I start my new role as the District 42 rep. Yeah, and then on Wednesday, April 3rd, I attended the Rotary Clock Tower dedication along with my colleagues. Um, and at 4 p.m., I got to go attend the ribbon cutting for Black Angus's 60th birthday celebration. That was very exciting, and I will say it was the first time this ever happens to me. They had me help them cut the ribbon which was brand new for me. <laughs> was it made out of steak? Was it a ribbon steak? You know what? I will say, love them. I really appreciated the bread and the lemonade. I was hoping there would be steak samples, but there were no steak samples. So. They did make her cut it with a steak knife, though. So that's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> They did cut their cake with a steak knife, which is fun to watch. Um, but really happy for them. Here's the 60 more. Um... Then the joint BUSD City Council meeting along with all my colleagues. Um, Thursday, April 4th, I attended the grand opening of the Cambria Hotel. That was wonderful. Excited to have them join um, our community. Got to see a tour of the rooms, which was really nice. It's, it's great to have a new boutique hotel really close to that brand new airport terminal. Um, and then on Saturday, April 6th, I attended the Eagle Scout Court of Honor for Jacob Kautsky along with our mayor. Um, and I attended the Burbank Community Band concert along with Councilmember Takahashi. It's really great. I love me some Holst. Um, 
and I attended the Kiwanis Salute to Sports Gala. And along with the mayor and several of our staff members, I um, attended the funeral for Marcus Gonzalez and my deepest condolences to his family and friends. There were so many people in that church. Marcus was very loved. And, and again, deepest condolences. And we will miss him very much. Thank you. That's all, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, thank you for those comments. Um, all right, Mr. Mr. Hess, anything to report? I just wanted you to feel included there for a second. Uh, it's okay. You don't actually have to report out. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, we're going to do this uh, very quickly. Uh, Wednesday, March 27th, I presented two certificates to Burbank residents turning 100 years old, two of them celebrated the same day. That was really fun. Then we had uh, Los Angeles County Division Legislative Committee and Board of Directors meeting. No reportable action out of there, followed by Leadership Burbank Reception honoring Sue Giorgino and Mary Alvord. So that was really wonderful to celebrate with them. Friday the 29th, we had the visit from our South Korean friends. Wednesday, April 3rd, after the Rotary Clock Tower dedication, I was the featured speaker for the Kiwanis Lunch meeting. Uh, then I had a meeting with uh, Burbank Girl Scout Troop 26. We had our joint meeting. Uh, on Thursday the 4th, uh, I couldn't go to Black Angus because I was uh, representing us at the Arroyo Verdugo Communities JPA. Uh, the highlight presentation for Metro was scrapped, so no reportable action. Uh, and then we had the Burbank Armenian Association Community Business Mixer. I thought that was really fun and well attended. Friday the 5th, uh, the Job Connect Plus Spring Cohort graduated their second class uh, of the five that we've uh, budgeted for, and so that was really great. A lot of folks that got connected to great resources through our libraries. Then I had a meeting with the Chamber of Commerce and representatives from the Digital Restaurant Association. Saturday the 6th, a uh, busy day. We had the um, funeral for Marcos, um, the Eagle Scout Court of Honor, and then the Kiwanis uh, Salute to Sports Gala. Sunday the 7th, um, I had a chance to award some trophies at the Cub Scout Pack 225 Pinewood Derby. And then on Monday the 8th, we had our San Fernando Valley COG meeting, and it was very nice because Marcos's family was invited, and we also adjourned that meeting, and I had a chance to um, speak with all of them, and they'll be joining us, uh, I believe, uh, May 7th uh, for our meeting and an adjournment here to recognize Marcos. Um, and I did a whole bunch of other things outside of that. Um, so with that, uh, now is the time for the introduction of additional agenda items. Does anyone have anything? Yes, Councilmember Anthony. Uh, just a white paper, um, a review on uh, our city policy for the naming of public buildings. Yeah, budget white paper, are you just saying like a take home city manager? Just a take home, take okay. home paper to us. Okay, great, thank you. Councilmember Mullins. I believe, I think there's still uh, questions regarding boards and commissions and our code for boards and commissions. How about uh, bring, back, uh, bring back discussion on ordinance related to boards and commissions absences? Sounds great. That sounds fantastic. Okay, can we also get a first, re first step report on a back from the brink resolution? Thank you very much, anything else? Okay, we now adjourn the meeting to Tuesday, April 23rd, 2024 for a regular meeting in the City Council Chamber located at 275 East Olive Avenue, second floor. I'll be here. Be here. Be square. Thank you and good night, everyone.